Chapter 16 Abra wound her way through tables, bussing empties, taking orders, and checking IDs as the Boston-born band pulled in a hefty share of the college crowd. Following bar policy, she rewarded each party's designated driver, when they had one, with free non-alcoholic drinks through the night. Otherwise, tonight's crowd leaned heavy on beer and wine. She kept her tables happy, casually flirting with guys, complimenting girls on hair or shoes, laughing at jokes, quick conversations with familiar faces. She enjoyed the work, the noise and the hustle. She liked the people watching, the speculating. The stone-cold sober D.D. from her table of five channeled any desire he might have had for beer into hitting on a nearby table of girls, particularly the milk-skinned redhead. From her reaction, the way the two of them danced, the whispers when the girl group trooped off as a pack for the ladies, Abra figured the D.D. might just get lucky later. She served a round to a pair of couples. She cleaned for one set and was pleased to see earrings she'd made dangling from both women's earlobes. Boosted, she made her way to the back table and its single occupant. No familiar face here, and not by her gauge a particularly happy one. Anyone who sat alone at the back of a bar nursing tonic and lime didn't project happiness. How's it going back here? She got a long stare and a tap on the now empty glass in answer. Tonic with lime, I'll take care of that. Can I get you anything else? We're famous for our nachos. When all she got was a shake of the head, she took the empty, tried an easy smile. I'll get right back to you. Thinking the likelihood strong that the tonic and lime would be a lousy tipper, she headed back to the bar. Risky, he thought. Risky coming in here, getting so close to her. But he'd been reasonably sure she hadn't seen him that night in Bluff House. Now, as she looked him right in the eye without a single flicker of recognition, he could be absolutely sure, and rewards God knew took risk. He'd wanted to watch her, to see how she behaved, and he'd hoped Landon would be there, opening up a fresh opportunity to get back into the house. But then he'd hoped the police would take Landon in for questioning. He'd needed only a small opening to get in, plant the gun, make an anonymous call. Now they'd searched the place, so planting the gun in Bluff House wouldn't work but there was always another avenue. The woman might be the best route. She could be his way back into Bluff House. He needed to think about that. He had to get back in, finish his search. The dowry was there. He believed it with every fiber of his being. He'd already risked so much, lost so much. No going back, he reminded himself. He'd killed now, and found it a great deal easier than he'd expected. Just the press of a finger on the trigger. Hardly any effort at all. Logically, it would be easier the next time, if a next time proved necessary. In fact, he might enjoy killing Landon. But it had to look like an accident or suicide. Nothing that made the police or the media or anyone question Landon's guilt. Because he knew, without doubt, Eli Landon had killed Lindsay. He could use that, and already imagined forcing Landon to write out a confession before he died, spilling that blue Landon blood as the coward begged for his life. Yes, he found he wanted that more than he'd realized. An eye for an eye, and more. Landon deserved to pay. He deserved to die. Making that happen would be nearly as rich a reward as Esmeralda's dowry. When he saw Eli walk in, the rise of rage nearly choked him. The red-hot haze of it blurred his vision, urged him to reach for the gun holstered at his back, the same gun he'd used to kill Kirby Duncan. He could see, actually see, the bullets punching into the land and bastard's body, the blood gushing as he fell. His hands trembled with the need to end the man he hated above all else. Accident or suicide? He repeated the words over and over in his head in a struggle to regain control, to calm his killing fury. The effort popped beads of sweat on his forehead as he fought to consider his options. 
At the bar, Abra waited for her drink orders and chatted with her favorite village character. Short, stocky, with a monk's ring of wispy white hair, Stony Tribbett worked on his second beer and a bump of the night. Stony rarely missed a Friday night at the pub. He claimed he liked the music and the pretty girls. He'd be 82 that summer, and he'd spent every year of it, except for a stint in the army in Korea, in Whiskey Beach. I'll build you your own yoga studio when you marry me, he told her. With a juice bar? If that's what it takes. I'm going to have to think about that, Stony, because it's pretty tempting, especially since it comes with you. His weathered map of a face went pink under its permanent tan. Now we're talking. Abra gave him a kiss on his grizzled cheek, then lit up when she saw Eli. I didn't expect you to come in. Stoney turned on his stool, gave Eli the hard eye. Then it softened. Now that's a landing if I ever saw one. Are you Hester's grand boy? Yes, sir. Stoney Tribbett? Eli Landon. Stoney shot out a hand. I knew your grandpa. You got his eyes. We had some adventures together back a ways. Some long ways. Eli, why don't you keep Stoney company while I get these drinks served? Sure. Due to the current lack of a stool, Eli leaned on the bar. Can I buy you a drink? Looks like I've got one here. Belly up, boy, and I'll buy you one. You know, your grandpa and I both had our eye on the same girl once upon a time. He tried to picture his tall, lanky grandfather and this fireplug of a man on adventures and competing for the same woman. A tough picture to mind sketch. Is that so? Rock solid truth. Then he went off to Boston to school and I scooped her up. He got Harvard and Hester, and I got Mary. We agreed we both couldn't have done better. What are you drinking? I'll have what you're having. Pleased two of her favorite people were sharing drinks and conversation, Abra snaked her way through to deliver orders. As she moved toward the back, she saw the empty table and the bills tossed on it. Odd, she thought, putting the money on her tray. It looked like her solo had changed his mind about another tonic and lime. At the bar, Eli settled in, snagging a stool when an ass lifted off one, listening to stories. Some, he assumed, were exaggerated for effect, about his grandfather as a boy and young man. He rode that motorcycle hell for leather, gave the locals a fit. My grandfather, on a motorcycle most usually with a pretty girl in the sidecar. Eyes twinkling, Stoney slurped through the head of his beer. I thought he'd win Mary because of that motorcycle. She loved riding. The best I could offer back then were the handlebars of my bike. We'd been about sixteen then. Used to have the best damn bonfires down on the beach. With whiskey, Eli nipped from his father's cabinet. Now Eli tried to picture the man he'd been named for, driving a motorcycle with a sidecar and pilfering his own father's liquor supply. Either the image came more naturally or the beer helped it along. They threw some big parties at Bluff House, Stoney told him. Fancy people would come up from Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and where not. They'd have the house lit up like a Roman candle, with people gliding along the terraces in their white tuxes and evening gowns. Made a hell of a picture, Stoney said, and downed his bump. Yeah, I bet it did. Chinese lanterns, silver candelabras, big urns of tropical flowers, and the people in their Gatsby elegance. Eli, he'd slip out. Get one of the servants to bring down food and French champagne. I'm pretty sure his parents knew about it. We'd have our own party on the beach, and Eli, he'd go back and forth between. He was good at that, if you take my meaning. Good at being between. 
rich and fancy and every day. First time I saw Hester, he brought her down from a party. She was in a long white dress, had a laugh in her, always did. One look at her, and I knew Mary was mine. Eli couldn't take his eyes off Hester Hawkin. Even as a kid, I knew they were happy together. So they were. Nodding sagely, Stoney banged a hand on the bar, his signal for another round. You know, Eli and I married our girls within a couple months of each other. Stayed friendly, too. He lent me the money to start my carpentry business. Wouldn't take no when he heard I was going to the bank for a loan to get it going. You've lived here all your life. Yeah, I was born here, figuring on dying here in another twenty, thirty years. He grinned over the dregs of his beer. I did a lot of work in Bluff House over the years. Been retired a while. But when Hester got it in her head to refit that room up on the second floor for a gym, she brought the plans to me to look over. I'm glad she's doing better. Whiskey Beach isn't the same without her in Bluff House. It's not. You know the house pretty well. I'd say as well as those who've lived there. Did some plumbing for them on the side. No plumbing license, but I've got handy hands. Always did. What do you think about Esmeralda's dowry? He snorted. I think if there ever was such a thing, it's long gone. Don't tell me you're looking for it. If you are, you've got your grandfather's eyes, but not his good sense. I'm not, but somebody is. Do tell. Sometimes, Eli thought, the way to get information was to give it. He did tell. Stoney pulled on his bottom lip and considered. What the hell could you bury in that basement? The floor's as much stone as dirt. There are better places to hide a treasure if you're hiding it. Not too bright to think it's in the house in the first place. Generations of people living there. Servants, workmen like me and my crew. Plenty of us have been over every inch of that place at one time or another, including the servants' passages. Servants' passages. Long before your time. Used to be staircases behind the walls, and ways for the servants to get up and down without running into family or guests. One of the first things Hester did once they took over the house was have them closed up. Eli made the mistake of telling her how kids had gotten lost and locked in behind the walls. He made half of it up. I expect that was his way to a good story. But she put her foot down. I closed them up myself, me and three I hired on for the job. What she didn't close off, she opened up. The breakfast room, another bed and bath on the second floor. I had no idea. She was carrying your father when we did the work. Everybody who's lived in Bluff House put their stamp on it one way or the other. What are you planning? I haven't thought about it. It's my grandmother's house. Stoney smiled, nodded. Bring her back home. That I am planning on. Maybe you could give me a better idea where those passages were. Can do better. Stoney picked up a bar napkin, rooted a pencil out of his pocket. My hands aren't as handy as they once were, but nothing's wrong with my brain cells or memory. They closed the place down. Though Stoney outdrank him two for one, Eli was damn glad he wouldn't drive home, and just as glad when Stoney told him he was on foot. We'll give you a lift, Eli told him. No need for that. I barely live a stony's throw from here, <laughs> he cackled at his own joke. And it looks to me like I've got another landing eyeing my girl. <laughs> I don't know if this one can fix my screen door. Abra tucked her arm through Stoney's. I'll take Eli's keys and drive all three of us home. I didn't bring my car. 
I figured I'd ride home with you. I walked. Eli frowned down at her high black heels. In those? No, in these. She pulled a pair of green crocs out of her bag. And it looks like I'm putting them back on because we're all walking home. She changed her shoes, zipped into a jacket. When they stepped outside, she took each man by the hand. Looks like I won tonight's jackpot. Two handsome men. Both of whom, she thought as they walked, were just a little bit drunk. Over his objections, they detoured to walk Stoney to the door of his trim little house. The sound of high-pitched barking sounded before they were within two yards. All right, Prissy, all right. The barks turned to excited whines. The old girl's half blind, Stoney said, but she's got her hearing. Nobody gets past old Prissy. You two go on now. Go do what healthy young people ought to be doing on a Friday night. I'll see you Tuesday. Aber kissed his cheek. They strolled away, but waited until the light switched on before veering back toward the shore road. Tuesday, Eli asked. I clean for him every other Tuesday. She hitched her bag more securely on her shoulder. He and his Mary, I never got to meet her. She died five years ago. They had three kids, a son and two daughters. The son's in Portland, Maine. One of the daughters lives in Seattle. The closest one is in D.C., but they manage to visit him pretty regularly. And there's grandchildren, too. There are eight and five great-grandchildren so far. He can take care of himself. But it doesn't hurt to have somebody right here looking in from time to time. So you clean his place every other week. And run errands. He doesn't do much driving anymore. His next-door neighbor has a kid about ten who's crazy about Stony, so he rarely gets a day when somebody's not dropping in or calling. I'm fairly crazy about him myself. If I marry him, he's promised to build me my own yoga studio. I could... Eli considered his carpentry skills. I could have a yoga studio built for you. On a flutter of eyelashes, she tipped her face up to his. Is that a proposal? What? She laughed, curled her arm through his. I should have warned you, Stoney has an impressive capacity for alcohol. He likes to say he was reared on the whiskey of Whiskey Beach. We were switching off. He bought the first round, so I bought the second. Then he bought a third, and I felt obligated. I don't quite remember how many times I felt obligated. There's an awful lot of fresh air out here. There is. She tightened her hold when he weaved a bit. And gravity, too. This place is lousy with air and gravity. We should get inside. My place is closer. Yeah, we could. Except I don't feel like leaving the house empty. It feels wrong. With a nod, she forgot the shorter walk. It's good for you to walk in the fresh air and gravity anyway. I'm glad you came in tonight. I wasn't going to, but I kept thinking about you. Then there was the whole Easter thing happening. The Easter bunny came already? What? No. Now he laughed, the sound rolling down the empty street. He hasn't finished laying the eggs yet. Eli, the Easter chicken lays the eggs. The bunny hides them. Whatever, they're doing it at Bluff House this year. They are? She glanced at her cottage as they passed, but didn't think she should run in for a quick change of clothes. She might come out and find him curled up asleep in the middle of the road. That's what my mother said. They're all coming up on Saturday. That's great. Hester's able to travel. She's going to talk to the doctor first, but it looks good for it. The whole bunch of them. There's stuff I have to do first. I can't think what it is right now, except I don't have to bake a ham. But you have to come. I'll drop in, sure. I'd love to see them. Hester especially. No. While he felt slightly steadier with the sea breeze blowing, Eli had a sudden wicked craving for potato chips. Or pretzels. Or just about anything that would sop up some of the excess beer in his belly. You have to be there.
he continued, for the thing, Easter. I thought I should tell my mother we were seeing each other so it wouldn't be weird. Then it got weird, like I'd won a blue ribbon or something. Then she started crying. Oh, Eli. She said happy crying, which I don't get, but women do. He glanced down at her for verification. Yes, we do. So it's probably going to be weird, but you have to come anyway. I need to buy stuff. And things. I'll put stuff and things on the list. Okay. He weaved again. It's not the beer, it's the bumps. My grandfather used to drive a motorcycle with a sidecar. I didn't know that. It seems like I should have. I didn't know there used to be servants' passages in the house. There's too much I don't know. Look at it. Bluff House stood silhouetted in starlight, illuminated from within. I've taken it for granted. I don't think that's true. Too much of it. I haven't paid attention, especially in the last few years. Too wrapped up in my own stuff and couldn't seem to roll my way out of it. I need to do better. Then you will. He stopped a moment, smiled at her. I'm a little drunk. You look amazing. I look amazing because you're a little drunk? No. Some of it's just knowing who you are and being good with it, doing what you do, and, well, being happy doing it. And some of it's those sea witch eyes and that sexy mouth with that little mole right there. Lindsay was beautiful. She took your breath away. A little drunk, Abra reminded herself. Allowances could be made. I know. But she, I think... She didn't really know who she was and wasn't good with it. She wasn't happy. I didn't make her happy. Everyone has to make themselves happy first. Now you remember. I remember. He leaned down to kiss her, there in the shadows of the great house under a sky mad with stars. I need to sober up some because I want to make love with you. And I want to be sure I remember that, too. Then let's make it unforgettable. The minute they were inside and he'd punched in the alarm code, he pulled her against him. She welcomed his mouth, his hands, but eased away. First things first, she said, drawing him through the house. What you need is a big glass of water and a cup of aspirin. Hydration and hangover anticipation. And I'm going to have a glass of wine so you're not so far ahead of me. Fair enough. I really want to tear your clothes off. He blocked her, shoved her back against the counter. Just tear them off because I know what's under them. And it drives me crazy. Looks like we're going to get to the kitchen floor this time. With his teeth at her throat, she dropped her head back. I think it's going to live up to the hype. Just let me... Wait. Oh, sure, now it's wait after you... Wait. He set her aside, his face stony now. She followed his gaze to the alarm panel. How did you manage to smudge that up? I'll clean it tomorrow, she said, reaching for him. I didn't. He stepped over, examined the door. I think the door's been forced. Don't touch anything, he snapped when she went to him. Call the police, now. She dug into her bag, then her hands froze when he pulled a knife out of the block. Oh, God, Eli. If there's any trouble, you run. Do you hear me? You go out that door and you run, and don't stop until you're safe. No, and now you wait. She punched numbers on the phone. Vinny, it's Abra. Eli and I just got back to Bluff House. We think someone's broken in. We don't know if he's still here. In the kitchen. Yes, yes, okay. He's coming, she told Eli. He's calling it in on the way. He wants us to stay right where we are. If we see or hear anything, we go out and get gone. Her heart picked up another speed when she saw Eli's gaze turning toward the basement door. If you go down there, I go down there. 
Ignoring her, he walked to the door, turned the knob. It's locked from this side, the way I left it. Still holding the knife, he walked to the back door, unlocked it, opened it, then crouched. Fresh marks here. Back door facing the beach at night. Nobody to see. He had to know I wasn't here. How did he know? He must have been watching the house. He must have seen you leave. On foot, Eli remembered. If I'd just been taking a walk, I might have been gone for ten, fifteen minutes. It's a lot of risk. He might have followed you, seen you go into the bar. A calculated risk that he'd have more time. Maybe. The alarm pad. Still wary, Abra edged a bit closer. I've seen that somewhere. TV, movies. I thought it was just made up. Spraying something on the pad so the oil from fingerprints comes up. You know what numbers have been pressed. Then a computer thing runs different patterns until it breaks the code. Something like that. It's how he might have gotten in before when my grandmother was here. He could have gotten her keys, made copies. Just let himself the fuck in after that. But he didn't know we changed the code, so he cut the power the last time when the old code didn't work. That makes him stupid. Maybe desperate or panicked. Maybe just pissed off. You want to go down there. I can see it. You want to know if he started digging again. Vinny will be here any minute. If he went down and she came with him and anything happened, he'd be responsible. If he went down and she stayed put and anything happened, he'd be responsible. So, Eli concluded, he was stuck. I was gone about three hours. God damn it, I gave him a nice big window. What are you supposed to do? Pull him as Havisham and never leave the house? The alarm system sure isn't doing any good. We're going to have to beef that up. Or something. She heard the wail of sirens. That's Finney. Eli slid the knife back into the block. Let's go let him in. Cops swarmed his house again. He was getting used to it. He drank coffee and walked the house with them, starting with the basement. Determined bastard, Vinny remarked as they studied the trench. He got another couple feet in. He must have brought in more tools and took them away with him this time. Eli glanced around to make sure Abra hadn't come down. I think he's crazy. Well, he ain't smart. No, Vinny, I think he's crazy. He'd risk breaking in again to spend a couple hours hacking at this floor. There's nothing here. I talked to Stony Tribbett tonight. Now there's a character. He is. And he also said something that makes clear sense. Why would anyone bury anything here? It's damn hard dirt and rock, or a lot of it is. It's why we never bothered to lay concrete. If you bury something, excluding a body, don't you usually intend to dig it back up at some point? Most likely. Then why make it so damn much work? Bury it in the garden, plant a fucking bush over it. Out front where the ground's softer or where it's mostly sand. Or don't bury it at all, but hide it under floorboards, behind a wall. If I'm looking for the damn treasure, I'm not going to use a pick and shovel down here. Or if I'm crazy enough to believe it's here, I'm going to wait until I know the house is empty for a couple of days, like it is when my grandmother visits Boston, and I'm going to go at it with a jackhammer. I'm not going to argue, but this is what it is. I'm going to let Corbett know about this, and we'll increase the patrol. We're going to make noise about the extra patrols, Vinny added. If he's in the area, he'll hear about it. It should give him second thoughts about trying this again. Eli doubted second thoughts would stop anyone willing to risk so much for a legend. Chapter 17 In the morning, Abra returned to Bluff House from her Tai Chi class via the market, then detoured for a secondary stop. She couldn't guarantee Eli's reaction to what she'd picked up, but she had a pretty good idea what it would be initially. They'd work around it, or, she admitted, she'd work around him. Not entirely fair, and she really hated to manipulate. But in this case, she firmly believed it was for the best. She gauged her time as she unloaded the car. 
She had not only her regular cleaning on the slate, but the reordering after the police search. But no reason she couldn't get it all done, maybe throw a meal together, then get home for her in-house yoga class. It was all about prioritizing. She stepped inside, instantly recalculated everything, as, instead of working in his office, Eli stood at the counter pouring coffee. I thought you'd be working. I was, am. I needed to walk around to think through. He trailed off as he turned and looked down at the big brown dog currently sniffing at his pants leg. What's this? That's Barbie. Barbie? Seriously? Automatically, he scratched the wide head between the ears. I know, Barbie's blonde and busty, but dogs don't really get to choose their names. She watched him out of the corner of her eye as she put groceries away. He'd stopped what he was doing to pet the dog, and had that easy appreciation on his face people who enjoy dogs tend to wear around them. So far, so good. Well, she's pretty. Yeah, you're pretty, he said, rubbing as Barbie murmured in her throat and leaned against him. Your dog sitting? Not exactly. Barbie's a sweetheart. She's four. Her owner died a couple of weeks ago. The owner's daughter tried to take the dog, but her husband's allergic. There's a grandson, but he lives in an apartment with a no-pet clause. So poor Barbie lost her best pal and couldn't go with family. She's been fostered for the last week or so while the local organization tries to find her a good home. She's been really well trained. She's healthy, she's spayed. But people usually want puppies, so an older dog takes a bit longer to place especially since they're trying to stick with Whiskey Beach. It's her beach. Beach dog Barbie? He grinned, crouching, as Barbie rolled over to have her belly rubbed. Nearly there, Abra calculated. Beach bitch Barbie would have given you the alliteration and have been accurate. But she's so sweet it's hard to use the B word. Actually, I thought of taking her myself. I volunteer off and on at the shelter, but with my schedule, I'm just not home enough. It didn't seem fair when she's used to companionship. She's a Chesapeake Bay retriever with a little something else mixed in. Retrievers love being around people. Abra closed the last cupboard, smiled. She really likes you. You like dogs? Sure, we always had a dog growing up. In fact, I imagine my family will bring... He straightened as if shot out of a rubber band. Wait a minute. You work at home. I'm not looking for a dog. Sometimes the best things you get you weren't looking for, and she comes with a strong plus. What? Barbie, speak. Sitting again, the dog lifted her head, obligingly sent out two cheerful barks. She does tricks. She barks, Eli. I actually got the idea thinking about how Stoney's dog barked when we walked him home. Someone's been getting into the house, past your high-tech alarm. So go low-tech. Barking dogs deter break-ins. You can Google it. You think I should foster a dog because she barks on command? She barks when she hears anyone coming to the door and stops barking on command. It's in her bio. Her bio? Are you kidding me? I'm not. Most dogs bark, he argued with or without bios and headshots or whatever else she has. It's not a qualified reason to foster a dog. I think you could try fostering each other for now, because she barks and needs a home in Whiskey Beach, and you'd be company for each other. Dogs need to be fed and watered and walked. They need a vet, equipment, attention. All true. She comes with bowls, food, toys, her leash, her medical records, she's up to date there. She was raised from a pup by a man in his 80s, and she's very well behaved, as you can see for yourself. The thing is, she really loves men, is happier around men as she bonded with one as a pup. She loves playing fetch and tug, she's great with kids, and she barks. If you needed or wanted to go out for a couple hours, someone would be in the house. She's not someone, she's a dog. Hence the barking. Listen, why don't you try it for a few days, see how it goes. If it just doesn't work, I'll take her, or I'll talk Maureen into taking her. She's a soft touch. 
The dog sat like a lady, watching him with big brown eyes, her head slightly cocked as if asking, okay, what's it going to be? And Eli felt himself sinking. A guy shouldn't have a dog named Barbie. Victory, Abra concluded and stepped to him. No one will hold that against you. Barbie nuzzled her nose at his hand politely, sinking fast. A couple of days. Fair enough. I'll go out and get her things. I thought I'd start upstairs today, work my way down. I won't vacuum up there until you take another break. Fine. You know this was an ambush. And you know I know you know. I do. She took his face in her hands. It was, and I do know. She laid her lips on his, soft and lingering. I'll have to find a way to make it up to you. That's pandering. It is, she laughed and kissed him again. Now I have to make it up to you twice. Go on back up to work, she suggested as she started out. I'll show Barbie around. Eli studied the dog. The dog studied Eli. Then she lifted a paw in invitation. Only a heartless man would have refused to take the offered paw in his for a shake. It looks like I've got a dog named Barbie for a couple days. When he started out, Barbie fell in at his heel, tail wagging enthusiastically. I guess you're coming with me. She followed him up into his office. When he sat, she moved up to sniff at his keyboard. Then she wandered off, her toenails clicking lightly on the hard wood. Okay, Eli thought, so she wasn't pushy, a point for Barbie. He worked through the morning, then sat back, held an internal debate before taking the plunge. He emailed his agent, a woman who'd stuck with him since his law school days, to tell her he thought he had enough for her to take a look. Struggling to ignore all the whining voices in his head, he attached the first five chapters. Hit send. Done it now, he said, and sighed. And since he had, he wanted to get out of the house, away from those whining voices. He stood up and nearly tripped over the dog. Sometime during the last couple of hours, she'd come in silent as a ghost to curl up behind his chair. Now she lifted her gaze to his, bumped her tail politely on the floor. I guess you're a pretty good dog. The tail picked up its beat. Want to go for a walk on the beach? He didn't know the key word, or if she just understood whole sentences, but she scrambled to her feet, a gleaming joy in her eyes. It wasn't just her tail wagging now, but her whole body. I'll take that as a yes. She trotted downstairs with him, gave another wiggle when he picked up the leash Abra had left on the counter, then added a happy yip when they stepped into the laundry room, where Abra was unloading the dryer. Hey there, how's it going? Abra set the laundry in the basket to give Barbie a rub. Good day so far? I was going to take a walk. She opted to come. He pulled a jacket off the peg. Why don't you? I'd love it, but I'm on a schedule today. Your boss says you can take a break. She laughed at him. I'm my own boss. You just pay me. Go bond with Barbie. You can have some lunch when you get back. Oh, take this. She plucked a red ball out of a basket of dog toys on the washing machine. She likes to fetch. Right. She was right, too, about being her own boss, he thought. He liked and admired that about her. Her ability to find and do work that satisfied her on so many levels. Once, he'd thought he'd found that with the law and his writing served as a kind of creative perk. Now he was all in, and his life, on so many levels, depended on the reaction of a woman in New York with a colorful collection of cheaters, a broad Brooklyn accent, and a sharply critical eye. Not going to think about it, he told himself, as he led Barbie down the beach steps. And because he couldn't stop thinking about it as they walked, as the dog trotted and wiggled with joy, he stopped and scanned the beach. Technically, she should stay on the leash, but hell, nobody, or hardly anybody, was out there. He unclipped her, pulled the bowl out of his pocket, and winged it. She charged, sand kicking, legs blurring. She clamped the ball in her teeth, raced back to him, and dropped it at his feet. 
he winged it again and again, lost count of the number of times. When he timed it right, she was fast and accurate enough to leap, snatch the ball out of the air. And each time she did, trotted back to drop it at his feet. They just grinned at each other. She didn't chase the birds, thankfully, though she did give them longing looks. He argued with himself, but curiosity and the little boy inside him won. He hurled the ball over the water to see how she'd react. She gave a bark of sheer unmistakable delight and roared into the sea. She swam like, well, a retriever, he decided, laughing all the way down in his gut until he had to brace his hands on his thighs. She swam back to shore, red ball in her teeth, wild happiness beaming from her big brown eyes. She dropped the ball at his feet again, shook herself, soaked him. What the hell? He threw it out over the water again. He stayed out longer than he'd planned, and his pitching arm felt like overcooked spaghetti. But man and dog were relaxed and pleased with themselves when they walked back into Bluff House. On the kitchen island sat a clear-wrapped plate, holding a cold-cut sandwich on a long roll, two pickle spears, and a scoop of pasta salad. Beside it lay a milk bone. The sticky note read, Guess which is whose? Funny, I guess we eat. He picked up the dog biscuit. The minute she spotted it, Barbie dropped her butt to the floor while the look in her eyes went slightly crazed. Like a crack addict, he thought, about to take the pipe. Damn it, Barbie, you're a good dog. He went out on the deck and ate lunch in the sun with the dog sprawled contentedly by his chair. His life, he decided, if you didn't count murder, break-ins, and clouds of suspicion, was pretty damn good right at the moment. When he went back upstairs, he heard Abra singing. He poked his head into his bedroom first, and since the dog walked right in to explore, went over to see what towel art she'd left on the bed. Unmistakably a dog, he thought, especially since she'd fashioned a heart out of a post-it. On it she'd written, Barbie loves Eli. He glanced over, saw Abra had brought up a wide brown cushion. It sat on the floor near the terrace doors. Obviously, the way the dog snuggled into it, it had served as her bed before. Yeah, sure, make yourself at home. He left the dog to follow the singing. In his grandmother's bedroom, she had the terrace doors opened wide, though it was a bit cool yet. He saw the duvet clothespin to some sort of portable pole flapping in the breeze. And though Hester wasn't there, a little vase of wild violets stood on the nightstand. A small thing, Eli thought. Abra was good at small things that made big differences. Hi, how was your walk? She picked up a pillow, shook it out of its case. Nice, the dog likes to swim. She'd noticed as she'd watched them from the terrace and as she'd watched, her heart had simply glowed and melted. It's a perk for her being right on the beach. Yeah, she's in on her bed, taking a nap. Swimming wears you out. Yeah, he said again as he skirted the bed to her side. What are you doing? I thought since your family's coming, I'd air out the linens so they'll be nice and fresh. Good thinking. They look nice and fresh already. He backed her up until she fell on the bed under him. Eli, my schedule. You're your own boss, he reminded her. You can adjust the schedule. She accepted defeat when his hands and mouth got busy, but tried a token protest. I could, but should I? He lifted his head briefly to pull off her tank. I'm keeping the dog, no less of an ambush, he said when her eyes lit up so you still have to make it up to me. When you put it that way. Rearing up, she tugged off his shirt. Somebody's been working out. She trailed her tongue over his chest. Some, and eating his protein. She wrapped her legs around his waist, stretched up, canted forward until she had him on his back. I'm supposed to be cleaning your house, earning my pay not getting naked with you in this gorgeous old bed. You can call me Mr. Landon if that helps ease your conscience. 
Her laugh was warm against his skin. I think my conscience can be flexible in this case. So was she, he thought, flexible. Those long arms, long legs, the long torso, all so smooth and fluid as she moved over him, as all that wild hair feathered over his skin. Muscles he'd begun to recognize again, bunched and tensed as she glided her lips over him, as her skilled hands pressed, kneaded, stroked, arousing, soothing, seducing the already seduced. Naked in bed, that's how he wanted her. He peeled the snug, stretchy pants over her hips, down her legs, exploring her inch by inch all the way to her ankles, and up again over the taut curve of calf, the delicate back of her knee, along the firm length of her thigh to that hot, damp core. She arched, a hand digging into the sheet, fisting there as pleasure struck and quivered, and it built, built, built until she broke, until she cartwheeled into the tumble of sensations. She levered up, dragging him to her, latching her arms around him when they knelt body to body on the bed. Heat flooded her, sent even her blood to sizzling under her skin as the breeze whipped in the open doors to flow over them. It danced through her hair, he thought, and the sun streamed over her like molten gold. They might have been on some lost island with the relentless voice of the sea, the tang of it on the air the mocking laugh of gulls winging across the blue bowl of sky. Now those limbs wrapped around him, demand, invitation, plea. He took what she offered, gave what she asked. His body plunged to hers while lips met in unsated appetite. Faster, stronger, with her head flung back and his mouth on her throat, where her pulse beat in mad time. Then she cried out his name, just his name, and he felt even his slippery hold on control snap loose. He lay face down, she face up, and both struggled for breath. With her eyes closed, Abra slid her hand over, found his arm, trailed down until she could link fingers with him. That was a hell of an afternoon break. My new favorite kind, he mumbled, his voice muffled against the mattress. I really have to get up and get back to work. Let me write an excuse note to your boss. She won't buy it, she's really strict. Now he turned his head and studied her profile with sleepy eyes. No, she's not. You don't work for her. She curled toward him now. She can be a total bitch. I'm going to tell her you said that. Better not, she might fire me. Then who'd clean the house? That's a point. He draped an arm around her. I'll help you deal with the rest of the house. She started to decline, quickly and gently. She had a routine and he'd be in her way. But she let it go, for now. Why aren't you doing your own work? I'm taking the rest of the day off. <laughs> Dog love? No. He trailed his fingers through her hair before he sat up. I have enough finished and polished up to send to my agent. So I did. That's great. She popped up beside him. Isn't it? I guess I'll find out in the next few days. Let me read it. When he shook his head, she rolled her eyes. Okay, I get that, more or less. How about letting me read one scene? Just one? A page? Maybe, maybe later. Evade now, he thought, as she had a sneaky way of talking him into things. Like a dog. I'll ply you with wine first, so you're mildly impaired. I can't get mildly impaired tonight. I have a yoga class at home. Sometime, later. I'll help you get some of the stuff the cops jumbled up put back. Okay, you can strip the bed, that's basic. Even as she rolled out of it, the dog let out a trio of warning barks. Perfect, Eli muttered, grabbed his pants. He heard the dog charge down the steps, barking like a hound out of hell. You in that one, he dragged on his shirt. And you're naked. I'll take care of that. Too bad, naked housekeeping might have been fun. 
She grinned as he hurried out, as he called to the dog. Eli Landon, she thought, was coming back, strong. Downstairs, he ordered the dog to stop. She surprised him by doing just that, but sitting right by his side as he opened the door. He tried to block that first automatic strike of panic when he saw cops, pushed back against the dark cloud that habitually followed. Not Wolf, at least, he thought. Detective Corbett, Vinny. Nice dog, Corbett began. Hey, is that Barbie? When the dog immediately reacted with a greeting woof and wagging tail, Vinny bent down to pet her. You've got Barbie, Mr. Bridal's dog. He died in a sleep a couple weeks ago. The neighbor came to check on him, as she did most days, and found Barbie here guarding the bed. She's a good dog, she is. As if remembering himself, Benny straightened. Sorry, I'm just glad to see her in a good home. She's a great dog. Pretty girl, Corbett commented. Do you have a few minutes, Mr. Landon? I get that question from cops a lot. But he stepped back to let them in. Deputy Hansen told me about the latest break-in, so I asked him to come with me to speak to you. Have you had a chance to go through the house thoroughly? Check for anything missing or out of place? Things were already out of place from the search. We've been putting it back together, and so far I haven't found anything missing. He's not a thief. Not in the classic sense, anyway. I have your statement from last night, but I wonder if you could go over your activities yesterday evening for me. Corbett looked up as Abra, fully dressed, walked downstairs with a laundry basket. Ms. Walsh? Detective. Hi, Vinny. Cleaning day. Can I get you coffee, a cold drink? No, but thanks. Corbett shifted his stance. You were with Mr. Landon when the break-in was discovered. That's right. I work at the village pub on most Friday nights. Eli came up, when was that, 9.30 or so, I guess? He and Stoney Tribbett hung out at the bar swapping lies. Stoney's a local character, Vinny explained. We stayed till closing, Eli continued. Abra and I walked Stoney home, then walked back here. Deputy Hansen logged your call to him at 1.43. That's right. We went into the kitchen and I saw the alarm pad smudged, then checked the door and found fresh Jimmy marks. And yeah, I've changed the code. Again. And added backup, Abra said, giving Barbie a rub. Did you see any cars you didn't recognize? Anyone either on the beach or on the street? No, but then I wasn't looking for any. I'd been outside earlier, doing some research, reading on the back terrace. I didn't notice anything or anyone. I hadn't planned on going to the bar. I didn't tell anyone I was going. It was impulse. Do you tend to go in on Friday nights? I've only been in there once before. Did you see anyone in the bar who struck you in any way? Anyone who seemed to be acting unusual? No. I'm going to put this load in, Abra began. She took two steps away, turned back. Tonic and lime. I'm sorry? It's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing. But I did serve a table of one, a man I didn't recognize. He sat in the back, alone, drank tonic and lime. He ordered three, but he didn't stay for the third. Why unusual? Corbett asked her. Most people who come in come with friends or to see them, or if they're just passing through, they'd likely have a beer or a glass of wine. Still, maybe he just doesn't drink, and he just wanted to hear the band, they're good. But go on, Corbett prompted. It's just that now that I'm playing it back, he left right after Eli came in. I'd taken his order, added it to the others, and gone to the bar to put it in. I stood there a couple minutes, if that, talking to Stoney. I was facing the main door, so I saw Eli come in. I introduced them, then picked up my orders. And when I went back, I saw he'd gone, and just left money on the table. I know the bar. Corbett's eyes narrowed as he thought of it. There's another exit, but you have to go through the kitchen. That's right. I don't think I'd have seen him leave if he left after Eli came in because I'd shifted, you know, so I wasn't facing the door. Unless he went through the kitchen, he left between the time Eli got there and I went to take him his drink. 
Either way, he left about five minutes after he ordered the tonic. Do you remember what he looked like? God, in vague terms. White, late thirties, I think. Brown hair or dark blonde, the lights dim in there. And longish, over the collar. I couldn't tell you his eye color. I don't really know his build as he was sitting. He had wide hands. I might remember more if I just clear my mind. Will you work with a police artist? Well, yes, but do you really think that could be the man who broke in here? It's worth pursuing. I'm sorry. She looked from Eli to Vinny. I didn't think of it last night. That's why we do follow-ups, Vinny told her. I don't know how much help I'll be. You know the lighting in there, especially when they have music. And he was sitting in a back corner where it's darker yet. What did he say to you? Talk about. Corbett asked. Not much. Tonic and lime. I asked if he was meeting anyone because chairs get to be a premium on the weekends. He just repeated the order. Not the friendly sort. We'll arrange the artist when it's a good time for you. We'll be in touch. Since Barbie was sniffing at his shoes, Corbett leaned down to rub her head. Oh, and the dog's a good idea. A big dog barking inside a house makes a lot of B&E men think twice. When Eli let them out, Abra stood there, the basket of laundry on her hip. I'm sorry, Eli. For what? If I'd remembered that guy last night, we might already have a sketch. And I'm already sorry because I don't know how well I can describe him. I really didn't pay close attention to his face after it was clear he wanted to be left alone. We don't even know if he has any part in this. And if he does, however vaguely you remember, it's more than we had. I'm going to meditate later. See if I can clear things out, pull it back. And don't diss meditation. I didn't say a word. You thought several. I'm going to put this laundry in. She checked the time. I'm definitely behind schedule. I'll just take some time tomorrow to do the bedrooms I didn't get to today. I'll finish your grandmother's and get what I can get done by five. I have things to do at home before class. Will you come back after class? I really have things I've neglected, and I'm going to want my own empty house, without your doubting vibes, to meditate. Plus, you and Barbie need to finish bonding. I'll be back tomorrow. Gotta get this load in. She repeated and hurried off. Just you and me, Barbie, Eli told her. Probably for the best. He was getting just a little too used to having Abra there. Probably better for both of them to have some time, some space. But it didn't really feel better. Chapter 18 Blocked, Abra decided. She was blocked. That had to be the answer. She'd meditated, worked with the police artist, tried active dreaming, which she wasn't very good at. And still, the time, effort, and skill of the artist produced a sketch that could be nearly any man between 30 and 40. Any man, she thought, studying her copy of the sketch yet again, with a thin face, long, somewhat shaggy medium brown hair, and thin lips. She couldn't swear to the lips if it came to that. Had they really been thin, or had she projected thin lips because he'd struck her as such a tight ass? So much for her powers of observation, she decided in disgust, which she'd considered above average before this. Of course, there wasn't any proof her tight-ass, tonic-and-lime-drinking customer had anything to do with anything. But still, nothing to be done about it, at least until after the holiday weekend. She added the last little silver ball to finish the pair of citrine and silver dangle earrings. As she filled out the description card, she imagined Eli's family already on their way. That was one good thing. Another? The house hit family holiday perfectly on her scale. At least fussing with that had taken her mind off her pitiful failure with the artist. She wanted progress, as she took off the glasses she wore for close-up work and reading. She admitted she'd hoped to play a part in identifying the intruder and potential murderer in helping Eli resolve his problems with the little rush of solving a mystery. She wanted to make it all neat and tidy when she knew absolutely life was anything but. Now she couldn't shake off the nagging sense of annoyance and the underlying sense of unease. 
At least her new jewelry stock turned out well, if she did say so herself. But her hope that the creative energy would unblock the block fell short. She straightened up her work table in her tiny second bedroom, put her tools and supplies away in their labeled bins. She'd take the new stock into the gift shop and maybe buy herself a little something with the profits. She opted to walk, to give herself a chance to admire the play of daffodils and hyacinths cheerfully showing off their blooms, the colorful Easter eggs dangling from tree branches, the bright pop of forsythia. She always loved the birth of a new season, whether it was the first spear of green in spring or the first drift of snow in winter. But today, anxiety plagued her, so she wished she'd stopped at Maureen's, talked her friend into going into the village with her. It was stupid to feel she was being watched, just a residual reaction to what had happened at Bluff House. And the lighthouse, she thought, as she turned to study its sturdy white lance. No one was following her, though she couldn't resist a look over her shoulder, or the rising chill up her spine. She knew these houses, knew most of the people in them, or who owned them. She passed Surfside Bed and Breakfast, fought off a dragging dread and a sudden urge to turn around, run back home. She wouldn't be chased away by her own silly thoughts, wouldn't deny herself the pleasure of her walks in the place she'd made her home. And she wouldn't think of being grabbed from behind in a dark, empty house. The sun shone, birds called, holiday traffic chugged by. But she let out a relieved breath when she entered the main village with its shops and restaurants and people. It pleased her to see customers milling around the window of the gift shop, tourists taking their holiday at the beach, families like Eli's spending the weekend. She started to go inside, then saw Heather behind the counter. She stepped back, started to walk on. Crap, she muttered. Just crap. She hadn't seen the shop clerk since Heather had run out of yoga class in tears. Heather hadn't made the in-home practice nor the next on her schedule. And inside, Abra harbored enough anger and resentment to prevent her from calling to check. Negative energy, she told herself, and stopped. Time to expel it. Rebalance her chi. And maybe she'd break that block after all. In any case, Heather was who she was. There was no point in hoarding bad feelings on either side. She made herself walk back. Step inside. Good smells, pretty light, the strong sense of local arts and crafts. Take that mood, she ordered herself, and go with it. She waved casually to the other clerk, noted the woman's slight wince as she continued to wait on a customer. No doubt Heather had unloaded her perceived slights on her co-workers. Who could blame her, really? Deliberately, Abra made her way back to Heather, waited patiently as she was studiously ignored. When Heather finished ringing up a sale, Abra stepped forward. Hi, busy today. I just need five minutes. I can wait until you have it. I really can't say when that might be. We have customers. Stiff, jaw tight, Heather skirted around the counter and clipped her way to a trio of women. Temper rose up high enough to actually tickle the base of Abra's throat. She breathed it down again then impulsively picked up a set of hand-blown wine glasses she'd admired for weeks, but couldn't really afford. Excuse me. With a smile plastered on her face, Abra took the glasses over to Heather. Could you ring me up? I just love these. Aren't they great? She said to the other women, and got admiring a sense even as one of them shifted to pick up a set of champagne flutes by the same artist. These would make a wonderful wedding gift, wouldn't they? All smiles, Abra turned one of her glasses in the light. I just love the braided stems. You can't go wrong with anything in buried treasures, Abra added, beaming toward Heather as she held out the glasses. Of course, if you have any questions, just ask, Heather said to the shoppers, then walked back to the counter. Now I'm a customer, Abra announced. First, we've missed you at class. Jaw still tight, Heather got bubble wrap from under the counter, began to roll it around a glass. I've been busy. We've missed you, 
Abra repeated and laid a hand over Heather's. I'm sorry we argued and I said things that upset you and hurt your feelings. You made it seem like I was just a busybody and I... The police were there. I know. And now they're not because he didn't do anything. Someone broke into Bluff House twice. That we're sure of. The first time, whoever it was grabbed me. I know. It's just another reason I'm concerned. I appreciate your concern, but Eli's not the one who tried to hurt me. He was in Boston. And he's not the one who... She took a quick glance around, in case any of the customers were standing close enough to hear. Who hurt the detective from Boston? Because I was with Eli when that happened. Those are facts, Heather, verified by the police. They searched Bluff House. To be thorough, they may search my cottage. Yours? Shock and genuine concern popped through. Why? That's ridiculous. That's not right. Barrier cracked, Abra thought, when Heather's voice rang with insult. Because there's one, just one, cop in Boston who won't accept the facts and the evidence, and he's hounded Eli for a year. Now he's done some hounding in my direction. I think that's terrible. So do I. But since we've got nothing to hide, let him hound. Our local police are investigating now. I have a lot more faith in them finding out what's happening and who's responsible. We take care of our own, Heather said with a nod of civic pride. Just be careful. I will be. Abra tried not to flinch when Heather rang up the glasses. Bye-bye, cute new yoga outfit. But she dug in her bag for her credit card and remembered the jewelry. I nearly forgot. I made about a dozen pieces. She took them out, set them on the counter, all sealed in their clear bags. You can take a look at them when you have time. Let me know. I will. Oh, I love these. She held up the citrine and silver, the last pieces Abra made. Little silver moons and stars. Then the citrine's like sunlight. Those are really nice. The woman with the champagne flutes walked over to the counter. Abra's one of our artists. She just brought in some new pieces. Aren't we lucky? Oh, Joanna, come look at this necklace. It's so you. Abra exchanged a smug look with Heather as she handed over her credit card. The way the three women huddled around the new pieces, she might justify a cute new yoga outfit after all. Thirty minutes later, Abra treated herself to an ice cream cone and walked home in a much more positive state of mind. She'd sold half her new pieces on the spot and two more from what the store already had in stock. Definitely new outfit time, and she had just the one bookmarked on her favorite site. Plus, she'd earned the gorgeous wine glasses. First chance, she'd have Eli to the cottage for a little wine and candlelight dinner and use them. But now she'd try meditation again. Maybe with some incense this time. Usually she preferred the fresh sea air, but that hadn't been working. Change it up, she decided. She let herself into the house, entertained herself by unwrapping and washing her new glasses before setting them out on display on her kitchen shelves. Admiring them gave her positive outlook another boost. In anticipation, she got a pencil, a pad, the copy of the sketch, set it all by her meditation cushion in her bedroom. Though an average artist at best in her own estimation, she thought she might be able to make any changes or additions that came into her mind right then and there. Already starting her breathing, she went to the closet for the box that held her incense, cones and sticks, and the various holders she'd collected over time. Maybe the lotus scent, she considered, to open the mind's eye. Really, she should have tried this before. She got the box off the high shelf, opened it, and with a strangled gasp, dropped it as if it held a hissing snake. Her incense rained down, the holders clattered, and the gun thudded on the floor. Instinctively, she backed away from it. Her first gut reaction was to run, then logic clicked in. Whoever had put the gun there wouldn't be waiting in the house for her to find it. They'd put it there, she thought, as she let herself breathe, so the police would find it. That meant 
had to mean whoever had held that gun last had committed murder. She went straight to the phone. Vinny, I've got a really big problem. Can you come? In under ten minutes, she met him at the door. I didn't know what else to do. You did just right. Where is it? In the bedroom. I didn't touch it. She led the way, then stood back while he crouched to examine the gun. It's a thirty-two. Is that the same kind that- Yeah. He straightened, took his phone out of his pocket, took several pictures. You're not in uniform, she realized. You weren't even on duty. You were home with your family. I shouldn't- Abs, he turned, took her in for a hug, patting her back like a daddy. Relax, Corbett's going to want to know about this. I swear it's not my gun. I know it's not your gun. Nobody's going to think otherwise. Relax, he repeated. We'll sort this out. Have you got anything cold? Cold? Yeah, a Coke, iced tea, whatever. Oh, sure. I could use something cold. Maybe you could go take care of that, and I'll be right out. He'd given her a chore to calm her down, she knew. So she'd calm down. She got out a pan, added water, sugar, then set it on heat to dissolve while she juiced lemons. By the time Vinnie came in, she was pouring her mix into a tall glass pitcher. You didn't have to do all that. It kept my hands busy. Fresh lemonade from scratch. You deserve it. Tell Carla I'm sorry I interrupted your weekend. She's married to a cop, Abra. She gets it. Corbett's on his way. He wants to see it in place. She wanted it and the death surrounding it out of her house. Then you'll take it away. Then we'll take it away, he promised. So go through it with me. I went out, walked to the village, spent a little time in the gift shop. I bought an ice cream cone, came home. As she spoke, she poured the lemonade over ice, added a plate of crispy cookies to the table. I couldn't have been gone more than an hour, an hour and fifteen. Did you lock the doors? Yes. I've been careful, or mostly careful about that, since the break-ins at Bluff House. When's the last time you looked in that box? I don't use incense often, and I haven't bought any in a while. I end up buying it, not using it, giving it away, and I'm rambling. She took a drink. I don't know exactly, but I'd say at least a couple weeks, probably three. You spend a lot of time out of the house, a lot of that time at Bluff House. Yes, classes, my cleaning jobs, shopping, for myself and for clients, errands, and I've been spending most nights with Eli. Whoever killed Kirby Duncan planted it, Vinny, to try to implicate me. That's a pretty sure bet. I'm going to take a look at the doors and windows, okay? Good lemonade, he added. Good cookies, too. She stayed where she was rather than dogging him. Going through her cottage couldn't take long. Small scale, it boasted three bedrooms, though the second of the three hardly qualified as a storage closet and served as her craft room. Kitchen, living room with its sunroom that had been one of its main selling points. Two small baths. Now, it wouldn't take long. She rose, walked to look out on her back deck. Another selling point, that generous outdoor living space. She used it as much as the interior in good weather. Then that view, the jagged curve of the little cape with the lighthouse, the spread of sea and sky. So much what she wanted, and such a constant comfort and pleasure to her. Now someone had violated that, and her. Someone had been in her home, walked through her rooms, and left death behind. She turned when Vinnie came back in, waited while he looked at the deck door, the back windows. You've got windows unlocked back here, and a couple in the front, too. I'm an idiot. You're not. I like to open the house, air it out. I'm a fiend about it. Gripping her own hair, she tugged because it was easier than kicking herself. I'm surprised I thought to lock any of the windows. Couple of threads caught here. He took a picture with his phone. You got tweezers? Yes, I'll get them. Didn't think to bring a kit, he said when she stepped out. I brought an evidence bag for the gun, but not much else. That should be Corbett. He continued at the knock on the door. Do you want me to get it? 
No, I've got it. Tweezers in hand, she opened the front door. Detective Corbett, thanks for coming. Vinny, Deputy Hansen's back in the kitchen. The gun, I'll show you. She led the way to the bedroom. I dropped the box, everything, when I saw it inside. I was getting some incense and it was in there. When's the last time you opened the box? I told Vinny probably three weeks ago. Um, he took pictures, she said when Corbett took out his camera. Now I have my own. He crouched, pulled out a pencil, hooked the trigger guard. Do you own a gun, Ms. Walsh? I don't. I've never owned a gun. I've never even held a gun. Not even a toy one, really. My mother was firmly anti-war toys, and I liked puzzles and crafts and... I'm rambling. I'm nervous. I don't like having a gun in my house. We'll take it with us. Corbett pulled on protective gloves as Vinnie came in. Detective, there's some unlocked windows. Abra told me she doesn't always think to lock them. I've got fibers stuck in one of the rear ones. We'll take a look at that. Who's been in the house in the last couple weeks? Oh, I have in-home yoga classes once a week in the evening. So my students and my neighbor's kids have been over. Oh my God, the kids. Is that loaded? Is that thing loaded? Yeah, it's loaded. What if one of them had come in here and... I'm being irrational. They wouldn't come in here and get that box off the top shelf of my closet. But if they had... She closed her eyes. Any repairman in for any reason? Corbett asked as he pulled an evidence bag from his pocket. No. Landlord? Cable company? Anything like that? No. My class? The kids? Eli Landon? Her eyes flashed. Corbett simply studied her. You told him you know he's innocent. I still have to ask the question. He hasn't been in the cottage in the last few weeks. He's stuck close to Bluff House since the first break-in. I had to wheedle to get him to leave the house long enough to shop for his family's visit this weekend. Okay. He straightened. Let's take a look at the fibers. She waited while they studied them, murmured over them, tweezed them out and bagged them. Would you like some lemonade, detective? I just made it. That'd be nice. Then why don't you sit down? Something about the way he said it made her palms clammy. She poured the drink, sat down at the table. Have you seen anyone hanging around? No, and I haven't seen the man from the bar again. At least, I don't think I have. I should recognize him, even though I haven't been much help with the description. It's why I went for the incense. I thought I'd light some, try more meditation. I've been edgy the last few days, and I thought I'd broken through. Edgy? With all that's gone on, it's understandable, and... Hell with it. Someone's watching me. You've seen someone? No, but I feel it. It's not my imagination, or I'm nearly positive it's not. I know what it's like to be watched now. You know what happened to me a few years ago. Yes, I do. And I feel it, and have for several days now. She glanced toward the window she'd left unlocked toward her glass deck door and the pots of mixed flowers she'd set up in the sun. I'm out of the house a lot, and I've been spending most nights down with Eli. And since I was careless enough not to lock the windows, it would be pitifully easy to get in here, to leave that gun here. But why? I don't understand why here. Why me? Or I do, but it's convoluted. If someone wanted to discredit me, implicate me to cast doubt on Eli's alibi. Why not just plant the gun in Bluff House during the break-in? We searched before he could plant it, or he didn't plan on giving it up. Then he said, Sorry, detective, out of turn. No, it's fine. The last couple days, Wolf's pushed for a search warrant for this cottage. His superiors aren't backing him on it, and neither are mine. But he's pushing. He claims he got an anonymous call telling him the caller saw a woman, a woman with long, curly hair, walking away from the lighthouse on the night Duncan was murdered. I see. A canyon opened up in her belly. You'd find the gun here. So either I killed Duncan or was an accomplice. Do I need a lawyer? It couldn't hurt. But right now this looks like what it is, a setup. 
That doesn't mean we don't go through the process. All right. He sampled the lemonade. Look, Miss Walsh, Abra, I'm going to tell you how this reads and how my boss is going to read it. If you had anything to do with Duncan, why the hell didn't you throw that gun off the cliff, especially after we executed the search on Bluff House? Putting it in your bedroom closet with a bunch of incense? That makes you dumb as a bag of hair, and there's nothing that indicates you're dumb as a bag of hair. Not trusting her voice yet, she nodded. You find it, call it in. Coincidentally, the lead detective on Landon's wife's homicide gets a call from an anonymous source on a prepaid cell that pinged from a local tower, claiming three weeks after the incident, he saw a woman with your hair and body type walking away from the crime scene on the night in question. And Detective Wolf believes him. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but he'd like to hook a search warrant with it. It screams setup and a clumsy one at that, so I think Wolf's not buying it. But like I said, he wouldn't mind giving your place a look. There's nothing here, nothing but that gun. We'll go through the process. I can get a warrant for a search, but it'd be easier all around if you just gave your permission. She didn't want it. It made her a little sick inside, but more she wanted it over. All right, search. Look, do whatever you have to do. Good. When we finish, I want you to make sure this place is locked, including windows. Yes, I will. And I think I'll spend the nights either at Bluff House or with my next-door neighbors until... for a while. Better yet. Do you have to tell Eli now? She dropped her hand when she realized she'd been twisting the smoky quartz pendant she wore, one made in her craft room, around and around on its chain. It's just his family's coming. They're probably here now for Easter. Something like this is going to upset everyone. Until I need to talk to him again, I don't have to tell him anything. Good. I've called for somebody to come in, check for prints, but there won't be any, but it's the process. That's right. She got through it. Little house, she thought, didn't take long. She stayed out of the way, stayed outside when she could. This was how Eli had felt, she realized. How he must have felt when the police came. To check, to search, to look for evidence. He must have felt for that bubble of time. The house wasn't his. His things weren't his things. Then he stepped out. They're finishing up. Nothing, he told her. No prints on the window, on the box, on the contents. He gave her back a quick rub. The search is a formality, Abs. You okaying it without a warrant only adds weight to this being a setup. I know. Want me to hang out with you for a while? No, you should go home to your family. To die Easter eggs, she thought, with his little boy. You didn't have to stay this long. I want you to call me any time for anything. I will count on it. I'm going to put myself together a little and go down to Bluff House. I want to see Hester. You give her my best. I can wait until you're ready to go. No, I'm fine. Better. It's broad daylight. There are people on the beach. He's got no reason to bother me anyway at this point. Keep the doors and windows locked anyway. I will. She walked him out. Her across-the-street neighbor sent her a wave, then went back to digging in his front garden. A couple of boys raced by on bikes. Too much activity, she assured herself, for anyone to try to get inside. And no reason now to do so. She got a trash bag, went into the bedroom. Kneeling, she threw everything on the floor away, box and all. She couldn't know what he'd touched. If she could, she'd have thrown everything in the closet away. Instead, she freshened up her makeup, packed a small bag, included the sketch. After she tidied up the kitchen... She retrieved the strawberry rhubarb pies she'd made, boxed them up. She carried them out to her car, went back for her bag, her purse. And when she locked her front door, her heart broke a little. She loved her little cottage and didn't know when she'd feel safe in it again. Chapter 19 People, noise, movement, filled bluff house. 
Eli had forgotten what it was like to have so many voices speaking at once, so many activities rolling over each other, so many questions to answer. After the initial jolt, he found himself enjoying the company and chaos, holding luggage upstairs or bags and platters into the kitchen, watching his niece toddle everywhere, and holding what seemed to be intense conversations with the dog, noting his mother's surprised approval when he pulled out a fancy tray of fruit and cheese to offer as a post-trip snack. But his biggest pleasure came from seeing his grandmother stand on the terrace, the breeze fluttering her hair as she looked out to sea. When he slipped out to join her, she leaned against him. In the beam of sun, the old dog, Sadie, raised her head, gave a little wag, then went back to sleep. Sun warms old bones, Hester said, mine and Sadie's. I've missed this, I know. He draped an arm around her shoulders, and I think this has missed you. I like to think so. You potted pansies. Abra did. I water them. Teamwork's a good thing. It's helped knowing you're here, Eli. Not just on the practical level of having someone in the house, but having you here. Because I think this has missed you, too. The familiar vine of guilt and regret wound through him. I'm sorry I stayed away so long. Sorrier I thought I had to. Did you know I hated to sail? Pure shock had him gaping down at her. You? Hester first mate Landon? I thought you loved it. Your grandfather loved it. I had to take a pill to keep my stomach steady. I love the sea, but better when I'm on land looking at it. We sailed together, Eli and I, and I don't regret a single pill a single minute on the water with him. Marriage is a series of compromises, and at its best the compromises create a life, a partnership. You compromised, Eli, and that's nothing to apologize for. I was going to take you out tomorrow. She laughed, quick and delighted. Let's not. Why do you keep the boat? When she simply looked at him, smiled at him, he understood. For love, he thought, and pressed his lips to her cheek. She shifted to look him in the eye. So, you have a dog? I guess I do. She needed a place I can relate. A dog's a healthy step. She shifted again to study him more closely and leaned on her cane. You look better. I hope to hell I do. You look better, Gran. I hope to hell I do. She let out another laugh. We were a couple of wounded warriors, weren't we, young Eli? Healing up now and coming on strong. Come home, Gran. She sighed, gave his arm a squeeze before she walked with the aid of her cane to a chair to sit. I've got more healing to do yet. You can heal here. I'll stay with you as long as you need. Something shimmered in her eyes. For a moment he feared tears, but it was light. Sit, she told him. I fully intend to come back, but now's not the time. It would be both impractical and unwise to be here when I have all those damned doctors and physical therapists in Boston. I can take you in for your appointments, he hadn't realized, not really, until he'd seen her standing on the terrace, her eyes on the sea, how much he wanted her back. We can arrange for you to have your therapy here. God, how much your mind's like mine. I've considered exactly that almost from the moment I woke up in the hospital. Coming back's one of the main things that got me through. I come from tough stock, and marrying a Landon gave me more. I made those doctors eat crow when I recovered, when I got on my feet again. They didn't know Hester Landon. They know me now. She sat back. But I've got a ways to go yet. 
I need your mother. Oh, I need your father, too. He's a good son and always has been. But I need Lissa, bless her, for a while longer. I'm on my feet, but I can't stay there as much as I'd like, as much as I will. So I'll stay in Boston until I'm satisfied I'm steady again. And you'll stay here. As long as you want. Good. Because this is exactly where I want you, and always have. I wondered if I'd be the last Landon in Bluff House, the last who'd live in Whiskey Beach. I've asked myself more than once if the reason I never warmed to Lindsay was because she'd keep you in Boston. Gran, well, however selfish and self-serving it was part of the why. Not the whole, but part. I would have accepted that, or tried, if she'd made you happy. The way Trisha's family and her work at Land and Whiskey make her happy. She's a whiz at it, isn't she? She takes after your grandfather and your father, born and bred for it. You're more like me. Oh, we can handle business when we have to, and we're not fools. But it's art that pulls us. Reaching over, she patted his hand. Even when you turned your sights on the law, it was your writing that made you happiest. It seemed like too much fun to be a job. And now that it's a job, it's a lot more work. When I practiced law, it felt as if I had something important, something solid, more than daydreaming on paper. Is that all there is to it? Daydreaming? No. Lindsay used to call it that. He'd nearly forgotten. Not harshly, but... A handful of short stories wasn't all that impressive. She preferred the impressive, and I don't say that harshly. She was who she was. But in that series of compromises, the plain truth is Lindsay rarely pulled her weight. Or not that I could see. People who say not to speak ill of the dead just don't have the spine to say what they think. You've got plenty of spine. He hadn't expected to talk of Lindsay, not here, not with his grandmother. But maybe this was the place to put some of it to rest. It wasn't all her fault. It's rarely only one person's fault. I thought we'd take our own steps, meld our strengths, weaknesses, goals. But I married a princess. Her father always called her that, princess. Ah, yes, I recall that now. She always got what she wanted. She was raised to believe she could and would, and should. She was naturally charming, incredibly beautiful, and absolutely believed her life would be perfect, exactly the way she wanted. And life isn't a series of fairy tales, even for a princess. I guess not, he agreed. It turned out life just wasn't perfect with me. She was young and spoiled, and given the chance, she may have matured and become less self-involved. She did have charm and an excellent eye for art, for decor, for fashion. With time, she might have made something of that, and of herself. But the blunt truth is she wasn't your match, or your mate, or the love of your life. You weren't hers. No, he admitted. Neither of us made the grade. The best that can be said is you both made a mistake. She paid too big a price for that mistake, and I'm sorry for it. She was a young, beautiful woman, and her death was senseless and cruel. It's done. No, Eli thought. Not until who caused it paid. I have a question for you, Hester continued. Are you happy here? I'd be crazy not to be. And you work well here. Better than I expected or hoped. For most of this past year, writing was more of an escape, a way to get out of my head or into another part of it. Now it's my work. I want to be good at it. I think being here has helped me with that. Because this is your place, Eli. You belong in Whiskey Beach. Trisha? We all know her life, her family, her homes in Boston. She glanced back through the terrace doors, where Selina sprawled on the floor beside an ecstatic Barbie. 
This is a place for her to come to spend a weekend, a summer break, a winter holiday. It's not home for her and never was. It's your home, Gran. You're damn right it is. Her jaw lifted. Her eyes went deep and soft as she looked over the heads of fluttering pansies and out to the roll of the sea. I fell in love with your grandfather on that beach one heady spring night. I knew he'd be mine and we'd make our home in this house, raise our children here, live our lives. It's my home, and what's mine I'm free to give. She turned to Eli now, and those soft eyes went steely. Unless you tell me and make me believe that you don't want it, you can't make your life here, be happy here. I'll be making arrangements to deed it to you. Stunned, he could only stare at her. Gran, you can't give me bluff house. I can do exactly as I please, boy. She tapped her finger firmly on his arm. As I always have and intend to continue to do. Gran. She tapped her finger again, a warning this time. Bluff House is a home, and a home needs to be lived in. It's your legacy and your responsibility. I want to know if you're willing to make it your home, if you're willing to stay when I'm able to come back, and when I'm gone. Is there somewhere else you'd rather be? No. Well, then, that's settled. It's a weight off my mind. With a contented sigh, she looked out to sea again. Just like that? She smiled, reached over to lay a hand on his, gently now. The dog clinched it. Even as he laughed, Trisha opened the terrace doors. If you two can tear yourself away, it's egg-dying time. Let's get to it. Give me a hand, Eli. I can get down, but I still have trouble getting up. He helped her to her feet, then just wrapped his arms around her. I'll take good care of it, I promise you. But come home soon. That's the plan. She'd given him a lot to think about, but dying Easter eggs with a toddler not to mention her very competitive 58-year-old grandfather, made it difficult to think. So Eli just rolled with it. By the time the doorbell chimed, puddles of dye pooled and splattered the newspaper covering the kitchen island. With the dog at his side, he opened the door for Abra. She stood with the straps of bags over each shoulder and a covered tray in her hands. Sorry, I didn't have enough hands to open it myself. He just grinned at her, leaned over the tray to kiss her. I was about to call you. He took the tray, angling so she could get by him. I thought you'd be here before this. But I did, with great effort and canniness, manage to save some eggs for you. Thanks. I just had some things to deal with. Is anything wrong? What could be wrong? She set the bags aside. Hello, Barbie. Hello. Better to hedge, she decided, than dump distressing news on a family party. Pies take time. Pies? Pies. She took the tray back, walked with him to the back of the house. From the sound of it, everyone settled in. Like they've been here a week. Good or bad? Good. Really good. She saw that for herself when they stepped into the kitchen. Everyone was spread around the island. Eggs, colored with varying degrees of skill and creativity, sat nesting in crates. She pumped up her smile, tried to put the horrible day behind her as attention turned to her. Happy Easter! She hurried over to set down the pies, turned immediately to Hester. After wrapping her arms around Hester, she closed her eyes, swayed a little. It's so good to see you here. It's so good to see you. Let me look at you. Hester drew her back. I've missed you. I need to come visit more often. With your schedule? We are going to sit down with a glass of wine for you and a martini for me, and you're going to fill me in on all the gossip, because I'm not ashamed to say I've missed that, too. 
You're nearly up to date, but I can dig out a few more tidbits for wine. Rob? Abra rose on her toes to embrace Eli's father. Eli watched her work her way through his family. Hugging came naturally to her. That physical contact, the intimate touch. But seeing her with his family made him realize she was woven through their lives in ways he hadn't understood. He'd been apart, he thought now had taken himself to the side, but too long. Within minutes, she stood hip to hip with his sister, using a wax crayon to draw design on an undyed egg and talking about potential names for the new baby. His father edged him aside. While they're busy finishing up here, take me down and show me this business in the basement. It wasn't the most pleasant of tasks, but it needed to be done. They went down, started through. Rob paused beyond the wine cellar. He stood, a man who'd passed his height, his build, and the land and eyes, to his son, his hands in the pockets of khakis. In my grandmother's day, this whole area was filled with jams, jellies, fruits, vegetables, bins of potatoes, apples. It always smelled like fall to me in here. Your grandmother continued the tradition, though on a smaller scale. But then the days of the endless and elaborate parties faded off. I remember some elaborate parties. Nothing like the generation before, Rob said as they moved on. Hundreds of people, and dozens of them who'd stay for days, even weeks during the season. For that, you needed a lot of idle time, a warehouse of food and drink, and a house full of servants. My father was a businessman. If he had had a religion, it would have been business as opposed to society. I never knew about the servants' passageways. I just heard about them. To my great disappointment as a boy, they'd been closed up before I was born. Mom threatened to do the same with parts of the basement. I used to sneak down here with my friends. God knows why. I did the same thing. <laughs> you think I didn't know? Rob chuckled slapped Eli on the shoulder, then stopped again when they reached the old section. Christ almighty, I know you told me how extensive, but I didn't fully believe it. What kind of madness is this? Treasure fever, I think. Nothing else makes sense. You can't grow up in Whiskey Beach and not come across treasure fever, even catch a mild case. You? I believed feverishly. In Esmeralda's dowry as a teenager, scoured books, hunted up maps. I took scuba lessons in preparation for a career as a treasure hunter. I grew out of it. But there's still a part that wonders. But this, this is senseless and dangerous. The police have no leads? Not so far. Or not that they're sharing with me. Then again, they have a murder on their hands. Eli had considered this, had weighed the pros and cons of laying it all out for his father. He hadn't known until that moment he decided to do so. I think they might be connected. Rob studied his son. I think we should take those dogs of ours for a walk, and you can tell me why and how. Inside, Abra sat with Hester in the morning room. This is nice, Abra said. I've missed this. You've kept the house beautifully. I knew you would. She gestured to the pots of flowers on the terrace outside. Your work, I'm told. I got some limited assistance. Eli's not much of a gardener. That can change. He's changed since he's been here. He needed the time, the space. It's more than that. I'm seeing glimpses of who he used to be, mixed with who he's becoming. It does my heart good, Abra. He's happier than when he came. He looks so sad, so lost, and so angry under it all. I know it, and it's more than what happened in the past year. He let too much of himself go before that because he'd made a promise, and keeping promises is important. Did he love her? It doesn't feel right to ask him. 
I think he loved parts of her. And he wanted what he thought they could make together. Wanted it enough to make the promise. A promise is a fearsome thing. For some, yes. For people like Eli, and for you. If his marriage had been happy, he might have become someone else yet. Some other combination of himself. Someone who could have been content with his work in the law, his life in Boston. And he'd have kept the promise. I would have lost the boy who once thrived in Whiskey Beach, but that would have been fine. The same could be said about you. I guess it could. Is he seeing people? He likes his solitude, but that goes with the work he's chosen. But yes, he and Mike O'Malley seem to have hit it off. And he's reconnected with Vinnie Hansen. Oh, that boy. <laughs> Who'd have thought that half-naked, surf-riding, pot-smoking layabout would end up a county deputy? You always liked him. It shows. He was so damn affable. I'm glad Eli's reconnected with him. And is friendly with Mike. I think Eli makes friends and keeps them easily. Oh, and he spent the best part of an evening tossing them back with Stoney at the pub. They really hit it off. Good God. I hope someone drove him home. And I don't mean Stoney. We walked. Abra realized the implications of we the instant Hester's brows lifted. I wondered. With a curve to her lips, Hester lifted her martini glass. Melissa seemed very excited you'd join us for the weekend. I don't want it to be awkward. Hester, you mean so much to me. Why would it be awkward? When I asked Eli to stay here, I hoped he'd find that time and space, find those pieces of himself. And I hoped the two of you would start walking home together. Did you? Why wouldn't I? In fact, I intended to meddle if necessary, once I got fully back on my feet. Are you in love with him? Abra took a deep sip of wine. You move fast. I'm old, I can't waste time. Old my ass. But not so old I don't notice you haven't answered the question. I don't know the answer. I love being with him and watching him become the way you talked about. I know things are complicated for both of us, so I'm happy with that. Complications are part of living. Taking her time, Hester sampled one of the two olives in her glass. I know some of what's happened here, but not, I think, all. Everyone's too careful around me. I have a blank in my memory, but my mind's perfectly sound. Of course it is. And the rest of me soon will be. I know someone broke into Bluff House, and that's upsetting. I know someone was killed, and the police searched the house, which is more upsetting. The lead detective doesn't consider Eli a suspect, Abra said quickly. In fact, he doesn't believe he had anything to do with Lindsay's death. Her face a study of relief and annoyance, Hester sat back. Why hasn't anybody told me that? I imagine they didn't want to upset you with everything that went around it. But as bad as it's been, what happened has worked Eli up. He's pissed, Hester, seriously pissed, and he's ready to stand up, to fight back. That's a good thing. A very good thing. She looked outside, toward the sea. And this is a very good place to make a stand. Sorry to break this up. Lissa walked in, gave the watch on her wrist a tap. Oh, it's the warden, Hester announced. Hester, you need to rest. I'm sitting. I'm drinking an excellent martini. I'm resting. We had a deal. On a huff of breath, Hester downed the rest of her martini. All right, all right. I'm required to take a nap, just like little Sally. And if you don't, you're as cranky as Sally when she misses hers. My daughter-in-law has no problem insulting me. It's why you love me, Lissa said, as she helped Hester to her feet. One of the many.
We'll talk more later, she said to Abra. Alone, Abra gave herself a moment for depression, for worry. Should she make an excuse and run home? For what? To make sure no one had broken in? Left more incriminating evidence? She had nothing to gain by obsessing, by letting worry nibble away at the corners of her mind. Better off here, she told herself, with people. Better off enjoying the moment. God knew what might happen next. Rising, she wandered into the kitchen. She'd like to cook something, she realized, but right now she was guest, not housekeeper, and didn't have free reign. She should take her things upstairs, put together the little gift bags she'd made for the family. She needed to keep busy. She turned when Lissa came back in. Hester always complains about the nap and always sleeps like a rock for an hour. She's always been so active and independent. Don't I know it? Still, an hour's nap is nothing. When she was first hurt, she was rarely awake for an hour at a time. She beat all the odds, and I shouldn't have expected less. You know, that looks good. Let me pour you a glass. I was just poking around, wondering what I could do to help. With dinner, or anything. Oh, I'm going to draft you for dinner detail. I can hold my own in the kitchen when our Alice lets me. But I'm no Martha Stewart. You must be a wonderful cook. I must? Hester said so, and I see the evidence myself. Eli's putting weight back on instead of shedding it. I owe you for that. I like to cook, and he remembered he liked to eat. And he remembered he likes dogs, and walks on the beach, and companionship. I'm grateful, Abra. I liked reminding him. This shouldn't be awkward. We had a friendly relationship before you and Eli started seeing each other. You're right. She let out a breath. I haven't been involved with anyone in a long time, especially anyone with close family. Truth, I'm so used to doing whatever needs to be done around here, or finding something that could be done. I'm not sure what I should or shouldn't do as a guest. Why don't we take guest out of it and consider we're all family? Hester thinks of you as hers. Eli thinks of you. Why don't we start with that? I'd like that. Then I can stop second-guessing myself. I had Max take your things up to Eli's room. Lissa offered an easy smile and a twinkle. I didn't see the point in second-guessing. After a surprised laugh, Abra nodded. That makes it all simple. Why don't you give me the basics of the weekend's menus and I'll take assignments? We can do that. But while we've got a minute or so, I'd like you to tell me what exactly has gone on. I know Eli's out there using that sweet dog and poor old Sadie as excuses to give his father all the details he's left out. Protect the women folk from worrying their pretty heads. Abra fisted her hands on her hips. Really? It's not quite that bad, but not that far off. I lived the last year too, Abra. Every day of it. Every hour. I want to know what's happening with my son. Then I'll tell you. She hoped she'd done the right thing. But to Abra, it had been the only thing. Direct questions deserved direct answers. Now, as she trusted Lissa's judgment... Both Eli's parents knew the score. No more hedging or leaving out unpleasant details. And what was she doing, she asked herself. Wasn't she hedging and leaving out unpleasant details? Eli certainly had a right to know about the planted gun, the police search. Shouldn't she trust him enough for full disclosure? There you are. Eli, windblown, smiling, walked in. Barbie deserted me for my father and her new best friend, Sadie. I think she's a little too easy. Good thing she's spayed. Any handsome hound might seduce her. I'm really glad you're here. I told my father the whole shot, all the grim and grisly details. I figured it was time. Good, because I just finished doing the same with your mother. My goose and gander, Eli. She asked me directly, I answered. And she'll worry less knowing than wondering. I just wanted her to feel safe and unburdened here for a couple days. 
I understand. I thought the same, and that's why I did. Is that Hester? At the shout, Eli was out of the room before Abra finished the question and moving fast to his grandmother's bedroom. Close on his heels, Abra hurried in to see Hester, white as the sheets, sitting up in bed. Her breath came too fast, and the hands she reached out to Eli shook. Abra darted into the bathroom for water. It's okay, I'm right here. Take it easy, Gran. Here, Hester, drink a little water. Remember your breathing. Abra's voice was a bomb over a wound. Hold the glass for her, Eli, while I fix the pillows. I want you to relax back now. Breathe. Hester kept one hand gripped on Eli's, sipped slowly before she let Abra ease her back against the pillows. I heard a noise. I ran upstairs. Eli began. I wasn't thinking. No. Her eyes on Eli's. Hester shook her head. That night, that night I heard a noise. I got up because I heard a noise. I remember. I remember getting up. What kind of noise? Footsteps. I thought, but then I thought I was imagining things. Old houses make noise. I'm used to it. The wind, I thought, but it was still, almost still that night. Just the house creaking like an old woman. I thought I'd make some tea. Some of that special herbal tea you got for me, Abra. It's soothing. I'd make tea and I'd be able to sleep again. I got up to go downstairs. It's in pieces. It's all in pieces. It's all right, Gran. You don't have to remember it all. Her grip tightened. I saw something. I saw someone. Someone in the house. Did I run? Did I fall? I, I don't remember. Who did you see? I don't know. I'm not sure. Her voice cracked on it. Fragile glass. I can't see his face. I tried to get downstairs, but he's behind me. I, I think... I think I couldn't go up, so I ran down. I hear him. I hear him coming after me. Then I can't remember anything until I woke up in the hospital. You were there, Eli. You were the first one I saw when I woke up. I knew I'd be all right because I saw you. You are all right. He kissed her hand. Someone was in the house. I didn't dream it. No, you didn't dream it. I won't let him come back, Gran. He won't hurt you again. It's you who's in the house now, Eli. You have to protect yourself. I will, I promise you. Bluff House is my responsibility now. Trust me. More than anyone. She closed her eyes a moment. Behind the armoire, on the third floor, the big double armoire, there's a mechanism in the molding that opens a panel. I thought all the passageways were sealed. Her breathing leveled, and when she opened her eyes again, they beamed clear. Yes, most are sealed, but not all. Curious little boys can't move that heavy armoire, or the shelving in the basement in the old section, where your grandfather had a little workshop for a short time. There's another panel behind the shelving. The rest I had sealed. A compromise. Now she managed to smile at him. Your grandfather let me have my way, and I let him have his. So we didn't seal those two, and completely close a bluffhouse tradition. I didn't even tell your father. Not even when he was old enough not to be foolish. Why? His place was Boston. Yours is here. If you need to hide, to get away, use the panels. No one else knows. Except Stony Tribbett, if he remembers. He remembers. He drew me a blueprint of where the panels used to be. But he didn't tell me two were still open. Loyalty, Hester said simply. I asked him not to tell anyone. All right, now I know, and you don't have to worry about me. 
I need to see his face. The man who was in the house that night. I will see it. I'll put the pieces together. Why don't I fix you that tea now? Abra offered. It's past time for tea. Hester squared her shoulders. But you can help me get up, get myself downstairs. Then you can pour me a good glass of whiskey. Chapter 20 Twice during the night, Eli rose to prowl the house, the dog padding faithfully by his side. He checked doors, windows, the alarm, even slipped out to the main terrace to scan the beach for movement. Everyone he cared about was sleeping in Bluff House, so he'd take no chances. What his grandmother remembered changed things. Not the intruder. He'd already believed there was one on the night she fell. But the location. She'd described seeing someone upstairs, then running down or trying to. Not someone on the main floor, someone who had come up from the basement. That left three options. His grandmother's mind was confused. Possible, of course, given the trauma she'd suffered. But he didn't think so. It was also possible they were dealing with two different intruders, either connected or completely separate. He couldn't and wouldn't discount that avenue. Last, a single intruder. The same one who had broken in and assaulted Abra. The same person who had excavated the old basement. Which posed the question, what had he been looking for upstairs? What had been the purpose? Once the family left for Boston, he'd go through the house again, room by room, space by space, looking for answers from that angle. Until then, he and Barbie were on guard duty. He lay wakeful beside Abra, trying to piece it together. An unnamed intruder partnered with Duncan? Moved to the no honor among thieves theory, and the unnamed kills Duncan, then removes all records associated with him from Duncan's office. Possible. Duncan's client, the intruder, hired him. Duncan learns the client's breaking and entering, attacking women. Confronts the client, either threatening to report him to the police or attempting blackmail. And the client kills him and removes the records. Equally possible. The intruder, or intruders, weren't related to Duncan in any way. In doing his job, he discovered them and was killed. Possible too, but unlikely. At least it seemed so at four in the morning. He tried to shift his mind to his work. At least there were channels and possibilities in his plot he could solve before dawn. He'd boxed in his main character. With the antagonist, with a woman, with the authorities. With his life in turmoil, he faced conflict and consequences on every level. It all came down to choices. Would he turn left or right? Would he stand still and wait? Eli considered all three as his mind finally started to fuzz with sleep. And somewhere in the maze of his subconscious, fiction and reality merged. Eli opened the front door of the house in the back bay. He knew every step, every sound, every thought, but still couldn't make himself change any of it. Just turn around. Walk back out into the rain. Just drive away. Instead, he repeated the loop he'd taken the night of Lindsay's murder and revisited in dreams ever since. He couldn't change it. And yet, it changed. He opened a door in the back bay and walked into the basement at Whiskey Beach. He held a flashlight as he maneuvered in the dark. Some part of his mind thought, power's off. The power's off again. He needed to kickstart the generator. He walked by a wall of shelves filled with gleaming jars, all carefully labeled. Strawberry preserves, grape jam, peaches, green beans, stewed tomatoes. Someone's been busy, he thought, circling around a mound of potatoes. A lot of mouths to feed in Bluff House. His family slept in their beds. Abra slept in his a lot of mouths to feed. A lot of people to protect. He'd made a promise to tend the house. Landon's kept their promises. He needed to get the power on again, restore the light, the warmth, the safety, and protect what was his, what he loved, 
what was vulnerable. As he approached the generator, he heard the sound of the sea like a hum, a note that rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell. And against the hum, he heard the bright beat of metal against stone, a metronome keeping time. Someone's in the house, striking at the house, threatening what it was his to protect. He felt the butt of a gun in his hand, looked down to see the glint of one of the dueling pistols in a light that had gone blue and eerie as the sea. He moved through it while the hum built to a roar. But when he stepped into the old section, he saw nothing but the trench scarring the floor. He stepped to it, looked into it, and saw her. Not Lindsay, not here. Abra lay in that deep scar. Blood murderously red soaking her shirt, matting those wonderfully wild curls. Wolf stepped out of the shadows to stand in the blue light. Help me. Help her. On the plea, Eli dropped to his knees to reach for her. Cold, too cold. He remembered Lindsay as Abra's blood covered his hands. Too late. No, he couldn't be too late. Not again. Not with Abra. She's dead like the other one. Wolf raised his service weapon. You're responsible. Their blood's on your hands. This time you won't walk away. The blast and echo of gunfire jolted Eli out of the dream and into fresh panic. Gasping for breath, he pressed at the phantom pain in his chest. Stared down, certain he'd see his own blood leaking through his fingers. Beneath his palm, his heart pounded while drumming against atavistic fear. He groped for Abra, found the bed beside him cool and empty. It was morning, he reassured himself. Only a dream. And now the sun streamed through the terrace doors and sprinkled white stars on the water. Everyone in Bluff House remained safe, secure. Abra had already gotten up, started the day. Everything was fine. He pushed up, saw the dog curled in her bed, one paw possessively over a toy bone. For some reason, the sleeping dog settled him down another notch, reminded him reality could be just as simple as a good dog and a sunny Sunday morning. He'd take the simple, as long as it lasted, over the complexities and miseries of dreams. The minute Eli's feet hit the floor, Barbie's head came up and her tail swished. Everything's fine, he said out loud. He pulled on jeans and sweatshirt, then went to look for Abra in her usual morning spot. It didn't surprise him to find her in the gym, but it did to see his grandmother there with her. And it struck him as undeniably weird to see indomitable Hester Landon sitting cross-legged on a red mat, wearing stretchy black pants that stopped just above the knee, and a lavender top that left her arms and, with two deep scoops, much of her shoulders bare. He saw the scar from her surgery running up her left arm at the elbow. Deep trenches, he thought, as in the basement. Scars on what was his, what he loved, what he needed to protect. On an inhale, lean left. Don't overstretch, Hester. You got me doing old lady yoga. The annoyance in Hester's voice made the whole scene marginally less weird. We're taking it slow. Breathe here. Inhale, both arms up, palms touch. Exhale. Inhale and lean right, both arms up. Repeat that twice. As she spoke, Abra rose to kneel behind Hester and rub her shoulders. You've got a touch, girl. And you've got a lot of tension here. Relax, shoulders down and back. We're just loosening up, that's all. God knows I need it. I wake up stiff and stay that way. I'm losing my flexibility. I don't know if I can even touch my toes. You'll get it back. What did the doctor say? You weren't hurt worse? Wasn't dead, Hester corrected. And with his view of her profile, Eli saw Abra squeeze her eyes shut. Because you have strong bones, a strong heart, a hard head. 
No argument. You've taken care of yourself and stayed active all your life. You're healing now and need to be patient. You'll be doing half moons and standing straddles by summer. I often think it's a shame I didn't know those positions when my Eli was alive. It took a moment for Eli to comprehend, then to be shocked and mortified. It took less for Abra's quick and wicked laugh. In loving memory of your Eli, exhale, navel to spine, and lean forward, gently. Gently. I hope young Eli appreciates how limber you are. I can attest. And the young Eli decided to beat a discreet retreat. He'd make coffee, take a mug of it with him and walk the dogs. By the time he'd finished that, his grandmother should be dressed like his grandmother. And maybe her allusion to sex with his grandfather would have faded from his mind. He caught the scent of coffee as he walked toward the kitchen and found his sister in pink pajamas inhaling a cup. Sadie stirred herself to stand from her sprawl on the kitchen floor so she and Barbie could sniff at each other. Where's the baby? Right here. Trisha patted her anthill-sized bump. Big sister's upstairs having a Sunday snuggle with daddy. I'm getting a window of quiet and the single stingy cup of coffee I'm allowed a day. You can have one, too. Then help me hide eggs. I can do that, after I take the dogs for a walk. Deal. Trisha stooped to give Barbie a rub. She's such a sweetheart, and nice company for Sadie. If she had a brother or sister, I'd snatch one up. She was wonderful with Sally, so patient and gentle. Yeah, some guard dog, Eli thought as he poured his coffee. I didn't have much time to talk to you, not alone, I wanted to say you look good. You look like Eli. <laughs> Who did I look like before? Like Eli's gaunt, pasty-faced, slightly dull-witted uncle. Thanks, you asked. You're a little on the skinny side yet, but you look like Eli. For that I love Abra, a lot. At his sidelong look, she angled her head. Are you going to tell me she has nothing to do with it? No. I'm going to say I don't know how I've lived with this family all my life without realizing the obsession with sex. I just overheard Gran make a sexual allusion to Abra about Granddad. Really? Really? And now I have to burn it out of my memory. Come on, Barbie. Let's take Sadie for a walk. But Sadie sprawled out again, yawned hugely. I'd say Sadie's taking a pass, Trisha observed. Fine. Just you and me, Barbie. We'll be back to play Easter Bunny in a few. Good enough. I wasn't just talking about sex, she called out. He glanced back from the laundry room as he grabbed the leash. I know. He tried something different since he didn't have to keep to Sadie's dignified pace. And he had the beach to himself on an early Easter Sunday. Once he'd downed the coffee, he screwed the mug into the sand near the steps, then set off in a kind of half jog. When he asked his body how it felt about the idea, it wasn't altogether sure. But the dog loved it. Loved it enough to increase the pace until Eli found himself in full jog. No question he'd pay for this one later, he decided. Good thing he had a massage therapist on hand. He had a flash of her as she'd been in the dream, pale and bloody on the cold, stony dirt of the basement. The image sent his heart knocking harder than the run. Eventually, he managed to slow the dog to a walk again, pull in some of the moist air to soothe his dry throat. So he was more anxious about the break-ins than he'd been willing to admit, more concerned about his family, about Abra, than he'd wanted to admit in the cold light of day. We're going to have to do more about it than bark, he said to the dog, and turned her around to head home. But we've got to get through today and tomorrow morning first. He looked toward Bluff House, shocked to see how far they'd run. Well, Jesus. Less than two months before, he'd been prone, panting and covered in sweat at a half mile. Today he'd breezed through twice that. Maybe he really was himself again. Okay, Barbie, let's try for the circuit. 
He ran back, the joyful dog beside him. When he looked up at Bluff House, he saw Abra on the terrace, a hoodie over her yoga gear. She lifted her arm in a wave. That was the picture he'd keep in his head, he promised himself. Abra with Bluff House at her back and the breeze dancing through her hair. He grabbed the mug. By the time he crested the beach steps, he was winded, but in a damn good way. A man and his dog, she said, greeting them both. A man, his dog, and the theme from Rocky. Adrian! He scooped her off her feet. Her laugh rang out as he gave her a spin. What was in that coffee, and is there any left? It's going to be a good day. Is it? Sure. Any day that starts out with chocolate bunnies and jelly beans for breakfast is a good day. We've got to hide eggs. Already done, Rocky. You missed out. Even better, now I get to hunt them. Give me some hints, he demanded. You may not be aware, but Robert Edwin Landon, CEO of Landon Whiskey, chair or co-chair of countless worthy charitable boards and head of the renowned Landon family, would body block his tiny little granddaughter to win the egg hunt. He would not. Okay, maybe he'd give the kid a break, but he'd sure as hell body block his only son. Maybe true, but no hints from me. Still, let's go inside and get your Easter basket before her father comes down and grabs them all. It was a good day. Though he ate enough candy that the idea of waffles for breakfast made him a little queasy. But he ate them anyway, and put everything aside to enjoy the moments. His father in light-up bunny ears that made Selena belly laugh. The pleasure on his grandmother's face when he gave her a pretty bowl filled with mixed spring bulbs and fragrant bloom. Waging war with water pistols against his brother-in-law, and accidentally, mostly, shooting his sister dead in the heart when she opened the terrace door. Surprising Abra with a vivid green orchid, because it reminded him of her. They feasted on ham and roasted potatoes, tender asparagus and Abra's herbed bread on eggs deviled out of their colorful shells and more in the formal dining room. Candles flickering, crystal winking, the sea singing its siren song against the rocky shore made the perfect backdrop for the very good day he'd predicted. He couldn't remember the Easter before, with Lindsay's murder so fresh, with the hours he'd spent in interrogation, the living fear that the police would again knock on the door and this time take him away in handcuffs. All that blurred now, the pale, strained faces of his family, the gradual and steady retreat of those he'd considered friends, the loss of his job, the accusations flung out at him if he ventured into public. He'd gotten through it. Whatever hounded him now, he'd get through that. He'd never give this up again, this feeling of home and of hope, to Whiskey Beach, he thought, lifting his glass and catching Abra's eye, Abra's smile. He drank to it, and everything in it. When he stood on Monday morning after helping load cars, the feeling of hope remained with him. He gave his grandmother a last goodbye hug. I remember, she whispered in his ear. Stay safe until I do. I will. And tell Abra she won't be teaching her morning yoga class without me much longer. I'll do that, too. Come on, Mom. Let's get you in the car. Rob gave his son a one-armed man hug, a slap on the back. We'll see you soon. Summer's coming, Eli said, helping his grandmother. Make time, okay? We will. His father walked around to the driver's seat. It was good. Good to have all the Landons in Bluff House again. Stay ready for us. We'll be back. Eli waved them off, watched them until the road curved away. Beside him, Barbie let out a quiet whine. You heard him. They'll be back. Turning, Eli studied Bluff House. We have work to do before that. We're going to find out what that asshole was looking for. We're going to give Bluff House a clean sweep. Right? Barbie wagged her tail. I'll take that as a yes. Let's get started. 
He started at the top. The third floor. The servant's domain back in the day. Now served as storage for odd pieces of furniture. Trunks that held vintage clothes or memorabilia previous landings had been too sentimental to discard and too practical to display. After the search, the cops hadn't bothered to replace the dust sheets, so they lay in white piles like snowdrifts over the floor. If I were an obsessed treasure hunter, what would I be looking for up here? Not the treasure itself, Eli decided. The purloined letter aside, hiding in plain sight had its limits. No one would believe any of the previous occupants would have tucked a chest full of drools away within the saggy divan or behind the spotty mirror. He wandered around, poking into boxes and trunks, tossing dust covers back over chairs. The light streamed in so motes danced in beams, and the silence of the house accented the toss and suck of the surf. He couldn't imagine living with the army of servants who'd once slept in the warren of rooms, or gathered in the larger space for meals or gossip. There'd never be true solitude, true silence, and forget genuine privacy. A trade-off, he supposed. To maintain a house like this, and live and entertain as his ancestors did, required the army. His grandparents had preferred a less elaborate lifestyle. In any case, the days of Gatsby were done, at least in Bluff House. Still, it seemed a shame and a waste to have an entire floor occupied by shrouded furniture, boxes of books, trunks filled with dresses layered with tissue and sachets of lavender. It'd make a great artist's studio, wouldn't it? He asked Barbie. If I could paint. Grand can, but this is too much of a hole, and she likes using her sitting room for that or painting on the terrace. Taking a break, doing the shoulder rolls Abra had recommended, he prowled around the former servant's parlor. Still, the light's great. Little kitchen area over there. Update the sink, put in a microwave. Update this bathroom, he added after taking a look at the old pull-chain toilet. Or better, have these old fixtures rehabbed. Make use of some of the furniture that's just sitting here. Frowning, he walked to the windows overlooking the beach. Generous windows, great view, a likely architectural decision rather than one done for the staff's benefit. He moved off into the gable, thinking of his first wandering through the day he'd arrived. Yeah, he could work up here, he thought again. It wouldn't take much to fix it up a little. He didn't need much. Move a desk up, some files, shelves. And yeah, update this bathroom too. What writer doesn't want a garret? Yeah, maybe. Maybe I'll do that once Gran's back home. I'll think about that. Which wasn't addressing the purpose, Eli admitted, and did a second walkthrough. He imagined housemaids climbing out of iron beds at dawn, bare toes curling against the cold floor, a butler putting on his starched white shirt, the head housekeeper checking off her list of duties for the day. A whole world had existed here, one the family had probably known little about. But what hadn't existed, as far as he could see, was anything worth breaking and entering or breaking the bones of an old woman. He circled back into the wide hall, studied the old armoire against the, to him, unfortunate floral wallpaper. On close examination, he saw no signs it had been moved in the past decade or more. Curious, he attempted to do so now, putting his back into it, and didn't budge it more than an inch. He tried reaching into the narrow space behind it, then maneuvering his arm from underneath. Not only would no mischievous little boy be able to shove it clear, but neither could a grown man. Not alone, Eli thought. On impulse, he pulled out his phone and scrolled through the contacts Abra had keyed in. He hit Mike O'Malley's number. Hi, Mike, it's Eli Landon. Yeah, good, thanks. He leaned back on the armoire, thought of it as solid and intimidating as a redwood. Look, have you got a few minutes any time today? Really? If you've got the day off, I don't want to interrupt any plans. In that case, I could use a hand with something. 
A little muscle? He laughed at Mike's question about which muscle. All of them. Appreciate it. He hung up, looked at Barbie. It's probably stupid, huh? But who can resist a secret panel? He trooped downstairs, detoured into his office for a minute to imagine moving his workspace to the third floor. Not a completely crazy idea, he decided. More eccentric. The wallpaper would have to go, and there would probably be some issues with heat and AC, plumbing. Eventually, he'd have to figure out what, if anything, to do with the rest of the space up there. But it was good to think about it. Barbie's head lifted. She let out a trio of barks seconds before the doorbell rang. Some ears you've got there, Eli told her, and headed downstairs in her wake. Hey, you were quick. You got me out of doing yard work, temporarily. Hey there. Mike gave Barbie a rub as she sniffed his pants. I heard you got a dog. What's his name? Her. Eli struggled with a wince. Barbie. Dude. Pain and sympathy covered Mike's face. Seriously? She came with it. You can use that unless you get her a buddy and call him Ken. I haven't been in here for a while, Mike added as he wandered the foyer. Hell of a place. Maureen said your family came up for Easter. How's Mrs. Landon doing? Better, a lot better. I'm hoping she'll be back in Bluff House by the end of summer. It'll be great having her back. Not that we want to kick you out of Whiskey Beach. I'm staying. No shit. Mike's grin stretched as he gave Eli a punch on the shoulder. Man, glad to hear it. We could use some fresh meat in our monthly poker games. And we'd class it up holding it here when you're up. What's the buy-in? Fifty. We're small time. Let me know next time you're setting up. The thing's upstairs, Eli said, gesturing and turning for the steps. Third floor. Cool. I've never been up there. It hasn't been used since I was a kid. We would play up there in bad weather, and once or twice we got to bunk up there, tell ghost stories. Just storage now, really. So, we're hauling something down? No, just moving a piece. Big-ass armoire. Double armoire, he added as they topped the stairs. In here. Nice space. Bad wallpaper. Tell me. Mike scanned the room, landed on the armoire. Big mother. He crossed to it, ran his fingers over the carved front. A beauty. Mahogany, right? I think. I've got a cousin who brokers antiques. He'd piss his pants at a chance on this. Where are we moving it? Just out a few feet. At Mike's blank look, Eli shrugged. So, there's a panel behind it. A panel. A passageway. Fucking A! As he punched a fist in the air, Mike's face lit up. Like a secret passage? Where does it go? All the way down to the basement, from what I'm told. Just told. I had no idea. They were servants' passages, Eli explained. They made my grandmother nervous, so she closed them up. But she just blocked off this one, and the one in the basement. This is very cool. Mike rubbed his hands together. Let's move this sucker. Easier said, they discovered. Since they couldn't lift it, and trying to shove it from either side proved impossible, they realigned, both on one end, then both on the other, walking it out a couple inches at a time. Next time we get a crane. Straightening, Mike rolled his aching shoulders. How the hell did they get it up here? Ten men, and one woman telling them it might look better on the other wall. And if you tell Maureen I said that, I'll swear you're a dirty liar. You just helped me move a ten-ton armoire. My loyalty is yours. See here? You can just see the edge of the panel. The ugly wallpaper mostly camouflages it. But when you know it's there... He felt around the chair rail, sliding his fingers over, under, until they hit the release. When he heard the faint click, he looked at Mike. You game? Are you kidding? Game is my middle name. Open her up. Eli pressed on the panel, 
felt it give slightly, then open an inch in his direction. Swings out, he murmured, and pulled it fully open. He saw a narrow landing, then the drop of steep steps into the dark. Automatically, he felt the inside wall for a switch and was surprised to find one. But when he flipped it, nothing happened. Either there's no electricity in there or no light. I'll get a couple of flashlights. And maybe a loaf of bread. For the crumbs, Mike explained. And a big stick in case of rats. Just the flashlights, then, he said to Eli's stony stare. Be right back. He grabbed a couple of beers while he was at it, the least he could do. Better than a loaf of bread. Mike took the beer and a flashlight, shone the light upward in the passage. No light bulb. I'll get some next time. Armed with the flashlight, Eli stepped into the passage. Pretty narrow, but wider than I figured. I guess they'd need the space for carrying trays and whatever. The steps feel sound, but watch it. Snakes, very dangerous. You go first. Snorting out a laugh, Eli started down. I doubt we'll find a detested butler's skeletal remains, or the dying words of a feckless housemaid carved into the wall. Maybe a ghost. It's spooky enough. And dusty, and dank. The steps creaked underfoot, but at least no rats gleamed out with red eyes. Eli paused when his light played over another panel. Let me think, and orient himself. This should come out on the second floor landing. See how it forks here? That one should come out in my grandmother's bedroom. That's always been the master as far as I know. God, we'd have killed to have these open when we were kids. I could have snuck around, jumped out, and scared the shit out of my sister. Which is exactly why your grandmother sealed up the doors. Yeah. Thinking of opening them again? Yeah. No reason to, but... Yeah. Cool is its own reason. They followed the passage, going down or taking a turn. From the blueprint in his head, Eli judged the panels had once opened in strategic places throughout the house, into parlors, the kitchen, a sitting room, a hallway, and down to the depths of the basement. Hell, should have moved the shelves barricading the other side first. But he found the lever drew the door to him so he and Mike peered through old pots and rusted tools and into the basement. You've got to unseal this man. Think of the Halloween parties. But he was thinking of something else. I could set him up, he murmured. Huh? The asshole breaking in here, digging down here. I've got to think about this. Stake yourself out in here. Lure him in. Classic ambush, Mike agreed. Then what? I'm thinking about it. He closed the door, vowing to move the shelves, formulate a plan. Let me know. I wouldn't mind being in on catching that guy. Maureen's still pretty freaked, Mike said as they started back up. I don't know if she'll really relax until they catch the guy, especially when most of us figure he's the same one who plugged the P.I. Stands to reason. Yeah, it does. And when she found out he planted that gun in Abra's place, she's super freaked. You can't blame her for... What? What gun? What are you talking about? The gun Abra found in her... Oh. After a pained wince, Mike stuffed his hands in his pockets. Well, shit, she didn't tell you. No, she damn well didn't tell me, but you're going to. Get me another beer and my guts are spilled. Part 3 Promise One sweetly solemn thought comes to me o'er and o'er. I am nearer home today than I ever have been before. Phoebe Carey Chapter 21 At the end of a long day... Two classes, a massive cleaning job, and a pair of massages. Abra pulled up to her cottage and just sat. She didn't want to go in. She hated knowing she didn't want to go inside her own home, 
tend to her own things, use her own shower. She loved Laughing Gull, and had from the first instant she'd seen it. She wanted that feeling back, the pride, the comfort, the rightness of it. And all she felt was dread. He'd spoiled it, whoever the hell he was, coming into her home, leaving his violence and death behind. A monster in the closet in the form of a gun. It left her two choices, she told herself. Let the monster win, give up, sit and brood, or fight back and fix it. Put that way, she decided, there wasn't a choice at all. She shoved out of the car, muscled out her table, her bag, carted them both to the door. Inside, she leaned her table against the wall before carrying her bag into the living room. Driving nearly twenty miles up the coast to buy the smudge stick had added onto her already crowded day. But when she took it out of her bag, it felt like a positive action. She'd burn the sage, cleanse her house. If she felt her house was cleansed, it was cleansed. And once she'd reclaimed her place, she'd get serious about adding a little greenhouse so she could grow her own herbs in bigger quantities. She'd make her own damn smudge sticks and have fresh herbs year-round for cooking. Maybe she'd sell them, too. Another enterprise, create her own potpourri and sachets. Something to think about. But for now, she did her best to clear her mind, to think only clean, positive thoughts as she lit the sage, held it over an abalone shell for safety, and blew out the flame to encourage the smoke. Her home, she thought. The floors, the ceilings, the corners belonged to her. The process, walking from room to room with the scent of white sage and lavender, calmed her, as did reminding herself what she'd made there for herself, for others. Faith, she thought, hope, and the symbols of them forged strength. Once she'd finished the house, she stepped out onto her little patio, gently waving the smudge stick to send all that hope and faith into the air and saw Eli and the dog walking up the beach steps. It made her feel a little foolish, standing there with her smoking sage as evening settled over the beach, as the man and the happy-faced dog climbed toward her. To compensate, she stuck the smudge stick in the river rocks around her little zen fountain, where it would burn away naturally and safely. What a handsome couple. Smile in place, she walked over to greet them. And a nice surprise. I just got home a few minutes ago. What are you doing? Oh, she glanced as he did at the smudge stick. Just a little homey ritual, kind of a spring cleaning. Burning sage? That's a ward off evil spirits kind of thing. I think of it more as a clearing out negativity. Did your family get off all right this morning? Yeah. Sorry I couldn't stay to see them off. Busy day for me. Something wrong, she thought, or something not quite right. All she wanted at that moment was quiet, peace, and a rarity for her, solitude. I still have a lot to catch up on, she continued. Why don't I stop by in the morning before my class, get your shopping list? I can pick up what you need before I come back to do the house. What I need is for you to tell me why I had to hear from Mike that someone put a gun in your house, that the police were here searching. That's what I need. I didn't want to bring it up with your family here. I called the police, she added. But not me. You didn't call me. Or tell me. Eli, there wasn't anything you could do. And with a house full of people, that's bullshit. Her hackles tingled. The comfort she'd found from the ritual struck against his anger, her own, flint against steel. It's not, and there was no point in me walking into Bluff House on Saturday, announcing I'd just found a murder weapon in my incense box and had cops tromping all over my house. There was every point in telling me, or there damn sure should have been. Well, I don't agree, and it was my problem, my decision. Your problem. Insult punched through temper. That's how it is? You can come into my place with... Pots of soup, massage tables, Jesus, dogs. You can walk in in the middle of the night, 
to close a fucking window and fight off an assault. But when somebody plants a gun on you, tries to implicate you in a murder, it's your problem? A murder most likely connected to me. But that's none of my business. I didn't say that. Even to her own ears, the defense sounded weak. I didn't mean that. What do you mean? I didn't want to dump all this on you and your family. You're in this because you're involved with me, and you pushed and wheedled your way in. Pushed and wheedled? Her own insult bloomed so bright and hot, she whirled away to try to capture some of the smoke and the calm. Vane immediately decided she'd have needed a smudge stick the size of Whiskey Beach Light to manage it. Wheedled? Damn right you did, from the minute I came back here. Now you're in and you don't want to dump? You don't give anybody else a chance to dump. You're there with the shovel before the first clod hits the ground. But when it falls on you, you don't trust me enough to help. God, God, it isn't about trust. It's about timing. If that were true, you'd have found the time to tell me. You found it to tell Maureen. She was, instead of finding the time, you're up here lighting sage on fire and waving around a smoking stick. Don't make fun of my process. I don't care if you burn a field of sage or sacrifice a chicken. I care you didn't tell me you were in trouble. I'm not in trouble. The police know it wasn't my gun. I called Vinny the minute I found it. But not me. No. She sighed wondering how trying to do the right thing could go so horribly wrong. I didn't. My family left this morning, but you didn't tell me. You weren't going to tell me now. I needed to wave my smoking stick around and get comfortable in my house again. It's getting cold. I want to go in. Fine. Go in and pack a bag. Eli, I just want to be alone and quiet. You can be alone and quiet at Bluff House. It's a big place. You're not staying here by yourself until this whole goddamn mess is over. This is my house. Her eyes stung, and she wished she could blame it on the thinning, sluggish smoke. I'm not letting some bastard drive me out of my house. Then we'll bunk here. I don't want you to bunk here. If you don't want us in, we'll stay out here. But we stay. Oh, for God's sake. She turned on her heel, strode back inside. She said nothing when he, with a slightly hesitant Barbie, followed her in. Instead, she went straight into the kitchen, poured herself a glass from an uncorked bottle of Shiraz. I know how to take care of myself. No question. You know how to take care of yourself and everybody else. You don't know how, apparently, to let someone take care of you. That's conceit. She slapped the glass on the counter. It's independence and capability. To a point, it is. Then it tips over into conceit and stubbornness. You've tipped. This wasn't like you had a leaky pipe so you grabbed a wrench or called a plumber instead of the guy you're sleeping with. And the guy you're sleeping with is involved with this whole clusterfuck. And he's a lawyer. I called a lawyer, she said, then immediately wished she hadn't. Great. Good. Eli shoved his hands in his pockets, paced a couple of circles. So you talk to the cops, a lawyer, your neighbors, anybody else other than me, of course. She shook her head. I didn't want to spoil your family's visit. It seemed pointless for you or any of you to worry. You were worried. I needed to... Yes, all right, yes, I've been worried. I need you to tell me everything that happened, in detail. I need you to tell me what you said to the police, what they said to you, everything you can remember. Because you're a lawyer. The long, quiet look he sent her accomplished what words didn't. It made her feel foolish. It made her feel wrong. Because we're involved. His tone, quiet as the look, finished the job. Because this started with me or with Bluff House or both. And because I'm a lawyer. All right. I'll pack first. When he lifted his eyebrows, she shrugged. It's too cold for you to sleep outside. 
and I know he's got no reason to come back here again. He has reasons to break into Bluff House again. Or it feels like it. So I'll pack some things and go with you. Compromise, he wondered. Isn't this what his grandmother had spoken of? That give and take on both sides to find a balance? Good. When she walked away, he picked up her unfinished wine. We won that battle, he told Barbie. But I don't think we've won the war. Yet. He let her have quiet on the drive down and stayed downstairs when she went up to unpack. If she put her things in another bedroom, he'd deal with it later. For now, it was enough to know she was with him and safe. In the kitchen, he poked in the fridge, the freezer. Leftover ham, he calculated, and plenty of sides. Even he should be able to put a decent enough meal together. By the time she came down, he had the Monday night hodgepodge meal set up in the breakfast area. You can fill me in while we eat. All right. She sat oddly comforted when Barbie elected to curl up by her feet instead of Eli's. I'm sorry I made you feel I didn't trust you. That wasn't it. It's part of it, but we'll get into that later. Tell me exactly what happened, step by step. His response only dampened her already soggy mood. I wanted to meditate, she began and told him everything in as precise a manner as she could. You never touched the gun? No, it fell when I dropped the box and I left it there. As far as you know, they didn't find any prints that shouldn't have been there. No, just the fibers. And the police haven't contacted you since? Vinny called me today just to check in. He said they should have the ballistic results tomorrow or Wednesday, but more likely Wednesday. What about the gun itself? Was it registered? He didn't tell me. I think he has to be careful what he says to me. But they know it wasn't mine. I've never owned a gun. I've never even held a gun. And if it was the gun used to kill Kirby Duncan, they know I was here with you. Handily covering each other, Eli thought. Just what would Wolf make of that? What did your lawyer say? To call him if they wanted to question me again, and that he'd contact Detective Corbett directly. I'm not worried about being a murder suspect. Nobody thinks I killed Duncan. I could have planted the gun in your place. That would be stupid, which you're not. I could be using you for sex and patsy potential. For the first time in what felt like hours, she smiled. No more sex if you make me your patsy. And that's just not logical as it only turns the light back on, makes them look at you again which is exactly what whoever did plant it wanted, and why they suddenly made that anonymous call to Wolf. The fact is, really, all this reeks of setup, and Corbett's not an idiot. No, I don't think he is. But there's another angle. It's possible you've had contact with the killer three times now, here, in the bar, and now with him planting the gun at your cottage. That's something to worry about, and you know it. You're not an idiot either. I can't do anything about that, but be careful. You could leave, go visit your mother for a while. You won't, he added before she could speak. And I don't blame you, but it's an option. Another option is to trust me. Hearing him say it, knowing she'd given him calls to say it, made her absolutely miserable. Eli, I do trust you. Not where it gets sticky, you don't. I don't know if I blame you for that either. Men have let you down. Your father. It's one thing for it not to work out between him and your mother, but he's still your father. And he chose not to be one, not to be a real part of your life. He let you down. I don't dwell on it. That's healthy of you, but it's there. When he let that hang in the air, she admitted defeat. Yes, it's there. I don't really matter to him and never have. I don't dwell on it, but it's there. You don't dwell because it's unproductive, and you like to produce. Interesting way to put it. Her lips curved again. And true. And you don't dwell because you know it's his loss. Then there's the bastard who hurt you. That's letting you down big time. You cared about him, trusted him, 
let him in. Then he turned on you. He violated you. As bad as that was, if it hadn't happened, I might not be here. Positive attitude. Kudos. But it happened. You gave someone your trust and they broke it. Why wouldn't it happen again? I don't think that way. I don't live that way. You lead an open, energetic, satisfying life that I often find amazing. The kind that takes spine and heart. It's admirable. You don't lean easily, and that's admirable too. Until it gets to the point where you could lean, where you should, and you won't. I would have told you if your family hadn't been here. Then she accepted and told the whole truth. I probably would have put it off for a while. I might have told myself you keep getting hammered and there was no point adding to that until I knew more, or it had been resolved in some way. I might have. But that's not about trust. Pity? Concern. And my own confidence. I don't like the word conceit. I needed to take care of myself, make decisions, handle problems, and, yes, maybe take on other people's problems to build up the confidence Derek shattered. I need to know I can take care of things when there's no one to depend on but myself. And when there is someone else to depend on? Maybe he was right again, and that was where it got sticky. And maybe it was time for a little self-evaluation. I don't know, Eli. I just don't know the answer because I haven't given myself that choice in a long time. And still, I leaned on you that night after I was attacked. I leaned and you didn't let me down. I can't get involved again with someone who won't give as much as she takes, take as much as she gives. I found out the hard way. If you do, you end up empty-handed and bitter. I guess we both have to decide how much we can give, how much we can take. I hurt you because I didn't reach out. Yeah, you did. And you pissed me off. And you made me think. He rose, picking up dishes. Neither of them had done justice to the meal. I let Lindsay down. No, Eli. Yeah, I did. Our marriage might have been a mistake, but we were in it together. Neither of us got what we wanted or expected out of it. At the end, I couldn't stop what happened to her. I still don't know if she's dead because of some choice I made, choices we made together, or just some random piece of bad luck. I let my grandmother down, going longer and longer between times coming here, or seeing her at all. She didn't deserve that. We almost lost her, too. Would it have happened if I'd spent more time here? If I came here to stay with her after Lindsay's murder? You're the center of the universe now. You want to talk conceit? No, but I know, I know I'm somewhere in the center of this, and all of it's connected. He turned to her, didn't go to her, didn't touch her, but stood with that space between them. I'm telling you, Abra, I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to do everything, whether you like it or not, whether you sleep with me or not, to make sure nothing happens to you. And when this is done, I guess we'll see where we are and where we go from there. Because she felt a little boxed in, she rose. I'll do the dishes. I've got it. Balance, or as you said, give and take, she reminded him. You fix the meal, I clean up. Okay. I want a copy of your schedule. She felt, literally, prickles of warning at the back of her neck. Eli, it changes. That's the beauty of it. I want to know where you are when you're not here. I'm not a goddamn stalker. It's not about keeping tabs or trying to sew you in. She put the plate she was holding on the counter, took a breath. I want to say I didn't think that, or mean that. And I also realized something I didn't until today, until all this. I realize I brought more baggage with me from D.C. than I thought. I think, hope, it's down to a small hand tote. I hope I'll figure how to toss that out. It takes time. I thought I'd finished the time, but apparently not quite. So, she lifted the plate again, slid it into the dishwasher rack. I'm here most of the day. I have my morning class, church basement, 
And I have a massage at 4.30. Greta Parish. Okay, thanks. She finished loading the dishwasher, began to wipe off the counters. You haven't touched me, not once since you came up the steps to my cottage. Why is that? Because you're mad? Maybe some. But mostly because I don't know how you feel about it. Her eyes met his, held. How do I know how I feel about you touching me if you don't? He brushed a hand down her arm first, then turned her toward him, drew her in. She dropped the rag on the counter, locked her arms around him. I'm sorry. I was holding things back, holding things in. But, oh God, Eli, he was in my house. He went through my things. He touched my things. Derek went through my things. He touched my things, broke things while he waited for me to come home. He won't hurt you. Eli pressed his lips to her temple. I won't let him hurt you. I have to get past it. I have to. You will. But not alone. Not without him. When she left the next morning, he told himself not to worry. Not only was the church less than two miles away, but he couldn't think of a single reason for anyone to harm her. She'd be back by mid-morning, and once he knew she was safely in the house, he could work. With his mind too busy to slide into the story, he went down to the basement, spent nearly an hour unloading the shelves, walking them back. It took more time to open the panel from the basement side, and once he had, he decided to oil the hinges. The creak added interesting atmosphere. But should he want to surprise anyone, silence served. Armed with a flashlight and a box of light bulbs, he worked his way through the passage, testing each light, moving on, until he'd reached the third floor. Once he'd oiled those hinges, he considered, then angled a chair in front of the panel, checked to make sure he could open and close it again, then backtracked. He repositioned the shelves, again tested so he could easily move around them, in or out of the panel. Then he reloaded them. Camouflage, he thought, should he want or need it. Trap set, or nearly. All he needed was the hook and the bait. Since working in the passages transferred dust, grime, he changed, washed up, then spent some time checking out video cameras and nanny cams on the internet. He was pouring himself his first Mountain Dew of the day when Abra came in with her market bags. Hi. She dumped the bags, reached into one. Look what I got you. She turned to Barbie with a big rawhide bone. This is for a good dog. Have you been a good dog? Barbie slapped her butt to the ground. I thought so. Have you been a good boy? She asked Eli as she unsealed the bone. Do I have to sit on the floor? I got makings for my lasagna, which is legendary, and for tiramisu. You can make tiramisu? We're going to find out. I've decided to have a good feeling about today, and part, a good part, of the reason is balance, or knowing we're working on finding a balance. Another? Now she wrapped her arms around Eli for a squeeze. I found out you don't hold grudges. I can hold grudges with the best of them, he countered, but not against somebody I care about. Grudges are negative energy turned inward, so I like knowing you can let go. And speaking of negative energy, I stopped by my cottage and it felt better. Not all the way back, but it felt better. Due to a smelly smoking stick? She drilled a finger in his belly. It worked for me. I'm glad and sincerely hope you're not thinking we need a couple of cases of smelly smoking sticks to offset the negative energy in Bluff House. It couldn't hurt, but we can talk about that later. Much, much later, he also sincerely hoped. Are you going to work now? I'll just strip the bed and grab the laundry. Then I'll stay out of your way until you break. Fine, but I want to show you something first. Sure, what? Up. He jerked a thumb at the ceiling before taking her hand. You missed a spot. I did not. Automatically insulted, she picked up her pace as they went upstairs. 
a really big spot, he added. Up? Third level? I only do that once a month, just vacuum and dust. If you wanted it back in use, you should have... Not that, not exactly. I'm thinking about moving my office up there, though, into the South Gable. Eli, that's a fabulous idea. Yeah, I'm playing with it. Great light, great view from there. Really quiet. Too bad I don't paint or sculpt, because the old servants' hall would be a hell of a studio. I've thought the same. One of the beach-facing bedrooms would be a wonderful little library, like for your reference books, a kind of library sitting room when you wanted to take a break but not actually stop work. He hadn't thought that far, but maybe. I could help you set it up if you decide to do it. Oh, these wonderful ceilings. So much potential, and I've always thought it was a shame not to use the whole house. Hester told me she used it years ago to paint, but found she worked better in her own sitting room, and best of all outside. It'd be hard on her to do two flights of stairs in any case. The whole house is exactly what I'm thinking of using again. He walked over, opened the panel. Oh, my God, this is fabulous. Just look at this. She dashed over to do just that. This is so utterly cool. The lights work, he demonstrated. Now, and it goes all the way to the basement. I moved the shelves out so the panel works down there. I would have played Princess Warrior in these as a kid. Really? And he found he could picture it perfectly. See, you missed a big spot. I'll get on that if you make sure any spiders bigger than a house flyer dispatched first. You should open up all the panels. I'm thinking about it. To think of all the times I've cleaned in here and never realized this existed, it's... He doesn't know about this. Eyes alight, she looked at Eli. He doesn't know. I don't think so. He sure as hell hasn't used it. It took Mike and I and a lot of sweat to move that armoire. And it took me over an hour working alone to move the shelves out far enough to get through. Laying an ambush, Eli. I'm thinking about that, too. Proactive instead of defensive. Hands fisted on her hips, she strode around the room. I knew this was going to be a good day. We can do something. We could catch him in the act. I'm thinking about it. It's not as simple as jumping out and saying boo. If the simplest explanation is also true, he's not just an intruder, he's a murderer. We don't just jump into this. We plan, she agreed. I think creatively when I clean, so I'll get started and we'll both think. And we wait to hear from the cops. Oh, yeah. She deflated a little. I guess we do. Maybe they'll trace the gun and this will all be done. It would be better that way. Not as exciting, but realistically better is better. Whatever happens, I won't let you down. Eli. She took his face in her hands. Let's make a new pact and promise not to let each other down. That's a deal. Chapter 22 He had to work. He let plots and plans for proactive ambushes cook in the back of his brain, but he had to get the story out, get those words on paper. He hadn't heard from his agent about what he'd sent her, but the holiday weekend bogged things down. And, he reminded himself, it wasn't as if he was her only client. He wasn't even an important client. Better to keep riding the wave of the story, and he'd have more to send in. If she had problems with what he'd already done, he'd deal with it. He could go back, polish up another five chapters, send it off to give his agent a bigger part of the whole. But the story was running hot for him, and he didn't want to risk dowsing it. He didn't break until well into the afternoon when Barbie pulled him out of the zone by sitting at his knee, staring at him. Her signal, he'd already learned, for, Sorry to bother you, but I've got to go. Okay, okay, one second. He backed up, saved, and realized he felt a little buzzed, as if he'd downed a couple of excellent glasses of wine in rapid succession. The minute he stood, Barbie scrambled out of the room. He heard her running down the steps at warp speed. 
She'd sit, quivering in the kitchen, he knew, waiting for him in the leash. He called out absently to Abra as he moved toward the kitchen and found the dog exactly where he'd expected. He also found an artful club sandwich under clear wrap, topped by a post-it on the counter. Have some lunch after you walk Barbie. XXOO, Abra. She never misses, he murmured. He took the dog out, enjoyed the break nearly as much as Barbie, even when it began spitting chilly rain. With his hair damp, his dog soaked, and his mind sliding back toward the book, he answered the phone in his pocket on his way up the beach steps. Mr. Landon, this is Sherilyn Burke, Burke Massey Investigations. Yeah. His guts tightened a little, anticipation and dread. It's good to hear from you. I have a report for you. I could email it, but I'd like to go over it with you in person. I can come out to you tomorrow if that's convenient. Is there something I should worry about? Worry? No. I like the face-to-face, -face, Mr. Landon, where we can both ask and answer. I can be there about eleven. Brisk, he thought. Professional. And firm. Okay. Why don't you send me the report in the meantime, and I'll be up to date when we ask and answer. Good enough. Do you know how to get to Whiskey Beach? Had a nice weekend there several years ago. And if you've been to Whiskey Beach, you know Bluff House. I'll find you. Eleven o'clock. I'll be here. Nothing to worry about, he thought, as he took Barbie inside. But of course, everything about Lindsay's murder, the police investigation, his own position worried him. But he wanted those answers, needed them. He took his iPad and his lunch into the library. Abra would be running the vacuum or something upstairs, he assumed, and the rain made him want a fire. He lit one, then sat down with his tablet. He'd read the report while he ate. Ignoring other email for now, he downloaded the attachment from his investigator. She'd personally re-interviewed friends, neighbors, co-workers, both his and Lindsay's, and re-interviewed Justin and Eden Suskind, as well as some of their neighbors, co-workers. She talked to Wolf and had cornered one of the assistant prosecutors. She'd walked the crime scene, though it had long since been cleared and cleaned, and was even now staged for sale. She'd done her own reenactment of Lindsay's murder. Thorough, he thought. He read her summaries, which included impressions. The Suskinds had recently separated. Not surprising, he mused, considering the strain a cheating spouse put on a marriage. Add murder and a barrage of media that had made their marriage fodder for the masses. More surprising, he supposed, they'd stuck for nearly a year. Two kids, though, he recalled. Too bad. She'd spoken with desk clerks, bellmen, housekeeping at hotels and resorts that coincided with Lindsay's travel, and confirmed what he'd already known. Much of that travel had been in the company of Justin Suskind during the last ten or eleven months of her life. How did he feel about that? He asked himself. Not much. Not anymore. The anger was done. Finished. Even the sense of betrayal had dulled, like stone washed by water. Those sharp edges had smoothed away. He felt sorry. Given the time, the process, he imagined the anger, the bitterness both he and Lindsay had felt would have burned itself out. They'd have gone their separate ways. They'd have moved on. But neither of them had the chance. Whoever killed her had seen to that. He owed it to them both to read the reports, meet the investigator, to do everything he could to find out why, who, then put it away. He read the report twice, thought it over as he sampled the smoothie he'd found in the fridge with its drink me post-it. He decided to shift gears, got his notebook from the desk, and yet another book on Esmeralda's dowry from the shelves. He spent the next hour winding along the author's speculative path. This one leaned heavily on the theory that the surviving seaman and the privileged daughter of the house, Violetta, had fallen in love. Her brother Edwin, upon discovering them, had killed the lover. Violetta, reckless, wild, ran off to Boston never to return. And Esmeralda's dowry remained lost to the ages.
What Eli knew of family history confirmed Violetta had run off, been disowned, and all but erased from any documents through the wealth, influence, and fury of her family for the disgrace. The matter-of-fact tone used to depict the events might not have been as entertaining as others he'd read in the last weeks, but seemed more based in sense. Maybe it was time to hire a skilled genealogist to do whatever could be done to track down the reckless Violetta Landon. Considering it, Eli pulled out his phone again when it signaled. He saw his agent's name on the display, took one long, deep inhale. Here we go, he thought, and answered. He sat there with his notebook, his tablet, and his phone when Abra walked in. I'm done upstairs, she began. You're clear if you want to go back to work. I've got one more load of laundry in the dryer. I thought I'd get back into the passageway. It's taking some time as I have to hold buckets in and out to get the steps really clean. And I thought if I did it naked, it would be more fun. What? Ah, as I thought, the naked got through the wall. Are you working here, researching? She asked, tipping her head to read the title of the book he'd set down. Whiskey Beach, A Legacy of Mystery and Madness. Really? It's mostly crap, but it has a few pertinent details. It's got a section on the area, and the Landons during Prohibition, that's pretty interesting. My great-great-grandmother helped run the product to local establishments, hiding the bottles under her skirt to elude authorities who wouldn't ask her to lift them. Clever. I've heard that one before, so it may be true. The theory on the dowry is the rescued seaman managed to hide it. Then he stole the fair and headstrong Violetta's heart and several pieces of her jewelry. That concluded in a wild chase on a stormy night where he went off the lighthouse cliff, courtesy of Edwin Landon, her dark-hearted brother. The dowry likely went with him, back into the unforgiving sea. Where it's secured in Davy Jones's locker? According to this guy, the brigand and the treasure chest were dashed on the rocks, scattering the jewels like sparkling starfish. Or maybe it was jellyfish. Anyway. If that were true, I'd still think bits and pieces at least would have been recovered. You'd hear about that over the years. Not if people who snagged a shiny necklace or whatever kept their mouths shut, which he speculates, and seems very likely. Anyway, he said again. Abra gave him a curious smile. Anyway? She liked it. Who, the headstrong Violetta? Who? No, my agent, my book, the chapters I sent her. She liked it. Or she's lying to spare my feelings. Would she lie? No, she liked it. Abra sat on the coffee table to face him. Did you think she wouldn't? I wasn't sure. Now you are. She thinks she can sell it on the five chapters. Eli, that's great. But she thinks she can make a bigger splash with the whole book. How close are you? Nearly finished the first draft. Another couple of weeks there, maybe. Less, he thought, if it kept rolling as it had been. Then I need to tighten it up. I don't know exactly. It's an important and very personal decision. But, oh, Eli, you should go for the splash. He had to grin at the way she bounced on the table. Yeah, that's what she thinks. What about you? The splash. I'd feel easier about having it done before she sends it out. She could be wrong and I'll rack up the new world record for rejections, but I'd have finished it. She bumped her knee to his. She could be right and you'd have sold your first novel. Don't make me get a smudge stick to banish negative thoughts and energy. Can we just have sex instead? He grinned at her. I'm always pretty positive about sex. I'll consider it. When are you going to let me read it? When he shrugged, she rolled her eyes. Okay, let's go back to the previous request of some time ago. One scene. Just one scene? Yeah, maybe. One scene. Yay. You know we should celebrate. Didn't I just suggest sex? Laughing, she slapped his leg. There are other ways to celebrate. In that case, we can celebrate when I've finished it. Fair enough. I'm heading back to the dungeons. I can give you a hand.
You could, or you could go back to work. She lifted her joined palms, arrowed them down like a diver toward the water. Poised for the splash. He smiled at her. I should probably try for another couple hours. I'm going to lose time tomorrow. The investigator I hired is coming up to meet with me. News? She asked, sitting again. I don't know. I read a report. Not much new, but she covered a lot of ground. The sus kind separated. It's difficult to overcome infidelity, especially when it's so public. They have kids, don't they? Yeah, two. Even more difficult. She hesitated, shook her head. And so I don't repeat a mistake. I need to tell you Vinny got in touch a couple hours ago. The bullets they recovered from Duncan's body were fired by the gun I found in my cottage. He put a hand over hers. I would have been surprised if they didn't match. I know. The fact that I called Vinny when I found it weighs on my side. And the anonymous tip to Wolf from a disposable cell phone. That seems sticky. But he wanted me to know that Wolf's digging into my background, my movements, trying to put you and me together before Lindsay's murder. We weren't, so he can't. No, he can't. Relay all this to your lawyer. I did. He's on it. There's nothing, Eli. And I think Wolf only cares about me as a conduit to you. If he somehow links us to Duncan's death, it's more feasible you were involved in Lindsay's. It goes both ways, he reminded her. Since we're clear on Duncan, it adds weight to me being clear on Lindsay's. Then you agree with him on the basics. The two murders are connected somehow. I can't believe I'm this close to two murders, a near-fatal accident, a series of break-ins and an assault without there being connections. I'm with you on that, but then everything's connected under it all. She rose again. I'm going back to it so maybe we can figure out a way to be the hero and heroine of our own novel and help catch a bad guy. We should go out to dinner tonight. Her eyebrows quirked. We should? Yeah, Barbie can guard the house. We should go out, have a nice dinner somewhere. You can wear something sexy. Are we having a date, Eli? I've let that slide. Pick a place, he told her. We'll go on a date. All right, I will. She came back to lean down, kiss him. You'll have to wear one of your many ties. I can do that. Good news, uneasy news, he thought when she left him. Questions to be asked and answered. But tonight he was going out with a fascinating woman who made him think, who made him feel. I'm going back to work for a bit, he told Barbie. Then you can help me pick out a tie. He couldn't watch the house every hour of every day. But he continued to spot check. He knew he could get back inside again, even if Landon had changed the code again. He'd prefer to continue his search with the house empty. But the way Landon stuck to the place, he might have to risk going in when Landon was sleeping. He'd begun to believe he'd gone in the wrong direction with the basement, at least that section of the mammoth space. But he had to finish to be sure. He'd spent so much time, so much sweat, so much money that he had to see it through. He needed to get up to the third floor again. Somewhere in one of the trunks, under some cushion, behind some picture, he'd find a clue. A diary, a map, coordinates. He'd been through the library and bluff house while the old lady slept, but he'd found nothing of importance. He'd found nothing to match his own knowledge, his own meticulous and detailed research into Esmeralda's dowry. He knew the truth. Beyond the legend, beyond the adventure stories written about that storm-tossed night on Whiskey Beach, he knew. The wind, the rocks, the raging sea, and only one man survived. One man, he thought, and a treasure beyond price. Pirate booty taken by might, by courage, by blood, and his by right, his by blood. The blood he shared with Nathaniel Broom. He was descended from Broom, who'd claimed the treasure, 
and from Violetta Landon, who'd given the pirate her heart, her body, and a son. He had proof written in Violetta's hand. He often thought her message from the grave had been written directly to him, to give him the bits and pieces from letters, from a single diary, all discovered after the death of his great uncle. A stupid, careless man. He was the heir now to that treasure. Who had more right to the spoils than he? Not Eli Landon. He would have what was his. He'd kill if need be. He had killed. And now that he had, he knew he could do so again. He knew, as the days passed and his way to Bluff House was barred, he knew he'd kill Eli Landon before it was over, before it truly could be over. After he'd reclaimed what was his, he'd kill Landon as Landon had killed Lindsay. That was justice, he told himself. Rough justice, and the kind the Landons deserved. The kind Nathaniel Broom would have approved of. His heart jumped when he saw them come out of the house, Landon in a suit, the woman in a short red dress, holding hands, laughing into each other's faces. Not a care in the world. Had he been fucking her while he'd been with Lindsay? Self-righteous prick, he deserved to die. He wished he could do it, do both of them right now. But he had to be patient. He needed to regain his legacy. Then he'd mete out justice. He watched them get in the car, could see the woman lean over for a kiss before Landon drove out, away. Two hours, he estimated. If he could have afforded to have them followed as before, he'd know more precisely. But he could risk two hours inside. He'd paid a great deal for the alarm breaker, and money would become a serious issue soon. An investment, he reminded himself as he parked his car, lifted his bag out of the trunk. He knew the police patrolled. He'd watched them cruise by Bluff House, believed he had the basic timing. He thought he would have made a good pirate himself, and considered his aptitude further proof of his blood, his rights. He knew how to evade, how to plan, how to take what he wanted. The gloomy rain made a good cover. He hurried through it, aiming for the side door, the easiest entry point, the most sheltered. He'd take time to make a wax impression of the woman's key. She wouldn't have taken that heavy ring she carried, not dressed for the evening. He'd find it, copy it, and next time he'd simply use a key to get in. But now he took his jimmy out of his bag and hooked the alarm reader around his neck by the strap for easy access. Even as he stepped to the door, the wild warning barks erupted from inside. He stumbled back, heart racing into his throat. He'd seen Landon with a dog on the beach, but it had seemed friendly playful, harmless, the sort of dog you trusted with your kids. He'd put a couple of dog biscuits in his bag as a bribe. The violence of the barking didn't speak of the easily bribed. It spoke of vicious teeth, snapping jaws. Cursing, near to tears, he backed away. Next time, the next time he'd bring meat, poisoned, Nothing would keep him out of Bluff House and away from what was rightfully his. He needed to calm down, and he needed to think. It infuriated him most of all that he needed to go back to work, at least for a few days. But that would give him time to think and to plan. Maybe come up with a new idea to implicate Landon or the woman. To get one or both of them out of the house, into police custody for a time. Enough time. Or maybe one of the Boston Landons would have an accident. That would draw the bastard out of the house, clear the road. Something to think about. Now he needed to get back to Boston himself and regroup, put in appearances, make sure he was seen where he was supposed to be seen, make sure he talked to those he was supposed to talk to. Everyone would see an ordinary man going about his work, his day, his life. No one would see how extraordinary he was. He'd rushed it, he thought now as he checked his speed, made sure he stayed within the posted limit. Knowing he was close had driven him too fast. He'd throttle back a bit, give everything and everyone time to settle. When he came back to Whiskey Beach, he'd be ready to move, ready to win. He'd claim his legacy, 
he'd dispense justice. Then he'd live as he deserved to, like a pirate king. He drove carefully by the beachfront restaurant where Eli and Abra held hands across the table. I like dating, Abra commented. I'd almost forgotten. Me too. I like first dates. She picked up her wine, smiled over the glass. Especially first dates where I don't have to decide if I'm going to let myself be talked into bed. I really like the last part of that. Your home. Your home in Whiskey Beach. It shows, and I know how it feels. Tell me your plans for Bluff House. You have them, she added, taking a finger off the stem of the glass to point at him. You're a plan maker. I used to be. For a while. For too long. Just getting through the day was too much of a plan. But you're right. I've been thinking about plans for the house. She edged forward, candlelight in her eyes, the roll of the sea through the wide glass beside them. Tell me all. Practicalities first. Gran needs to come back. She'll stay in Boston and work on her therapy until she's ready. Then she'll come home. I was thinking of an elevator. I know an architect who'd come out, take a look. There's going to be a time when she can't handle the stairs, so maybe an elevator's an option. If not, eventually we could see about turning the smaller parlor into a bedroom suite for her. I like the elevator. She loves her bedroom and loves being able to go all over the house. It would help her have all that. I think it's years off, but it's good planning. What else? Update that old generator? Do something with the basement. I haven't figured that out yet. Not a priority. The third floor's more intriguing. New office space for the novelist. He grinned, shook his head. First on the list with the elevator. I want to have parties in Bluff House again. Parties? I used to like them. Friends, family, good food, music. I want to see if I still like them. The idea made her almost giddy. Let's plan one, a big one, for when you sell your book. That's an if. I'm an optimist, so it's when. He shifted when the waiter served their salads, waiting until they were alone again. Superstitious or not, he didn't want to plan a party around the book he'd yet to finish, much less sell. Compromise, he thought. Why don't we have a welcome home party when Gran comes back? That's perfect. She gave his hand a squeeze before she picked up her fork. She'd love it. I know a great swing band. Swing? It'll be fun, a little retro. Women in pretty dresses, men in summer suits, because I know she'll be back before the end of summer. Chinese lanterns on the terraces, champagne, martinis, flowers everywhere. Silver trays full of pretty food on white tables. You're hired. She laughed. I do some party planning here and there. Why am I not surprised? She tapped the air with her fork. I know people who know people. I bet. What about you and plans? Your yoga studio? It's on the slate. I could back you. She inched away just a little. I like backing myself. No investors allowed? Not yet, anyway. I'd like a good space, comfortable, serene, good light, a mirrored wall, maybe a pretty little fountain, a good sound system the way the one at the church is absolutely not, lighting I could dim, color-coordinated yoga mats, blankets, blocks, that sort of thing. Eventually, establish enough to take on a couple other instructors, but nothing too big, and a little treatment room for massages. But for now, I'm happy doing what I'm doing which is everything. Everything I like. Aren't we lucky? I'm feeling pretty lucky at the moment. I meant that we're both doing what we like. We're sitting here on our first date, which I like, and talking about plans for doing other things we like. It makes having to do things you don't like no big deal. What don't you like? She smiled at him. Right now, right here, I can't think of a thing. Later, curled up warm and loose against him, 
slipping dreamily toward sleep, she realized she liked everything about being with him. And when she thought of tomorrow, she thought of him. She understood as she drifted with the sea sighing outside, if she let herself slip just a little more, she would love. She could only hope she was ready. Chapter 23 From the name, Sherilyn Burke, and the voice over the phone, Brisk Yankee, Eli pictured a lanky blonde in a smart suit. He opened the door to a fortyish brunette in jeans, a black sweater, and a battered leather jacket. She carried a briefcase and wore black chucks. Mr. Landon. Ms. Burke. She pushed a pair of wayfarers on top of her short cap of hair, held out a hand to shake his. Nice dog, she added, and held out a hand to Barbie. Barbie politely shook. She's got a hell of a bark, but doesn't appear to have much bite. The bark does the job. I bet. Some house you've got here. It really is. Come on in. Can I get you some coffee? I never turn it down. Black's good. Why don't you go in, sit down, I'll get it. Maybe we could save time and I'll go to the kitchen with you. You answer the door, you're getting the coffee. That tells me it's the staff's day off. I don't have a staff, which you already know. Part of the job, and full disclosure, she added with a smile that showed off a crooked incisor. I wouldn't mind a look around. I've seen some magazine spreads, she added, but it's not like being in it. All right. She studied the foyer as they walked on, then the main parlor, the music room with its double pocket doors that could open to the parlor for parties. It goes on and on, doesn't it? But in a livable way instead of a museum. I've wondered. You've kept the character, and that says something. Inside matches the out. Bluffhouse is important to my grandmother. And to you? Yeah, and to me. It's a big house for one person. Your grandmother lived here alone for the last several years. That's right. She'll come back when her doctors clear it. I'll stay with her. Family first. I know how it is. I've got two kids, a mother who drives me crazy, and a father who drives her crazy since he retired. He put in his thirty. Your father was a cop. Yeah, he was one of the boys. But you knew that. Part of the job. She smirked, then turned into and around the kitchen. This isn't part of the original, but it still manages to reflect the character. Do you cook? Not really. Me either. This kitchen looks like one for serious cooking. My grandmother likes to bake. He moved to the coffee maker as she made herself at home on an island stool. And the woman who takes care of the house is a pretty serious cook, I'd say. That would be Abra Walsh. She's taking care of the house for you now. That's right. Is my personal life relevant, Miss Burke? Make it Sherilyn. And everything's relevant. It's how I work. So I appreciate getting a sense of the house. I'm also an admirer of Ms. Walsh's mother. And from what I've learned, I've got some for the daughter. She's making an interesting life for herself here, after some hard knocks. How about you? working on it. You were a decent lawyer, of your kind, she added that quick smile again. Trying to be a writer now. That's right. Your name would make a splash. Old money, scandal, mystery. Resentment curdled inside his belly like sour milk. I'm not looking to make a splash off my family's money, or my wife's murder. She shrugged. It is what it is, Mr. Landon. Make it Eli if you're going to insult me. Just getting a gauge. You cooperated with the police more than I'd have expected after your wife's murder. More than I should have, in hindsight. He set her coffee in front of her. I wasn't thinking like a lawyer. By the time I did start thinking, it was a little late. Did you love her? He'd asked for a woman, he reminded himself. Someone fresh and thorough. He'd gotten one and an investigator nothing like the one he'd hired after Lindsay's death. Now he'd have to deal with the result. 
Not when she died. It's hard not knowing if I ever did. But she mattered. She was my wife and she mattered. I want to know who killed her. I want to know why. I spent too much of the last year defending myself, and not enough really trying to find the answers. Being the prime suspect in a murder tends to keep you on the hot seat. She cheated on you. Here you're trying to have a fair and civilized divorce with a lot of money and family rep at stake. Even with the prenup, a lot of money and goods at stake, and you find out she's been playing you for a fool. You go into the house, one your money paid for, as hers was still in trust when you purchased it. You confront her, lose your temper, pick up the poker and let her have it. Then it's holy shit, look what I did. You call the cops, covering it with the old I came in and found her. That's the way they saw it. The police. The police, Lindsay's parents, the media. The parents don't matter, and the media, again, is what it is. And the cops couldn't, in the end, make the case. The police couldn't, not definitively, but that doesn't make me innocent to them or anyone else. Lindsay's parents, they lost a daughter, so they do matter, and they believe I got away with it. The media may be what it is, but it's weight. They made a pretty good case in the court of public opinion, and my family suffered for that. She studied him quietly as he spoke, and he realized now she'd gotten a sense of him just as she'd gotten one of Bluff House. Are you trying to piss me off? Maybe. Polite people don't tell you much of anything. Lindsay Landon's case looked slam dunk on the surface. Estranged husband, sex, betrayal, money, crime of passion. You're going to look at the husband first, and the person who discovers the body. You were both. No sign of break-in. Of struggle. No sign of a burglary gone bad. The public fight with the victim earlier that day. A lot of weight. I'm aware of the weight. The problem is that's all there is. Surface. You go below and it falls apart. The timing's sticky. The time of death. The time you were seen by a number of witnesses leaving your office. The time you deactivated the alarm to come in. So you couldn't have gone in and out again. Then back, as you were seen at your office, had appointments, conversations until after 6 p.m. And witnesses corroborate when the victim left the gallery where she worked. She entered the house, again verified, about two hours before you walked in the house that night. The cops figured the timing was tight, but it was possible for me to go in, argue, kill her, then try to cover it before calling 911. It didn't hold up well on reenactment even the prosecutor's reenactment. Good coffee, she said in an aside, then continued. Then there's forensics. No spatter on you, and you can't deliver blows like that without spatter. No spatter on your clothes, and witnesses verify the suit and tie you wore when you left the office. When did you have time, in an approximate twenty-minute window, to change your clothes, change back again, and where were the blood spattered ones, or whatever you used to cover your suit? You sound like my lawyer. He's a smart guy. Add no history of violence, no prior bad acts, and no matter how they came at you, you stuck to the story. They couldn't shake you off it. Because it was the truth. Added to it, the victim's own behavior weighed on your side. She was the one lying, the one cheating, the one planning on a generous settlement while she carried on a secret affair. The media made that case, too. It's easy to smear a dead woman, and it's not what I wanted. But it helped. So did the phone calls logged between her and Justin Suskind after you confronted her that afternoon. Shined the light on him a while. He couldn't face coffee, he realized, and opened the refrigerator for water. I wanted it to be him. Problems there. One motive. Unless you subscribe to the theory she decided to break it off or step back after her confrontation with you. The motive problem deepens because she was good at keeping him a secret. Friends, co-workers, neighbors. Nobody knew about him. Some suspected there was someone, but she never talked about it. Too much at stake. She didn't keep a diary, and the emails between them were careful. They both had a lot at stake. 
They met almost exclusively in hotels or out-of-town restaurants, B&Bs. Nothing the cops dug up pointed to any tension between them. No. He wished that didn't continue to sting, even if the sting had gone dull. I think she cared about him a great deal. Maybe she did, or maybe she just liked the adventure. You're probably never going to know for sure. But the biggest problem with Suskind as killer is he's alibied by his wife, his betrayed wife. She comes across as mortified, even devastated by this affair. But she tells the police he was home that night. They had dinner together, alone as both kids were at a school function. Then the kids get home about 8.15 and confirm mom and dad are hanging out at home. She opened her briefcase, took out a file. As you know, the Suskinds recently separated. I figured she might change her tune now that the marriage is going under. I talked to her yesterday. She's bitter. She's tired. She's done with the husband and the marriage. But she doesn't change her story. Where does that leave us? Well, if you cheat with one, maybe you cheat with others. Maybe another lover isn't happy about her in Suskind. Or maybe another wife confronts her. I haven't found anybody yet, but that doesn't mean I won't. Mind? Cheryl and asked and gestured to the coffee maker. No, sure. I'd make it myself, but that machine looks like I'd need a training manual. No problem. Thanks. So you'll see, and I believe your previous investigator reported, she didn't always use a credit card for rooms. Sometimes she used cash, and that's hard to track. At this point, we have witnesses who've identified Justin Suskind as her companion in several locations. Now we look for some that identify someone else. He brought the fresh coffee back, sat again to skim through the files while Sherilyn talked. She let her killer into the house, turned her back on him. She knew who killed her, so we look at who she knew. BPD was thorough, but they liked you for it, and the lead investigator was dug in hard on that. Wolf. He's a bulldog. You fit the bill for him. I can see where he's coming from. And you're a criminal defense attorney. That's the enemy. He busts his ass to take bad guys off the street. You line your pockets getting them back out. Black and white. I was a cop for five years before I went private. Cupping the coffee in both hands, she leaned back to enjoy it. I see plenty of gray. But it's a pisser when some hotshot suit gets an asshole a pass on some technicality, or because he's got good style with some fancy tap dance. Wolf looks at you. He sees rich, privileged, spoiled, conniving, and guilty. He built a damn good circumstantial case, but he couldn't shoot it home. Now here you are in Whiskey Beach, and before you know it, there's another murder on your doorstep. Now you're not sounding like my lawyer. You sound like a cop. I have many voices, she said easily. She took out another file, set it on the counter. Kirby Duncan. He was basically a one-man operation, kept it low-key and low-tech. He wasn't bargain basement, but you'd find him on the sale rack. Cops liked him. He'd been one of them, and he played things pretty straight. Wolf knew him and was friendly with him, and he's pissed off he can't pin this on you. Then boomerang off it to circle your wife's death back on you. I got that loud and clear, Eli agreed. But in this case, none of it fits. Duncan wasn't an idiot, and he wouldn't have met the guy he was shadowing alone in a deserted area. Unless he got a wild hare to go to the lighthouse at night in the middle of a storm, he went to meet someone and most likely someone he knew. And someone killed him. You're alibied. There's absolutely nothing to indicate you and Duncan ever met or spoke. Nothing to indicate you hauled your butt from Boston, where it's confirmed you were when Abra Walsh was assaulted here in this house, then arranged to meet Duncan, killed him, then hauled back to Boston to toss his office, his apartment, then hauled back here again. Nobody's buying that. Wolf. Sherilyn shook her head. I'm not sure even Wolf can swallow it as hard as he might try. Now, if he can tie Walsh to it somehow so you had help, or find you contacted an accessory in Boston to do that end, 
that would go down. Someone planted the murder weapon in Abra's house. What? She straightened up, her eyes as sharp and annoyed as her tone. Why the hell didn't I know about this? I'm sorry, I just found out myself Monday. Mouth grim, she took a notebook and pen out of her briefcase. Give me the rundown. He told her what he knew, watched her write her notes in what he thought of as cop shorthand. Sloppy frame-up, she concluded. Whoever did it is impulsive, disorganized, and maybe a little stupid. He murdered a seasoned investigator, and so far he's gotten away with it. Even stupid can be lucky. I'd like to see this cottage before I go back to Boston. I'll ask Abra. And this trench in your basement. I'll take a shot at the local boys, see how much they'll share with me. She tapped her pen on the page as she studied Eli. In our email and phone conversations, you've indicated you think this may all be connected. It's a lot of damn coincidence otherwise. Maybe. There's another one I dug up I find interesting. She took out yet another file. About five months ago, Justin Suskind purchased a property known as Sandcastle on the north point of Whiskey Beach. He... he bought property here? That's right. It's deeded in the name of Legacy Corp., a shell company he set up. His wife isn't listed on the deed or the mortgage. If and when they proceed with a divorce, it should come out. It's very possible at this point she's not aware of it. Why the hell would he buy a house here? Well, it's a nice beach, and it's still a buyer's market real estate-wise. Her smirk reappeared. But the cynic in me says he has other motives. We could speculate he hopes to catch you in a mistake and avenge his dead lover. But you weren't living here five months ago and had no plans to. Bluff House was here. My grandmother, none of this connects him in any way I can see with your wife's death, and that's why you hired me. But I love a puzzle or I wouldn't be in this business. Add nosy. He buys property here, reasonably close to your landmark family home, a place my information indicates you rarely visited after your marriage. Lindsay didn't like it here. She and my grandmother didn't get along. I'd imagine she might bring up the house and all that goes with it in pillow talk. So a few months after she dies, her lover buys the property. And you have a trench in the basement, a grandmother in the hospital, a P.I. shadowing you, then killed. And now the murder weapon planted in the home of the woman you're involved with. What's at the core of that, Eli? Not you. You weren't here when he took the first step. What's at the core? Esmeralda's dowry. Something that probably doesn't exist. And if it does, sure as hell isn't buried in the basement. He left my grandmother to die. Maybe. Can't prove it yet, but maybe. I wouldn't have given you all this information if my gauge didn't tell me you're not the type to fly off and do the stupid. Don't screw up my record on character judgment. He shoved up because he did feel like flying off and doing the stupid. He could have killed her. She lay there, God knows how long. A defenseless old woman and he left her to die. He could have killed Lindsay. He whirled back. His wife could be lying, covering for him out of loyalty or fear. He's capable of killing. The odds are Duncan's on him, too. Who else? Who else would care what I was doing? I thought it was Lindsay's family, but this makes more sense. I did some digging there. Nosy, she repeated. The Piedmonts had an excellent firm and two of their top investigators on this in Boston. They let them go about three weeks ago. Let... they let it go? My information is the investigators reported there was nothing left to find. I'm not saying they won't hire another firm, but I can say they didn't hire Kirby Duncan. If Suskind did, he'd know when I left the house, where I was, how much time he'd have to dig. He was in the house the night I was in Boston because Duncan told him I was in Boston. Then Abra came in. If she hadn't defended herself, he might have... Sherilyn sat as he paced to the terrace doors and back. You said Duncan was a straight shooter. That's his rap, yeah. Vinny, 
Deputy Hansen, went to see him the night of the break-in here to question him. He told Duncan about the break-in, about Abra. A straight shooter wouldn't like being used so a client could break the law, put hands on a woman. So Suskind killed him rather than risk exposure. It could make a tidy box, when and if it can be proved. Right now? She tapped the files again. All we can prove is he bought property. And his wife didn't strike me as loyal or afraid, not when I talked to her. Humiliated and bitter. I don't know why she'd lie for him. He's still the father of her children. True enough, I'll keep on it. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a look around here. See if I can find out what Suskind's been up to. Get a bead on him. I want you to give the cops what you have on him. She winced. That hurts. Listen. The cops will want to talk to him, ask questions, get their own gauge. It could scare him off and we end up blowing our best angle. Give me a little time, say a week. Let me see what I can finesse. A week, Eli agreed. Why don't you show me the famous hole in your basement? Downstairs, she took a couple of shots with a little digital camera. A lot of determination here, she commented. I read up a little on this dowry, the ship and so on, but just to get a general overview, I'd like to have one of my people do some more in-depth research on it, if that's okay with you. It's fine. I've been doing some of my own. If there was anything, we'd have found it a long time ago. He's wasting his time. Probably, but it's a big house. Lots of hidey holes, I'd imagine. Most of it was built years after the Calypso. Whiskey built it generation by generation, along with the distilleries, the warehouses, the offices. You didn't go into the family business, she said as they started out. It's my sister's thing. She's good at it. I'll be the land and in bluff house. There's been one here, he explained, always, since it was no more than a stone cottage on this bluff. Traditions matter. That's why you went back to the house in the back bay for your grandmother's ring. It wasn't marital property. Even in the prenup, that was clear. But at that point, I didn't trust Lindsay. Why would you? Sherilyn commented. The ring belonged to the Landons. My grandmother gave it to me to give to my wife as a symbol that she was part of the family. Lindsay didn't honor that, and I was pissed. He added, closing the basement door behind them. I wanted to take back something that was mine. The ring, the silver set, that had been in the family for two hundred years. The painting, that was stupid, he admitted. I didn't want her to have something I'd bought out of sentiment, out of trust, when she'd betrayed that. Stupid because, after everything, I can't even look at it. That added more weight on your side. You went up, took the ring, just the ring, all that jewelry you'd bought your wife. You left it alone. You didn't take it, didn't throw it around the room, out the window. You exhibited no sign of violent behavior or disposition. You're not a violent man, Eli. He thought of Suskind, of Lindsay, of his grandmother, of Abra. I could be. She gave him a maternal pat on the arm. Don't go changing. I booked a night at the B&B. &B. I can have a chat with the owner about Duncan about anyone she saw him with. Sometimes people remember things over a blueberry muffin they don't when they're talking to cops. I want to see Abra's cottage and sneak around Suskind's place. Maybe chat up any neighbors, some of the shopkeepers. He had to buy food, maybe a six-pack now and then. Yeah. Let me call Abra about the cottage. He glanced at the list on the kitchen board as he took out his phone. Is that her schedule? Today's. Busy woman. Sherilyn studied the schedule as Eli spoke with Abra. A woman with her hands in that many pies, she thought, knew a little about a lot of people. And that could be useful. She said you can get the key from her neighbor, the house to the right of the cottage, Maureen O'Malley. Great. I'm leaving those files for you. I have copies. She closed her briefcase, lifted it. I'll keep you up to date. Thanks, you've given me a lot to process. As he walked her to the door, it struck him. 
six-pack, beer, bar. Make mine a draft. Abra, the second break-in. We were at the bar where she works on Fridays. She saw this guy, unfamiliar, unfriendly. He ordered another drink, but he left before she served it, and as soon as I walked in. Can't she describe him? It's dark in there. She worked with a police artist. But the sketch isn't much. But if you showed her a picture of Suskind, worth a shot, and there's one in the file. It only proves he was in the bar, which, seeing as he has a house here, isn't much. But it's more. He wanted more still, Eli realized. It ground in his gut. The idea that the man his wife had betrayed him with might have killed her. Might have caused his grandmother's fall and left her for dead. Might have assaulted Abra. He'd invaded Bluff House. Everyone in Whiskey Beach knew of the Landons, so buying a house here was a deliberate act. One taken for proximity to Bluff House, he was certain of it. He carried the files into the library, sat at the old desk with them and his legal pad for his own notes, and went to work. When Abra came in shortly after five, he was still at it, and the dog who greeted her at the door stared at her with pleading eyes. Eli, huh? Blinking, he looked around, frowned. You're back. Yes, I'm back, and actually a little late. She stepped up to the desk, scanned the piles of papers, the thick ream of notes, and picked up the two empty bottles. A two Mountain Dew session? I'll get those. Got them. Did you have lunch? Uh, did you take the dog out? Oh. He slid a glance down to the sad-eyed Barbie. I got caught up. Two things. One, I'm not going to let you neglect yourself again, skipping meals, subsisting on nuclear yellow soft drinks and coffee. And two, you're not allowed to neglect a dog who depends on you. You're right, I was busy. I'll take her out in a minute. In answer, Abra simply turned and walked out, the dog at her heels. Shit. He looked at his papers, his progress, raked his hands through his hair. He hadn't asked for the dog, had he? But he'd taken the dog, so that was that. Rising, he made his way to the kitchen, found it empty, with Abra's enormous bag on the counter. A glance out the window showed him she'd taken the dog out herself, and they were halfway down the beach steps. No need to be pissy about it, he muttered, and grabbed a jacket and Barbie's favorite ball on the way out. By the time he reached them, woman and dog were walking briskly along the shoreline. I got caught up, he repeated. Obviously. Look, I got a lot of new information from the investigator. It's important. So is the health and well-being of your dog, not to mention your own. I just forgot she was there. She's so damn polite. Because it sounded like an accusation, he sent the dog a silent apology. I'll make it up to her. She likes to chase the ball, see? He unhooked the leash. Go for it, Barbie, and heaved the ball into the water. The dog flew after it on wings of joy. See, she forgives me. She's a dog. She'll forgive almost anything. Abra stepped nimbly out of range when the very wet Barbie returned to drop the ball on the sand. Eli picked it up, threw it again. Would you have remembered to feed her? Her water dish was empty. Damn it. Okay, he sucked right at the moment. It won't happen again. I was caught up, she finished. So you forgot to water and walk your dog, forgot to eat. I imagine you didn't ride. Instead, you spent all your time and energy on murders and treasure. And damned if he'd apologize for that part. I need answers, Abra. I thought you wanted them too. I do. She searched for calm as he thrilled the dog with another toss. I do, Eli, but not at the expense of you. Not if it costs you what you've rebuilt in yourself. That's not what this is. It's one afternoon, for Christ's sake. One where all kinds of doors opened up into areas I need to explore. Because rebuilding isn't enough if you don't know. I understand. I do. And maybe I'm overreacting except about the dog, because there's just no excuse. How crappy do you want me to feel? She considered it, considered him, 
considered Barbie. Pretty crappy about the dog. Mission accomplished. With a sigh, she slipped out of her shoes, rolled her pants to her knees to wade into the surf. I care about you so much. It's a problem for me, Eli, caring so much for you. Why? It's easier just to live my life. You've had experience there, she added, pushing her hair out of her face when the wind carried it. It's easier just to live your life than to take that step again, that risk again. And it's scary when you can't seem to stop yourself from taking the step. I can't seem to stop myself. The turn of conversation left him baffled and a little uneasy. You matter to me more than I thought anyone would or could again. It is a little scary. I'm not sure either of us would have felt this way if we'd met a few years ago. If we'd been the people we were then. You pulled yourself out of a pit, Eli. I had help. I don't think people take help unless they're ready for it, whether they know it or not. You were ready for it. It hurts my heart to remember how sad and tired and dark you were when you first came back to Whiskey Beach. It would break it to see you that way again. That's not happening. I want you to have your answers. I want them too. I just don't want them to be something that sends you back into that pit or that puts you on the other side of it, that changes you back into someone I don't know. It's selfish, but I want who you are now. Okay. Okay. He took a moment to line up his thoughts. This is who I am. And who I am forgets things, gets caught up, and is learning to like having someone remind him not to. I'm not that different from who I was before all this happened. But what happened focused me. I don't want to be a problem for you, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm where I want to be. That's one answer I'm sure of. She pushed at her hair again, angled her head. Get rid of a tie. What? Get rid of a tie. One tie, your choice. And let me read one scene of the book. One, again, your choice. Symbolism. Throwing out something from before, offering me something from now. And that solves the problem. She wagged her hand back and forth. We'll see. I guess I'll go figure out what's for dinner and make sure you eat. She gave him a poke in the belly. You're still on the skinny side. Not a lot of meat on you either. To prove it, he plucked her up, made her laugh as her legs wrapped around his waist. Then we'll have a really big dinner. She pressed her lips to his, hers still curved as he spun her around. And as she drew back, saw just where he was headed. Don't, Eli! She went into the surf with him, rolled and tumbled. Gasping, she managed to gain her feet, just as the next wave struck and sent her sprawling. Laughing like a maniac, Eli pulled her up again. I wanted to see what it was like. Wet and cold. She shoved back her dripping hair as the excited dog swam around them. What did it say about her, she wondered, that his impulsive, silly act had wiped away her earlier annoyance and nerves? Moron. Mermaid. He pulled her against him again. That's what you look like, just as I thought. This mermaid has legs, currently freezing, and sand in very uncomfortable places. It sounds like a long, hot shower's on tap. Gripping her hand, he pulled her to shore. I'll help you out with that sand. He laughed again when the wind struck. Christ, it's freezing. Come on, Barbie. Caught up. That's what it said about her, she thought. She was just caught up. She managed to snag her shoes as they ran across the beach. Chapter 24 The instant she dashed inside the mudroom, Abra peeled off her dripping hoodie, towed off her soggy shoes. Cold, 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 she chanted, teeth chattering as she dragged off her wet top, wiggled out of her clinging pants. 
The distraction of wet, naked, shivering Abra slowed Eli's progress. He was still struggling with his sodden jeans when she streaked away. Hold on a minute. He fought off the jeans, his boxers, left the whole mess in a pile and a spreading pool of seawater and wet clumps of sand to race after her. He heard her chanting still. Cold, cold, cold. He caught up just after the shower spray exploded, along with her garbled cry of relief. Warm, warm, warm. She let out a little shriek when he grabbed her from behind. No, you're still cold. Not for long. He spun her around, plastering her against him, and grabbed a hank of her hair. And covering her mouth with his, felt the heat rise. He wanted to touch everywhere. All that wet skin, those long lines, those subtle curves. He wanted to hear her throaty laugh, the catch of her sigh. When she shivered now, it was from arousal, anticipation, while the flood of hot water rained over them both. Her hands glided over him, a light scrape of nails, an erotic dig of fingers. She turned with him under the spray, around and around through the pulsing waterfall, with her mouth a wet-hot demand against his. He wanted her happy, wanted to erase the trouble he'd seen in her eyes on the beach. He wanted to shield her from the trouble to come, as it surely would. Trouble, he thought, that seemed to cling to him like skin. At least here, here and now, there was only heat and pleasure and need. Here and now he could give her all he had. She held on to him, even when he turned her around to slide his hands over her. She hooked an arm back around his neck to keep him close, and lifting her face as she might to the rain, opened. Her body yearned toward more. Touch here, taste there. And patient, relentless, he stoked the yearning to a deep, glorious ache. When she turned mouth to mouth again, he braced her against the wet tiles and filled her. Slow now, slow, rising like the steam, falling like the water, floating on thick, wet clouds of pleasure. She looked through the mists into his eyes. There were the answers, she thought. She had only to accept what she already knew, only to hold what her heart already wanted. You, she thought, as she let herself go. I've been waiting for you. When she pressed her face to his shoulder, shuddering with him on that final fall, she carried love. Lost in her, he held her another moment, just held. Then he tipped her face back, touched his lips to hers. About that sand. Her laugh made the moment perfect. In the kitchen, warm and dry, she plotted out dinner while he poured wine. We can just throw a sandwich together, he began. I don't think so. Are you trying to guilt me again because I missed lunch? No, I think I notched that belt. She set garlic, some plum tomatoes, a chunk of parmesan on the counter. I'm hungry, and you should be. Thanks. She took the wine, tapped her glass to his. But since you brought it up, you should tell me what you were so caught up in. I met with the investigator today. You said she was coming. Intrigued, Abra turned from her hunt in the refrigerator. You said before she had something new. You could say that. When a thought struck, he held up a finger. Wait, I want to try something. It'll just take a couple minutes. He went to the library for the files, slipped out the photograph of Justin Suskind. Taking it up to his office, he made a copy. He closed his eyes, tried to see the police artist sketch in his mind. With a pencil, he tried adding longer hair, shadowing the eyes. He couldn't claim to be Rembrandt, he thought, or even Hester H. Landon. But it was worth a shot. He took the photo and copy back downstairs, detoured back to the library for the files and his notes. 
When he got back to the kitchen, she had two pots on the stove. A narrow tray of olives, marinated artichokes, cherry peppers, sat on the island while she minced garlic. How do you do that? He wondered, and popped an olive into his mouth. Kitchen magic. What's all that? Files the investigator left, notes I've made. She went back to the beginning. By the time he'd wound through it, pausing before telling her of Suskind's presence in Whiskey Beach, she'd tossed a bowl of campanelle mixed with tomatoes, basil, and garlic. He watched her grate parmesan over it. You did that in like a half hour. Yeah, yeah, kitchen magic, he said before she could reply. He dug into the pasta, filled her bowl, then his. Sliding onto the stool beside his, Abra sampled the dish. Nice, it worked. So she thinks it's all connected too? Yeah, she... Nice, he said after his own sample. It's great. You should write this down. And spoil the spontaneity? She'll talk to Vinny, right? And Detective Corbett? That's the plan. And she'll have a couple of fresh items to pass along. Such as? Let's try this first. He turned over the doctored copy, set it on the counter between them. Does this guy look familiar? I... He looks like the man in the bar that night. A lot like the man in the bar. She lifted the photo, studied it carefully. It looks more like him than I was able to translate to the police artist. Where did you get this? In answer, Eli turned over the original photo. Who is this? She asked. Shorter hair and a cleaner, smoother look about him. How did she find the man I saw in the bar? She didn't know she found him. This is Justin Suskind. Suskind? The man Lindsay was involved with? Of course! Annoyance flickered over her face as she tapped her fingers at her temple. Damn it! I saw his picture in the paper last year, but I didn't remember or put it together. Didn't pay that much attention, I guess. What was he doing at the pub? Staking things out. A few months ago, he bought Sandcastle, a cottage on the North Point. He bought a house in Whiskey Beach? I know that house! She jabbed a finger at Eli. I know it. I do seasonal cleaning for one across from it. Eli, there's only one reason he would buy a house here. To gain access to this one. But it's crazy. It's crazy when you think about it. He was having an affair with your wife and now he's... Did he have the affair so he could get information about the house? Maybe hope to get more on the treasure? Or did he learn about all that during the affair? Lindsay never had much interest in Bluff House. But she was a connection, Abra insisted. She knew about the Calypso, the dowry, didn't she? Sure. I told her about it the first time I brought her here. I showed her the cove where pirates used to moor. And about running whiskey during Prohibition. You know, impressed the girl with local color and land and lore. And was she impressed? It's a good story. I remember her asking me to tell it at a couple of dinner parties back then, but that was more for laughs. She didn't think much of or about Whiskey Beach. Suskind obviously did and does. Eli, this is huge. He could be responsible for all of it. The break-ins, Hester's fall, Duncan's murder, Lindsay's. He has an alibi for Lindsay. But wasn't that his wife? If she lied, they're separated and she's sticking by her original statement. A little reluctantly, Sherilyn thinks, as she's not feeling very friendly towards Suskind these days. She could still be lying. Abra stabbed some pasta. He's guilty of other crimes. Innocent until, Eli reminded her. Oh, don't go lawyer on me. Give me one good reason other than bad behavior he'd buy that house. I can give you a few. He likes the beach. He wanted an investment. His marriage is, was, going south, and he wanted a place to go, somewhere quiet so he could think it all through. He and Lindsay drove up here on a whim so she could show him Bluff House, so he bought the cottage here to remind him of that perfect day. Oh, that's all bullshit. He shrugged a shoulder at the spike of annoyance. 
reasonable doubt. If I were representing him, I'd make a big deal over my client being questioned for simply buying a beach house. And if I were a prosecutor, I'd make a big deal over the series of coincidences and connections. A house on this particular beach, where your family owns a landmark home and which has since his purchase experienced a series of break-ins? She snorted, then fixed her face into serious lines. Your Honor, I submit the defendant purchased said property and took residence in same for the sole purpose of illegally entering Bluff House to search for pirate treasure. He smiled at her, leaned over to kiss her. Objection. Speculative. I don't think I'd have liked Lawyer Landon. Maybe not, but with what's here, I'd have gotten Suskind off in a walk. Then flip it. How would Lawyer Landon build the case against? By finding out if he has knowledge of or interest in Esmeralda's dowry, for one. Linking those fibers found at your place to him, that would be key. Tracing the gun to him. Tracing any of the tools in the basement to him, for that matter. If my grandmother could identify him as the intruder. And all the way back to breaking his wife's statement. Better yet, find a way to put him in the house when Lindsay was killed, and that's not going to happen. Dig up a witness or witnesses who had testified to some trouble between him and Lindsay. That would be a start. Abra sipped her wine and considered. I bet we'd find books and notes and all sorts of information on Bluff House and the dowry in his possession. Not without a search warrant, and you don't get those without probable cause. Don't interrupt with legalities. Abra dismissed them with a wave of her hand. And they could do a CSI on the fibers and his clothes, the DNA from my pajamas. All requiring a warrant, which requires probable cause. And the gun, unregistered. That tells me he probably bought it on the street, for cash. Or from a shaky dealer, for cash. Not that hard to do in Boston. How do you trace something like that? Show his picture around to known dealers in that kind of trade. Find the dealer, then get him to ID Suskind. Then get him to agree to testify. Eli wove through the process and possibilities. All of that takes the same kind of luck it does to win the Mega Millions lottery. Somebody has to win eventually. Your investigator should do that. All of that. I think we need to let Hester remember on her own if and when. And honestly, the fact that it was dark, I don't think she really saw him. Just more a shadow, a shape. I'm with you there. The tools wouldn't be easy. He probably bought them months ago. Who remembers some guy buying a pickaxe or sledgehammer? But I think you should go to Boston and talk to his wife. What? Eden Suskind? Why would she talk to me? Well, hell, Eli. That shows what you know about women. Especially angry, betrayed, or sad women. You were both cheated on. Her husband, your wife. That's a kind of bond. You shared a difficult experience. It's a pretty shaky bond if she thinks I killed Lindsay. There's only one way to find out. And while we're there, we could check out Kirby Duncan's office. We? Of course, I'm going with you. A sympathetic female. Laying her hand on her heart, Abra shifted her expression into quiet sympathy. That's good. You're good at that. Well, I do feel sympathetic. She might feel safer if there's another woman. One who feels and can show that sympathy and understanding. And we definitely need to show Suskind's picture around Duncan's offices. That's what investigators are for. Sure, yeah, but aren't you curious? I can't do it this week. I'm already booked. Plus, we should plan it a little more. I can probably juggle time next week. In the meantime, maybe your investigator will win the lottery, and we can keep an eye out for Suskind. And an eye on Sandcastle. We can't go lurking down there. If he spots us, we could scare him off. And you're not going near his place. Non-negotiable, he said before she could respond. That's a line not in sand, in solid rock. We can't be sure he doesn't have another gun, but we can be reasonably sure if he does, he'd use it. Duncan had one registered, and it wasn't found on his body, or, as far as I can find out, anywhere else. Speculative, but I mostly agree. We don't have to lurk. Come with me, I'll show you. 
she led the way to the terrace and the telescope. According to Mike, the previous owners bought it as an investment property about five years ago, right before the bubble burst. The economy bottomed out. People weren't spending as much on vacations and so on. She continued as she turned the telescope south. It was on the market for over a year, and they had to keep cutting the price. Then she straightened up from her focus. Oh, for Christ's sake, I'm an idiot. You need to talk to Mike. He brokered the property. You're kidding. No, I wasn't thinking. He was the agent on that property. He might know something about something. I'll talk to him. For now, you can look. She tapped the scope. Sandcastle. Eli bent over, looked through the eyepiece. It stood near the North Point, two-story clabbered, with a wide deck facing the beach. Windows and sliders shuttered with blinds, he noted. A short driveway and no car. Looks like nobody's home. So it would be a perfect time to go down, take a closer look. No, he said, still studying the house. You know you want to. Damn right he did, but he didn't want her with him. The only thing to see is a house with the blinds closed. I bet we could pick the lock. Now he did straighten. Are you serious? She shrugged, had the grace to look sheepish. I guess I sort of am. We might find some evidence that would be completely inadmissible. Lawyer. Sane, he insisted. We're not breaking into his or anyone's house. We're especially not breaking into the house of a man who may very well be a murderer. You'd do it if I weren't here. No, I wouldn't. At least he hoped to Christ he wouldn't. She narrowed her eyes at his face, then sighed. You wouldn't. At least tell me you'd like to. What I'd like is for him to be in there. I'd like to go down, kick in the door, then beat the living crap out of him. The cold rage in his voice got through, had her eyes widening. Oh, have you ever beaten the living crap out of anyone before? No, he'd be my first. I'd enjoy it. Fuck speculative. He rammed his hands into his pockets as he paced the terrace. Just fuck it. I don't know if he killed Lindsay, but odds are. And I know, I know he's responsible for what happened to Gran. I know he put his hands on you. He put a bullet in Duncan. He'll do it all again and more to get what he's after. And I can't do a goddamn thing about it. Yet. He stopped, tried to shrug off some of the frustration. Yet. What can you do at this point? I can talk to Mike. I can think about talking to Eden Suskind and the best way to approach her if I do. We can give the cops your ID of Justin Suskind, which gives them a reason to have a conversation with him. In a few days, to give Sherilyn some time first. Not much is likely to come from that, but it should worry him when it happens. I can keep researching the dowry and try to figure out why he thinks he'll find it here. As he thought it through, he calmed. I can trust the investigator to do her job. And as insurance, I can put together a plan to lure Suskind into the house so I can catch his sorry ass. We, she corrected. We can see his place. Therefore, he can sure as hell see Bluff House. So he's watching it, at least off and on. We'd have to make sure he was in there. Then we could make a show of leaving the house. Maybe we even take a couple overnight bags like we were taking a quick trip. It would give him the perfect opening. we just park out of sight, circle back on foot and go in the south side. And into the passageway with a video camera. I've been looking at some online. And nanny cams. Excellent. Proactive. And it could work. What about Barbie? Crap. Yeah, he might not come in with her barking. we take her with us, leave her with Mike. Would they keep her for a few hours? Absolutely. We'd need to refine it. And he'd want to walk it off, judge the timing. It's a good backup. Hopefully between Sherilyn and the cops, they'll put together enough to pull him in and pressure him. I like the idea of huddling in a secret passage with my lover. She wrapped her arms around him. Preparing to ambush a cold-blooded killer. It's like a scene from a romantic thriller.
just don't sneeze. As if. And speaking of scenes from a book, yeah, a deal's a deal. I'll pick one. Let me think about it. Fair enough. Now about that tie. You serious about that? Deadly. You can go pick one while I run those wet clothes I completely forgot about through the wash. Then I can look at those files while you do the dishes. Barbie will need her bedtime walk by then. You've got it all figured out. I do try. She kissed him, one cheek, then the other. One tie, she repeated, and tugged him back inside. More reluctant than he'd expected, he went upstairs, pulled his tie rack out of the closet. He liked his ties. It wasn't as if he had an emotional attachment, but he liked having a variety. Choices. Which still didn't explain why he'd brought them all to the beach, especially when he'd worn a tie a spare handful of times in the last six months. Okay, maybe a slight emotional attachment. He'd won court cases in these ties, and lost a few. He'd selected one every day of his working life, had loosened them during late nights at the office, knotted and unknotted them countless times. In another life, he admitted. He reached for one, blue and gray stripes, changed his mind, lifted a maroon with a muted paisley pattern, changed it yet again. Oh, hell. He shut his eyes, reached down, and grabbed one blind. It just had to be a freaking Hermes. Done. It actually hurt to carry it away from the others. To offset the downer, he swung into his office. She'd tell him it was good, he thought, as he tried to decide what scene to give her. She'd lie. He didn't want her to lie, he wanted it to be good. Oddly, he realized that he knew just the scene for her to read, one where he could use her feedback. He scrolled through his manuscript, found the pages. Before he could change his mind, he printed them out. Don't be a pussy, he ordered himself, and took them and the tie downstairs. She sat at the counter, one bare foot rubbing the flank of the dog that sprawled on the floor, and wore glasses with bold orange frames. You wear glasses? She pulled them off like a dirty little secret. Sometimes, for reading, especially when the print's small. Some of this is really small. Put them back on. I'm vain, I can't help it. He set the pages aside, took the glasses, slid them back on her nose. You look cute. I thought going for punchy frames would make a difference, but I'm still vain and still hate wearing them. Just for reading sometimes, and sometimes when I'm making jewelry. The things you learn. Really cute. She rolled her eyes behind the lenses, then took the glasses off again when she spotted the tie. Nice, she said, taking it from him. Then wiggled her eyebrows when she saw the label. Hermes, very nice. The ladies at the consignment shop are going to be very pleased. Consignment shop? I can't just toss it. Somebody can use it. He looked at it as she hopped up to tuck it into her bag. Can I buy it back? With a laugh, she shook her head. You won't miss it. Is that for me? She gestured toward the printout. Yeah, one scene, it's just a couple of pages. I figured I'd get it all over with at once, like ripping off a bandage. It's not going to hurt. It already does. I don't want you to lie to me. Why would I lie to you? He snatched up the pages as she reached for them. You're a born nurturer, and you're sleeping with me. It goes against the grain for you to hurt anyone's feelings. You won't hurt my feelings, and that's a lie. But I need to know if it works or if it doesn't, even if it hurts. I won't lie to you. She wiggled her fingers for the pages. Take your mind off what I'm doing and load the dishwasher. She propped her feet on the second stool, and since they were right there, put on her glasses. After peering at him over the pages, giving him a shooing gesture, she picked up the half glass of wine she'd been nursing and read. She read it twice, saying nothing as dishes rattled and water ran in the sink. Then she set the pages aside, took off her glasses so he could see her eyes clearly. 
She smiled. I would have lied a little. The kind of thing I consider a soft lie, because it's like a cushion. It gives a soft landing to both parties. A soft lie. Yeah, I can usually manage those guilt-free. But I'm really glad I don't have to lie, even with a soft one. You gave me a love scene. Well, yeah. There was a reason I haven't written many of them. Could be a weak spot. It's not. It's sexy, and it's romantic, and more, you showed me what they're feeling. She laid a hand on her heart. I know he's bruised here again, she said, tapping her hand. She wants to reach him, and she so much wants him to reach her. I don't know all the reasons, but I know this moment mattered to both of them. It's not a weak spot. He didn't expect to find her. I didn't expect him to find her. She makes a difference in him, in the book. Will he make a difference in her? I hope so. He's not you. I don't want him to be. But there are pieces. She's not you, but... I'm pretty sure she's going to wear orange-framed reading glasses. She laughed. <laughs> My gift to your literary oeuvre. I can't wait to read it, Eli, from start to finish. It'll be a little while yet. I couldn't have written that scene three months ago. I wouldn't have believed it, and I couldn't have felt it. He walked to her. You've given me more than reading glasses. She slid her arm around him, rested her cheek on his chest. Hardly a wonder, she thought, once she'd taken that first risky step. The fall had followed so fast, and she wouldn't regret it. Let's walk Barbie, she said. At the words walk and Barbie, the dog scrambled up and went into a full body wag. And I can tell you a couple of ideas I had for your new third floor office. For my office. Her lips curved as she drew back. Just ideas. Including, she continued as she rose for the leash in one of his jackets, as hers was currently in spin dry. A really wonderful painting at a shop in the village. One of Hester's, actually. Don't we have enough paintings in the house? Not in your new office. She rolled up the sleeves of his jacket, zipped it. Plus, your art in there should be inspiring, stimulating, and personal. I know just what would inspire and stimulate, and qualify as personal. He reached for another jacket. A full-length photo of you, wearing just those glasses. Really, life-size, he said as he hooked Barbie's leash. That's a definite possibility. What? His head came up fast, but she was already walking out the door. Wait, seriously? Her laugh trailed back as he and the dog chased after her. Chapter 25 Eli exchanged emails with his investigator, devoted an hour a day to researching Esmeralda's dowry, and dived into his book. He put Abra off on the trip to Boston as the book was running hot for him. He craved those hours inside it, and the possibility, tantalizingly close now, of truly redefining his life. He also wanted time to prepare. If he seriously meant to meet Eden Suskind, to try to talk to her about very sensitive areas of their personal lives, he needed to do it right. Not so different to his mind from questioning a witness at trial. And he wouldn't mind another day or two testing out the video camera and nanny cam he'd bought. In any case, he found himself reluctant to leave Whiskey Beach, even for a day. Periodically, he wandered out to the terrace, took a look through the telescope. Sherilyn's brief daily reports told him Justin Suskind remained in Boston, going about his business, living in an apartment near his offices. He'd visited his home once, but only long enough to pick up his two children to take them to dinner. Still, he could return any time. Eli didn't want to miss him. He tended to walk the dog north on the beach in the afternoon, and twice did his run with Barbie past Sandcastle, climbing up the north beach steps to return by the road route. It gave him a closer look, a casual study of the doors, the windows. 
The blinds on Sandcastle remained firmly shut. He told himself he'd take a few more days, let everything settle, let it all simmer in his head. And if part of the simmering, the settling led to the remote possibility he'd run into Suskind on one of his walks, have the satisfaction of confronting him face to face. Eli felt he'd earned it. When he knocked off for the day, he let himself think of Abra. He went downstairs, put Barbie out on the terrace as they'd both learned she'd stay and enjoy a little sunshine before their walk. Then he checked Abra's daily schedule. Five o'clock class, he noted. Maybe he'd cook something. On second thought, a much safer, more palatable thought, he'd get pizza delivered. They could eat outside in the dusky spring evening with the pansies and daffodils. He'd stick a couple of candles out there. She liked candles. He'd turn on the strings of glass balls he'd found in his search and rummage through storage and managed to repair and hung on the eaves over the main terrace. Maybe he'd steal some flowers around the house and put them on the table. She'd appreciate that. He'd have time to walk the dog, put in an hour or so in the library, even set a nice outdoor table before she got home. Got home, he thought. Technically, Laughing Gull was her home, but for all intents and purposes, she lived in Bluff House with him. And how did he feel about that? Comfortable, he realized. He felt comfortable about that. If anyone had asked him a few months before how he'd feel about being in any sort of relationship, he wouldn't have had an answer. The question wouldn't have processed. There just hadn't been enough of him to form any part of any relationship. He opened the refrigerator, thinking Mountain Dew or possibly Gatorade, and saw the bottle of water with its sticky note, one he'd ignored that morning. Be good to yourself, drink me first. Okay, okay. He took out the water, peeled off the sticky note. It made him smile. Did he say comfortable? True enough, he decided, but more than comfortable. For the first time in a very long time, he was happy. No, there hadn't been much of him at the start of things, but there'd been plenty of her. She filled the spaces. Now she made him want to do the same, even if it was only fumbling through a repair of a string of lights and hanging them, because they'd made him think of her. Coming along, he murmured. He'd walk the dog, drink the water, then shift to research mode. At the knock on the door, he detoured to the front of the house. Hey, Mike. He stepped back. More progress, he thought. It pleased him to have a friend drop by. Eli, sorry I didn't get back to you earlier. We've been slammed, housing picking up and rentals too. The spring season's rocking it. That's good news. Still, he frowned. What? The tie. Oh, yeah, pretty cool, huh? I got it at the consignment shop. Hair maze, uh, he added with a Tony accent. Forty-five bucks, but it's good for impressing clients. Yeah. Eli had thought the same once. Yeah, I bet. So, I looked through my files on Sandcastle, refresh my memory, you know. I can give you what's public record and some impressions, some stuff, you know, falls into confidential. Got it. You want a drink? Could use something cold. It's been a long one. Let's see what we've got. Eli led the way back to the kitchen. Did you get the impression Suskind wanted it for a residence or an investment property? Investment. The purchase was through his company, and there was some talk about company use. There wasn't a lot of talk, Mike added as they reached the kitchen. Most of the deal was long distance, email, phone. Mm-hmm. We've got beer, juice, Gatorade, water, Mountain Dew and Diet Pepsi. Mountain Dew? I haven't had that since I was in college. Super juice. You want one? Why not? Let's take this outside. Keep Barbie company. Mike spent a moment giving the delighted dog a rub before sitting down, stretching his legs out. Now, this is what I'm talking about. The flowers look good, man, dreaded Abra. I'm on watering detail, though, so that counts. He liked doing it, liked watching the colors and shapes she'd crowded into pots grow, 
the shrubs along the edges of the stone flower. Occasionally he considered working out here, but realized he'd never get anything done. He just sit as he was now, listening to the wind chimes play their tune along with the whoosh of the sea, while he looked out at the water, with his dog sitting beside him. Have you seen any scantily clads yet through that thing? Eli glanced at the telescope. Oh, one or two. I should get me one. Sad to say I've spent more time looking north. I've got a good view of Sandcastle from here. I was down that way today. It looks closed up. Yeah, he hasn't been there for a while. Damn shame to see it sit empty. I could rent it in a heartbeat. By the week, a long weekend. Interested, Eli shifted. I bet you could. Maybe you should give him a call, see if he's interested. After another swig of dew, Mike nodded. I can do that. Do you really think this guy's been breaking in here? That he killed that P.I.? I've been going at it from every angle, circling around. That's where I keep coming back. Then he'd be the one who hurt Mrs. Landon. I can't prove it, but yeah. If the rest fits, that fits. Son of a fucker, Mike muttered and opened his briefcase. I've got his cell number in the file. Let's see what he has to say. After opening the file, Mike punched the number into his phone. Hey, hi there, Justin. It's Mike O'Malley, O'Malley and Dodd Properties up in Whiskey Beach. How are you doing today? Eli sat back, listened to Mike do his chatty salesman patter. And, he thought, the man he believed was responsible for death, for pain, for fear, was speaking on the other end the man who'd taken lives and broken his own to bits. And he couldn't reach him, not yet. Couldn't touch him, couldn't stop him. But he would. You've got my number if you change your mind. And if there's anything I can do for you down here, you just give me a call. We're having some beautiful weather this spring, and it promises to be a terrific summer. You ought to come up, take advantage of us. Oh, I know how that goes. All right, then. Bye. Mike clicked off the phone. Just as stiff and unfriendly as I remember. They're not interested in renting the property at this time. Some noise about possible company or family use coming up. He's a busy man. How do you find the property? The internet, bless it. He hit our webpage. He had three places earmarked to start. One's a block back so you lose the ocean front, but it's a nice quiet street and an easy walk to the beach. The other's just south, closer to our place. But the owners decided to pull it off the market, let it ride for another season. Good move, because we've booked it solid this summer. Mike took a long pull of Mountain Dew. Man, this takes me back. Anyway, we made an appointment. He wanted either me or Tony, Tony Dodd, my associate, to show the properties. Insisted it had to be one of us. I got a note right here in the file because I got attitude right off the get-go from him. No problem, a sale's a sale. He doesn't have time to waste on underlings. He's too important. I get him. Yeah, he made that clear. Mike agreed. So he comes in later that week. Expensive suit. Two hundred dollar haircut. He's got that entitled prep school superiority all over him. No offense, you probably went to one. I did, and none taken. I know the type. Okay. He doesn't want coffee or small talk. He's on a schedule. But when I'm driving him down to look at the two properties, he asks about Bluff House. Everybody does, so I didn't think anything of it. I remember we had one of those smoky skies that day. Cold, gloomy, and the house looked like something right out of a movie. Some old gothic film, you know, the way it sits up here. I gave him the spiel, the history, the pirate deal, because it always grabs a client's interest. Christ, Eli, I hope to God I didn't say anything to bring this on. He already knew. He was here because he knew. I didn't like him, but I didn't jump to homicidal maniac or anything. Just tight-ass rich prick. I showed him the place a block back first. Sandcastle's newer, bigger, and a bigger commission. Plus, I tagged him as going for the bigger. But I took him through the other. He asked what most people ask, bid the wandering through, and out on the top deck. You can see the ocean from the deck. And Bluff House. Yeah. He wasn't too happy about the proximity of the other houses. Wanted to know which ones had permanent residence, which were rentals. 
but that's not an unusual question. I took him down to Sandcastle. It's got some nice features, and the other houses aren't as close in. He spent a lot of time outside again, and yeah, you can see Bluff House from there. He met the asking price on the spot, which isn't usual. In fact, actually pretty damn stupid in this market, since the sellers were prepared to go lower. But I just figured he thought dickering was beneath him. I said how I'd take him to lunch and we could deal with the paperwork, and I could contact the owners. Not interested. With a sour look, Mike tapped the face of his own watch. Tick, tick, tock, you know. I had to put the contract together quick and fast. He wrote a check for the earnest money, gave me his contact information, and took off. It's tough to complain about an easy sale, but he irritated me. And the rest? Did it go as fast and smooth? Settled in thirty days. He came in, signed the papers, took the keys. He barely said anything more than yes or no. We do a nice welcome basket for new owners. A bottle of wine, some fancy cheese and bread, a potted plant, some coupons for local shops and restaurants. He left it sitting on the table. Couldn't be bothered to take it. He had what he wanted. I haven't seen him since. I wish I knew more. But if you figure out how to catch the bastard, you let me know. I'm all about being in that. I appreciate it. I'm going to get going. Look, why don't I throw some burgers on the grill tomorrow night? You and Abra, come on over. It sounds good to me. I'll see you then. Thanks for the do. After Mike left, Eli laid a hand on Barbie's head, scratched gently behind her ears. He thought about the man Mike had just described. What did she see in him? He wondered. Then he sighed. I guess you never know who's going to pull at you, or why. He shoved to his feet. Let's go for a walk. He gave it a few more days. Just a few more days. The routine lulled him. Morning runs on the beach with the dog, or yoga if Abra charmed him into it. Solid blocks of writing time with the windows open. The balm of sea air now that May blew sweetly through. Reading out on the terrace with a dog sprawled at his feet, he learned more about the history of the house and the village whiskey built than he'd ever expected to. He'd known the original distillery had expanded in the late 1700s after the war. He hadn't realized, or retained in any case, that the extensive expansions on the once modest house had begun shortly after. They'd added a bathhouse at considerable expense, according to his source, the first in Whiskey Beach. Within twenty years, Land and Whiskey and Bluff House expanded again. Land and Whiskey built a school, and one of his ancestors caused a scandal by running off with the schoolmistress. Before the days of the Civil War, the house stood three elegant stories tall, tended by a small army of servants. They'd continued their firsts. The first house with indoor plumbing, the first with gaslight, then with electricity. They'd weathered prohibition, cagily running whiskey, supplying speakeasies and private customers. The Robert Landon his father had been named for bought and sold a hotel, and then a second in England, and married a daughter to an earl. But no one spoke, unless in joking terms, from what he'd found of pirate treasure. Finally! Abra swung her purse over her arm as they walked out of the house, she dressed conservatively, to her mind, for their trip into Boston, in black pants, strappy wedges, a poppy-colored floral blouse with some flounce. Long, multi-stone earrings danced as she tugged at Eli's hand. To Eli, she looked like an updated and sexy flower child, which, he supposed, wasn't far off the mark. When they reached the car, he glanced back and saw Barbie staring at him from the front window. I just hate leaving her. Barbie's fine, Eli. Then why was she giving him the sad dog look? She's used to having somebody around. Maureen promised to come down and walk her this afternoon, and the boys will come down, take her to the beach and play with her. Yeah. He jiggled his keys in his hand. You have separation anxiety. I do. Maybe. And it's incredibly sweet. She kissed his cheek. But this is a good thing to do. It's a step, and steps have to be taken. She slid into the car, 
waited for him to get in beside her. Plus, I haven't been in the city for over three months, and never with you. He shot one last look back at the window and the dog framed in it. We're going to try to shoehorn our way into a conversation with the wife of the man we think committed murder in addition to breaking and entering. Oh, and adultery. Let's not leave that one out. It's not exactly a pleasure trip. That doesn't mean it can't be pleasant. You've thought for days about how you're going to approach Eden Suskind. You've worked out approaches depending on if she's at work or at home. You're not the enemy, Eli. She can't possibly see you as the enemy. He drove along the coast road, wound through the village. People treat you differently, even people you know, after you've been accused of a crime, of killing. They're nervous around you, they avoid you, and if they can't avoid you, you can see on their faces they wish they had. That's done. It's not. It's not done until the person who killed Lindsay is caught, arrested, and tried. Then this is a step toward that. He's going to come back to Whiskey Beach. When he does, Corbett's going to talk to him. I wish we didn't have to wait for that. It's tricky for Corbett to go into Boston on this, and he doesn't want to pass it to Wolf. I'm grateful for that. We've got Suskind's address now, his office and his apartment. We could cruise by, watch him for a change. For what? Curiosity. We'll just put that on the back burner. Switch gears, Amber decided. She could all but see the tension twisting up the muscles in the back of his neck. You were up late with all your books last night. Anything interesting? Yeah, actually. I found a couple that go pretty deep into the history of the house, the family, the village, the business. How they're all connected. Symbiotic. Such a nice word. I like it. Land and whiskey got a boost during the Revolutionary War. With the blockades, the colonists couldn't get sugar, molasses, so no rum. Whiskey became the choice for the colonial army, and the Landons had their distillery. So George Washington drank your whiskey? Bet your ass. And after the war, they expanded both the business and the house. A big deal on the house, too, because Roger Landon, headstrong Violetta's and possibly murderous Edwin's father, who was in charge then, had a rep for being a cheapskate. A good frugal Yankee, a notorious skinflint. But he put what was pretty serious money into the house, furnishings, and into the business. When he died, his son took over. And since good old Raj didn't give it up until he was near 80, Edwin Landon had waited a good long time to take the reins. He expanded again, everything. He and his wife, the French emigre. Ooh la la. You bet. They were the first to start holding big elaborate parties. And one of their sons, Eli, I like him. You should. He built, had built, the first village school. His younger brother fell for the school teacher and they ran off together. Romance. Not so much. They were killed heading west to make their own fortune. That's very sad. In any case, Eli continued the tradition of expanding the house, the business, and the parties continued with some scandals and tragedies thrown in, up to prohibition. If things got lean, you wouldn't know it by the way they lived. The twenties roared into the thirties, and the government realized they had screwed up and banning whiskey was costing them one hell of a lot. People bellied back up to the bar, in the open, and we opened another distillery. The Whiskey Empire. Through it, we've had art connoisseurs, and those reputed to have had affairs with artists, Suicides, two who spied for the Allies, and plenty who died in various wars. A dancer who soared to fame in Paris, and another who ran away with the circus. I like that one especially. A duchess through marriage, a card sharp, a cavalry officer who died with Custer. Heroes, villains, a nun, two senators, doctors, lawyers. You name it, they're probably in there. It's a long line. Most people don't or can't trace their family back that far or have a place that's been in that family for so many generations. True enough. But do you know what's missing? A suffragette? A playboy bunny? A rock star? He laughed. We had some of the first. I didn't come across any of the other two. What's missing is Esmeralda's dowry. 
It's mentioned along with the Calypso, the wreck, some speculation on Broom. Did he survive or was the survivor a simple seaman? Speculation again on the dowry. Did it survive? But in these two most in-depth and sensible histories I've come across, the weight's on no. That doesn't mean they're right. I prefer believing it survived. Just like in my version, the young brother and schoolteacher made their way west and plowed fields and made babies. They drowned when their wagon tipped over crossing a river. They planted corn and had eight children. I'm firm on that. Okay. Either way, he thought, they'd been dead a very long time. On the dowry, it makes me wonder again, what information Suskind has that I don't? What makes him so sure that he'd risk so much that he'd kill? Or is it all just bullshit? What do you mean? What if it has nothing to do with the long-lost treasure? I just jumped there automatically. Somebody digging in the basement. What else? Exactly, Eli. Puzzled, she turned to study his profile. What else? I don't know. Nothing I've found takes me anywhere else. But nothing I've found realistically takes me there either. He glanced at her. I think he's just fucking batshit. That worries you. Damn right it does. You can't reason with crazy. You can't predict it. You can't really plan for it. I'm going to disagree. Okay, and? I'm not saying he isn't twisted. I think anyone who takes a life, unless it's in defense of self or another, is twisted. But you know, it's verified that he and Lindsay were involved. Yeah. Yeah, he repeated. And she wouldn't go for crazy. Not overtly crazy. But people can't hide their nature. Do you think so? I just don't, at least not for long. I think what we are shows. Not just in our actions, but in our face, our eyes. He's worked on this for more than a year and a half, closer to two years now, as far as we know. Getting close to Lindsay. Talking her into driving to Whiskey Beach when she didn't like it so there's probably some charm in there. He's also juggling a wife, children, a job. Twisted, I think, yes, but not batshit. Batshit's out of control. He's still maintaining. Twisted's bad enough. When they fought their way into Boston traffic, he turned to her again. You sure about this? I'm not sitting in the car, Eli, forget that. I think we should drive by her house first. If there's no car, we can check her work. She's part-time, so it's a toss-up. So much energy in the city. I love it for a day or two. Then, boy, I want out. I used to think I needed it. Not anymore. Whiskey Beach is good for a rider. It's good for me. He laid a hand over hers. So are you. She brought his hand to her cheek. The perfect thing to say. He followed the GPS, though he thought he could have found the house. He knew the area, actually had friends, or former friends, who lived there. He found the pretty Victorian, painted pale yellow, with a bay window on the side where stairs led down from a deck. A BMW sedan sat in the drive, and a woman in a wide-brimmed hat was watering pots of flowers on the side deck. Looks like she's home. Yeah, let's do this. The woman set down her watering can as they pulled in behind the BMW and came to the edge of the deck. Hello, can I help you? Mrs. Suskind? That's right. Eli walked to the base of the steps. I wonder if you have a few minutes to talk to me. I'm Eli Landon. Her lips parted, but she didn't step back. I thought I recognized you. Her gaze, calm and brown, slid to Abra. This is Abra Walsh. I realize this is an intrusion, Mrs. Suskind. She let out a long sigh, and sadness moved in and out of her eyes. Your wife, my husband. That should put us on a first-name basis. It's Eden. Come on up. Thank you. There was an investigator here last week, and now you. She pulled off her hat, ran her hand over a sunny swing of hair. Don't you want to put it behind you? 
Yes, very much. I can't. I didn't kill Lindsay. I don't care. That sounds horrible. It is horrible. But I can't care. You should sit down. I've got some iced tea. Can I help you with it? Abra asked her. No, that's fine. Then would you mind if I used your bathroom? We drove down from Whiskey Beach. Oh, you have a home there, don't you? She said to Eli, then gestured to Abra. I'll show you. It gave Eli a chance to gauge the ground. An attractive woman, he thought. An attractive house in an upscale neighborhood, with well-tended gardens, a thick green lawn. About fifteen years of marriage, he recalled, and two attractive kids. But Suskind had tossed it all aside. For Lindsay, he wondered. Or for an obsessive treasure hunt. A few moments later, both Eden and Abra came out again with a tray holding a pitcher and a trio of tall square glasses. Thanks, Eli began. I know this has been hard for you. You would know. It's terrible to realize the person you trust, the person you've built a life with, a home with, a family with, has betrayed you, has lied. That the person you love betrayed that love and made a fool of you. She sat at the round teak table under the shade of a deep blue umbrella, gestured them to join her. And Lindsay, Eden continued, I considered her a friend. I saw her almost every day, often worked with her, had drinks with her, talked about husbands with her. And all the time she was sleeping with mine. It was like being stabbed in the heart. For you too, I guess. We weren't together when I found out. It was more a kick in the gut. So much came out after. It had gone on nearly a year, months of lying to me, of coming home from her to me. It makes you feel so stupid. She addressed the last directly to Abra, and Eli saw Abra had been right. Another woman, a sympathetic one, made it all easier. But you weren't, Abra said. You trusted your husband and your friend. That's not stupid. I tell myself that but it makes you question yourself. What you lack, what don't you have, didn't you do? Why weren't you good enough? Abra put a hand over hers. It shouldn't, but I know. We have two kids, they're great kids, and this was devastating for them. People talk, we couldn't shield them from it, that was the worst. She sipped at her tea, fought visibly to conquer tears. We tried. Justin and I tried to hold it together, to make it work. We went to counseling, took a trip together. She shook her head. But we just couldn't put it back together. I tried to forgive him, and maybe I would have. But I couldn't trust him. Then it started again. I'm sorry. Now Abra squeezed her hand. Fool me once, Eden continued, blinking her eyes clear. Late nights at the office, business trips. Only this time he wasn't dealing with someone ready to be stupid or trusting. I'd check on him, and I knew he wasn't where he said he'd be. I don't know who she is, or if there's more than one. I don't care. I just don't care anymore. I have my life, my kids, and finally a little pride. And I'm not ashamed to say when I divorce him, I'm going to gut him like a fish. She let out a breath. A half laugh. I'm still pretty mad, obviously. I took him back after what he'd done, and he threw it in my face. So? I didn't have time to make that choice. Eli waited until Eden looked back up and over at him. I didn't have much time to be mad. Someone killed Lindsay the same day I'd found out what she'd done, what she'd been doing even when I thought we were trying to make our marriage work. Sympathy covered Eden's face as she nodded. I can't imagine what that's like. When I was at my lowest, when the news seemed to be round the clock about her death, the investigation, I tried to imagine what it would be like if Justin had been the one murdered. She pressed her fingers to her lips. That's terrible. I don't think so, Abra said quietly. 
But even at my lowest, I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't imagine how I'd feel in your place, Eli. She paused a moment, sipped her tea. You want me to tell you I lied to protect him? That he wasn't with me that night? I wish I could. God, I wish I could. She closed her eyes. I shouldn't think that way about him. We made two beautiful children together. But right now I wish I could tell you what you want to hear. The truth is, Justin came home that night about 5.30. No more than a few minutes after that. It all seemed so normal. He even kept his phone out, as he'd started to do the last several months. He said he was expecting an important email from work and might have to grab his overnight bag and head out. But it wouldn't be for a couple hours anyway, if that. Eden shook her head. I realized later, of course, he was waiting for a message from Lindsay, that they'd made plans to go away for a day or two. But that night I thought it was just the usual. The kids were both at school, a rehearsal for a play they were both in, and pizza after. It was nice, just the two of us, and the rain. I made dinner, chicken fajitas, and he made margaritas. We just had an easy evening, nothing special. Just enjoying ourselves as a couple before the kids came home and the noise came back. We were doing just that when the phone rang. It was Carly from the gallery. She'd seen a bullet on TV. She told me Lindsay was dead. That they said it might be foul play. A calico cat padded up the steps, leaped into her lap. Eden stroked it as she finished. I should have known then. Right then. He was so shaken. He went white. But I was so shocked too. And I was thinking about Lindsay, so I never thought... I never would have believed they'd been involved. When the police came, when they told me, I didn't believe it. Then I couldn't not believe it. I'm sorry, Eli. I'm so very sorry I can't help you. I appreciate you talking to me. It can't be easy. I'm putting it behind me, all of it, though it takes some doing. You should do the same. When they were back in the car, Abra rubbed a hand over his. I'm sorry, too. Now we know. And still... Something troubled him. Chapter 26 Kirby Duncan's office took up a square of miserly space in a scarred brick building that had bypassed any attempt at urban revitalization. It bumped against the cracked sidewalk with its first-floor display windows, touting psychic readings on one side, an adult toy shop on the other. Almost one-stop shopping, Abra considered. You can go to Madame Carlotta and find out if you're going to get lucky enough to consider dropping a few bucks in the red room. If you have to ask a psychic, you're probably not going to get lucky. I read tarot, she reminded him. It's an ancient and interesting form of seeking knowledge and self-awareness. It's cards. He opened the center door and stepped into a skinny lobby and steps leading up. I'm definitely doing a reading for you. Your mind's too closed off to possibilities, especially for a writer. As a lawyer, I defended an alleged psychic a few years back for bilking clients out of a considerable amount of money. People who bilk other people don't have a real gift or calling. Did you win? Yeah, only because her clients were wide open to possibilities and deeply stupid. She gave him a light elbow jab but she laughed. On the second level, frosted glass doors advertised Baxter Tremaine, attorney at law, something called Quickie Loans, another outfit called Allied Answering Service, and Kirby Duncan Private Investigation. Police tape crossed over Duncan's frosted glass. I hoped we could go in, look around. Open murder case, Eli shrugged. They want to keep the scene of the break-in secure. Wolf would be part of this. He doesn't let go easily. We can go down and talk to the psychic, see if Madame Carlotta has any insight. 
He spared her a glance, then walked to the lawyer's door. In the broom closet space of reception, a woman on the slippery end of 40 pecked industriously at a keyboard. She paused, pulled the gold cheaters from her face so they dangled by the braided chain around her neck. Good morning, can I help you? We're looking for information on Kirby Duncan. Though her law office smile stayed in place, she eyed both of them through cynical eyes. You're not cops. No, ma'am. We'd hope to consult with Mr. Duncan on a personal matter while we're in Boston. We just came by hoping he could squeeze us in, then saw the police tape over his door. Was there a break-in? Her eyes remained cynical, but she swiveled her chair around to face them more directly. Yes, the police haven't cleared the scene yet. That's too bad. And another reason not to live in the city. Abra put in with the faintest of southern drawls. Eli merely patted her arm. Is Mr. Duncan working out of another office? I should have called him, but I couldn't find his guard. I remembered where the office was. Maybe you could direct us to where he's working now, or maybe you have his number so we can call him? It won't do you any good. Mr. Duncan was shot and killed a few weeks ago. Oh, my God. Abra gripped Eli's arm. I want to go. I really just want to go home. Not here the receptionist qualified, and added with a thin smile, and not in the city. He was working up north, a place called Whiskey Beach. This is terrible, just terrible. Mr. Duncan helped me with a personal problem, the receptionist supplied. Yes, a couple of years ago. He was a nice guy, I'm really sorry. I guess you knew him. Sure, Kirby did some work for my boss from time to time and for the lone company across the hall. I'm really sorry, Eli repeated. Thanks for your help. He took a step back, stopped. But you said he was up north, but there was a break in here. I don't understand. The cops are working on that. It looks like whoever killed him came looking for something here. All I know is he told the boss he'd be in the field for a few days. The next thing I know, there's police tape on the door, and the cops are asking if I saw anything or anyone suspicious. I didn't, though you can get some of that here with people looking for help with personal problems. I guess. The way I hear it, it happened the same night he was killed, or most likely, so there wouldn't have been anyone around to see anything. So, I can give you a referral to another investigator. I just want to go. Abra tucked at Eli's hand. Can we just go home, deal with this there? Yeah, all right. Thanks anyway. It's a real shame. When they stepped out, Eli considered trying one of the other two offices, but he didn't see the point. Abra stayed quiet until they headed down the stairs. You're really good at that. At what? Lying. Prevaricating. Is that what lawyers call it? No, we call it lying. She laughed, bumped shoulders with him. I don't know what I expected to find out coming here. The break-in happened either really late at night or early in the morning. No one would have seen anything. I got something out of it. Share, she insisted as they got back in the car. If we go with the theory Suskind hired Duncan, you've got an upper-middle-class type. A suit type, family in a big house in the pretty burbs type. Status is important to him. But when he hires an investigator, he goes down market. Maybe someone recommended him. I doubt it. I think he didn't want high end with high rates for two reasons. One, he didn't want anyone who might have done work for anyone in his own circle. Two, and I think more telling, he'd be hit with a lot of expenses. He bought a beach house. Abra began, an investment toward the jackpot, and he attempts at least to hide his ownership. Because he knows he's headed for a divorce. The man's a worm, Abra stated. On the karma wheel, he'll come back as a slug next. I'm open to that possibility, Eli decided. In his current slot on the karma wheel, he's going to have legal fees, and he'll go high end there. Child support, marital settlement... I'm thinking he paid Duncan in cash to keep it off the books. 
No record of the outlay when he has to show his finances to the lawyers. He still had to break in, search, because an investigator's going to keep records of clients, even cash transactions. Files, electronic or paper, copies of cash receipts, a logbook, client list. Eli agreed. He wouldn't want to be connected as a client of an investigator hired to shadow me, who'd ended up dead. Very sticky. Very. She considered. He probably never came here, did he, to the office? Probably not. He'd want to meet somewhere like a coffee shop or bar. Not in his area or Duncan's. Eli pulled up at another building, steel and block. This is where he lived? Second floor, dicey area. What does that tell you? The Duncan felt he could handle himself? Wasn't worried about his car getting stripped, his neighbors screwing with him. Tough guy, maybe. Or just one who figured he knew the score and how to play the game. Someone like that wouldn't think twice about meeting a client alone. Do you want to go in, talk to some of the neighbors? No point. The cops would have already. Suskind wouldn't have come here other than to go through the apartment. Not only because he wouldn't have a reason to meet Duncan here, but because this area would scare him. South Boston's not his turf. It's not yours either, Whiskey Baron. That's my father, or my sister, the Baroness. Anyway, I've done some pro bono work out of Southie. Not my turf, no, but not uncharted territory. Well, I guess we hit the highlights, or more like the lowlights. He was just doing his job, Abra said. I didn't like him, or didn't like the way he was doing his job the time he talked to me but he didn't deserve to die for doing this job. No, he didn't. But you could consider he's getting another spin on the karma wheel. I know pandering when I hear it, but well done. And I'll do just that. There you go. Let's go see how Gran's doing before we head back. Would you drive me by the house where you lived with Lindsay? Why? So I can get a sense of who you were. He hesitated, then thought, why not? Why not do the full circle? Okay. It felt odd to travel those roads, to head in that direction. He hadn't been by the house in the back bay since he'd been allowed to clear out what he wanted. Once he had, he'd hired a company to sell the rest. Then he'd put the house on the market. He thought cutting those ties would help, but he couldn't say it had. He passed shops and restaurants that had once been part of his routine, the bar where he'd often had drinks with friends, the day spa Lindsay had favored, the Chinese place with its incredible Kung Pao chicken and grinning delivery boy, the pretty trees and trim yards of what had once been his neighborhood. When he pulled up in front of the house, he said nothing. The new owners had added an ornamental tree to the front, something with weeping branches just starting to bloom in delicate pink. He saw a tricycle on the front walk, bright red and cheerful. The rest looked the same, didn't it? The same peaks and angles, the same glinting windows and wide front door. So why did it seem so foreign? It doesn't look like you, Abra said beside him. It doesn't? No, it doesn't. It's too ordinary. It's big and beautiful in its way. Beautiful like a stylish coat, but the coat doesn't fit you. At least it doesn't fit you now. Maybe it fit the you with the Hermes tie and Italian suit and lawyerly briefcase, who stopped in the local coffee shop for an overpriced specialty coffee while he answered texts on his phone. But that's not you. She turned to him. Was it? I guess it was. Or that was the road I was on, whether or not the coat fit. How about now? I don't want the coat back. He studied her. When the house finally sold a few months ago, it was a relief, like shedding a layer of skin that had gotten too tight. Is that why you wanted to come by here? So I'd admit that or see that? It's a nice side benefit, but primarily I was nosy. I had a coat not that different once. It felt good to give it to someone it suited more. Let's go see Hester. Another familiar route. 
from one home to another. As the distance increased from the back bay, the tension in his shoulders eased. Automatically, he stopped at the florist near his family home. I like to get her something. The good grandson. Pleased she got out with him. If I'd been thinking we could have gotten something in Whiskey Beach, she'd have gotten a kick out of that. Next time. Abra smiled as they went in. Next time. Abra wandered, leaving the selection to him. She wanted to see what he'd choose and how he'd go about it. She hoped he didn't go for the roses, however beautiful. Too expected, too usual. It pleased her when he went for the blue iris and mated them with some pink Asiatic lilies. That's perfect. It says spring and boldly. Very, very Hester. I want her home before the end of summer. Abra leaned her head against his shoulder while the florist rapped and rang. So do I. It's good to see you, Mr. Landon. The florist offered Eli a pen to sign the receipt. Give our best to your family. Thanks, I will. Why do you look so surprised? Abra asked as they started out. I got used to people I knew in my other life. We'll say, either pretending not to know me or just walking away. She rose on her toes to kiss his cheek. Not everyone's an asshole, she said. And they walked out to where Wolf stood by Eli's car. For a moment, past and present overlapped. Nice flowers. And legal, Abra said cheerfully. They have more nice ones inside if you're in the mood. You've got business in Boston? He asked, keeping his eyes on Eli. As a matter of fact, he started to step around Wolf to open the car door for Abra. Why don't you explain what business you had in Duncan's office building, asking questions? That's legal, too. Eli handed the flowers to Abra to free his hands. Some people can't resist going back to the scene of the crime. And some can't resist beating a dead horse. Is there anything else, detective? Just that I'm going to keep on digging. The horse isn't buried yet. Oh, that's just enough! Incensed, Abra shoved the flowers back at Eli, then dug into her bag. Here, take a look. This is the man who's been breaking into Bluff House. Abra, no! She rounded on Eli. Enough! This is the man I saw in the bar that night, and the man who most likely grabbed me when I was in Bluff House. This is the man who almost certainly killed Duncan Kirby, someone you knew, and then planted the gun in my house before making that anonymous call to you. And if you'd stop being ridiculous, you'd ask yourself why Justin Suskind bought a house in Whiskey Beach, why he hired Duncan, why he killed him. Maybe he didn't kill Lindsay, but maybe he did. Maybe he knows something because he's a criminal. So be a cop and do something about it. She grabbed the flowers back, wrenched open the door herself. Enough, she repeated, and slammed it shut. Your girlfriend's got a temper. You push buttons, detective. I'm going to visit my grandmother. Then I'm going back to Whiskey Beach. I'm going to live my life. You do whatever you have to do. He got in the car, yanked on his seatbelt, and drove away. I'm sorry. Leaning her head back, Abra closed her eyes a moment, tried to find her center again. I'm sorry, I probably made it worse. No, you didn't. You surprised him. And the sketch of Suskind surprised him. I don't know what he'll do about it, but you caught him off guard. Small consolation. I don't like him, and nothing he does or doesn't do is going to change that. Now... She let out a couple of long, deep breaths. Clear the air, settle the mind. I don't want Hester to see I'm upset. I thought it was mad. Not that different. It is when you do it. She thought that over as he turned the last corner to the Beacon Hill house. And this, she decided, was more Eli. Maybe because the house exuded to her the sense of history and generational family. She liked the feel of it, the lines, the landscape so long established, colored now with early spring bloomers. She put the flowers back in his hand as they walked to the door. 
the good grandson. And they went in to see Hester. They found her in her sitting room with a sketchbook, a glass of cold tea, and a small plate of cookies. Setting the sketchbook and her pencil aside, she held out both hands. Just what I needed to cheer up my day. You look tired, Eli said immediately. I have good reason. I just finished my daily physical therapy. You just missed meeting the Marquis de Sade. If it's too hard on you, we should... Oh, stop. She waved that away with one impatient flick of the wrist. Jim's wonderful and has a nice, sharp humor that keeps me on my toes. He knows what I can handle and how hard to push. But after a session, I'm tired out. Now I'm reviving seeing both of you and those gorgeous flowers. I thought I might have to step in, point Eli in the right direction, but it turns out he has excellent taste. Why don't I take them down to Carmel so we can put them in a vase for you? Thank you. Have you had lunch? We can all go down. Eli, give me a hand. Why don't you just sit for a while first? To close that deal, he sat himself. We'll go down after you recover from Desaad. He gave Abra a nod, then turned to Hester when she took the flowers out. You don't have to push so hard. You forget who you're talking to. Pushing hard is what gets things done. I'm glad you came. Glad you brought Abra. It's not as hard to come into Boston now. We're working on healing. Both of us. I didn't push very hard in the early days of it. Neither did I. We had to get some traction first. He smiled. I love you, Gran. You better. Your mother should be home in about two hours, though your father won't until after six. Are you going to stay to see your mother at least? That's the plan. Then we'll head back. I have a house and a dog to look after. Looking after things is good for you. We've come a long way, both of us, in the last few months. I thought I'd lost you. We all did. I guess I thought I'd lost myself. Yet here we are. Tell me how the book's coming. I think it's coming okay. Some days are better than others, and sometimes I think it's just crap. But either way, being able to write makes me wonder why I haven't done it all along. You had a talent for the law, Eli. It's a pity you couldn't make that your hobby. Or we could say a sideline. And writing your vocation. You could do that now. Maybe I could. I think we all know I'd have been lousy in the family business. Trisha was always the one to follow in those footsteps. And damn good at it. She is, but even though it wasn't for me, I've been learning more about it, or its history, paying more attention to all its roots and beginnings. Her eyes lit with approval. You've been spending time in the library at Bluff House. Yeah, I have. Your grandmother-in-law ran whiskey. She did? I wish I'd known her better. What I do remember is a feisty, hard-headed Irish woman. She intimidated me some. She must have been formidable to do that. She was. Your grandfather adored her. I've seen photos, quite the looker, and found more poking around Bluff House. But the roots of land and whiskey go back a lot further to the revolution. Innovation, the heart of gamblers, the head of businessmen, risk and reward, and the understanding people enjoy a good stiff drink. Of course, the war helped, as cold-blooded as that is. Fighting men needed whiskey. Wounded men needed it. In a very true way, land and whiskey was forged in a fight against tyranny and a quest for liberty. Spoken like a true Yankee. Abra came back with a vase of artfully arranged flowers. They are absolutely beautiful. They really are. Should I put them in here or in your bedroom? In here. I'm spending more time sitting than lying down these days, thank God. Now that Abra's back, why don't we talk about what you really want to know? You think you're smart, Eli said. I know I am. He grinned, nodded. 
We're winding around what I really want to know. My way of thinking is the history of the house, of the business, might have some part in the whole. I just haven't figured it all out. But we can jump forward a couple of centuries. I can't see his face. Hester fisted a hand in her lap. The emerald she often wore on her right hand fired at the gesture. I've tried everything I can think of, even meditation, which you know, Abra, I don't do particularly well. All I see or remember is shadows, movement, the impression of a man, that shape. I remember waking up, thinking I heard noises, then convincing myself I hadn't. I know I was wrong about that now. I remember getting up, going to the stairs, then the movement, the shape, the impression, and the instinct to get downstairs and away. That's all. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, Eli told her. It was dark. You may not remember a face because you didn't see it, or not distinctly enough. Tell me about the sounds you heard. I remember them better, or think I do. I thought I'd been dreaming, and may very well have been. I thought, squirrels in the chimney. We had them once long ago, but we put in guards, of course, since then. Then there was creaking, and half asleep I thought, who's upstairs? Then I woke up fully, decided I'd imagined it, and restless, finally decided to go downstairs for some tea. What about sense? Abra asked. Dust. Sweat, yes. Eyes closed, Hester focused. Odd, I didn't realize that until now, until you asked. If he came down from the third floor, is there anything up there, anything you can think of he would have been after? She shook her head at Eli. Most of what's up there is sentiment and history, and what no longer fits in the practical living space. There are some wonderful things. Clothes, keepsakes, journals, old household ledgers, photos. I've been through a lot of it. It's on my long-range plan to have a couple of experts in. Catalogue for, eventually, a Whiskey Beach Museum. What a wonderful idea! It made Abra beam. You never told me. It's still in the planning-to-plan stages. Household ledgers, Eli thought aloud. Yes, and account books, guest lists copies of invitations. I haven't been through everything for a long time, and honestly really never through it all. Things change, times change. Your grandfather and I didn't need a big staff after the children left, so we started using the third floor for storage. I tried painting up there for a year or two. There was only Bertie and Edna by the time Eli died. You must remember them, young Eli. Yeah, I do. When they retired, I didn't have the heart to have any live-ins. I only had the house and myself to look after. I can only think this person was up there out of curiosity, or hope to find something. Is there anything up there that goes back to the Landons from the time of the Calypso wreck? There must be. The Landons have always been ones for preserving. The more valuable items from that time, and others, are displayed throughout the house. But there would be some flotsam and jetsam on the third floor. Her eyebrows drew together as she tried to think. I neglected that area, I suppose. Just stopped seeing it, and told myself I'd get around to hiring those experts one day. He might have thought there'd be maps, which is foolish. If we'd known X marked the spot, we'd have dug up the dowry ourselves long before this. Or if he assumed there'd be a journal, one of Violetta Landon's, perhaps. But the story goes that after her brother killed her lover, she destroyed her journals, their love letters, and all of it. If indeed they existed. If they did and survived, I should have heard of them, or come across them at some point. Okay. 
Do you remember getting any calls, inquiries, having anyone come by asking about brokering some of the mementos, the antiques? Anyone asking for access because they were writing a story, a book? Lord Eli, I can't count the times. The only thing that's tempted me to hire anyone but Abra was the idea of having someone deal with the inquiries. Nothing that really stands out. No, nothing that comes to mind. Let me know if you think of anything. And she'd had enough, Eli judged, and looked a little pale again. What's for lunch? We should go down and find out. He helped her up, but when he started to lift her, she brushed him back. I don't need to be carried. I manage well enough with the cane. Maybe, but I like playing Rhett Butler. He wasn't carrying his grandmother downstairs to lunch, she said when Eli scooped her into his arms. But he would have. Abra retrieved the cane and as she watched Eli carry Hester downstairs, understood completely why she'd fallen in love. Chapter 27 A good day, Abra thought, when they said goodbye to Hester. She reached for Eli's hand to say exactly that as they walked to the car, then spotted Wolf leaning against his across the street. What is he doing? she demanded. Why? Does he think you're going to suddenly walk over there and confess all? He's letting me know he's there. Eli got behind the wheel, calmly started the engine. A little psychological warfare, and surprisingly effective. It got to the point last winter where I rarely left the house because if I went for a damn haircut, I couldn't be sure he wouldn't walk in and take the chair next to me. That's harassment technically, and yeah, we could have filed charges. But at that point, he'd have gotten a slap. Wouldn't really change anything. And the truth is, I was too damn tired to bother. It got easier to just stay put. You put yourself under house arrest. He hadn't thought of it that way. Not at the time. But she wasn't wrong. Just as he'd thought in some corner of his mind of his move to Whiskey Beach as a self-imposed exile. Those days were finished. I didn't have anywhere to go, he told her. Friends eased away or just vanished. My law firm let me go. What about that innocent until proven guilty tack? That's the law, but it doesn't hold much weight with important clients, reputations, and billable hours. They should have stuck by you, Eli, even if only out of principle. They had other associates, partners, clients, staff to consider. Initially, they called it a leave of absence, but I was done, and we all knew it. Anyway, it gave me the time and the reason to write, to try to focus on that. Don't turn it into them doing you a favor. Her voice snipped, sharp as scissors. You did yourself the favor. You did the positive. I grabbed a lifeline with writing, and it's more positive than letting go. When they didn't come to arrest me, and believe me, that was something I waited for every day, it gave me the chance to go to Bluff House. A kind of purging, Abra thought, a hulling out that had left him tired and tense, and, to her mind, entirely too willing to accept the hand dealt him. And now, she asked, now the lifeline's not enough. I can't just hold in place, wait for the fall. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to find the answers. When I have them, I'm going to stuff them down Wolf's throat. I love you. He glanced at her with a smile, but it faded into a look of wary surprise when he saw her eyes. Abra, uh-uh, better watch the road. At her gesture, he tapped the brakes before he rear-ended a hatchback. Terrible timing, she continued. Not romantic, not convenient. But I believe in expressing feelings, especially the positive ones. Love's the most positive feeling there is. I like feeling it, and I wasn't sure I would. We've got such crap behind us, Eli, and we can't help that some of it's still sticking to the bottom of our shoes. 
Maybe it helps make us who we are. But the bad thing is it makes us hesitate to trust again, reach out again, take those risks again. Amazing, she thought. Just amazing that saying the words out loud made her feel stronger, freer. I don't expect you to take those risks just because I did, but you should feel good. And you should feel lucky that a smart, self-aware, interesting woman loves you. He navigated the tricky traffic to squeeze his way onto 95 North. I do feel lucky, he told her, and panicked. Then that's enough. We need better tunes, she decided, and began to search and scan his satellite radio. That's it, he thought. I love you, let's change the channel. How the hell was a man supposed to keep up with a woman like that? She was a lot harder to negotiate than Boston traffic, and even more unpredictable. As the miles passed, he tried to think of something else, but his thoughts kept circling back to it like fingers seeking out a nagging itch. Eventually, he'd have to respond, somehow. They'd have to deal with the issue. And how the hell was he supposed to think clearly, rationally about love and all it implied, when he had so much else to deal with, to work through, to resolve? We need a plan, Abra said, and tossed him straight back into panic mode. God, your face. She couldn't stop the laugh. It's a study of barely restrained male terror. I don't mean an Abra loves Eli plan, so relax. I mean a Justin Suskind risked sneaking up to the third floor of Bluff House and Y plan. We need to systematically go through what's up there. I've started doing that a couple hours a day, every day, and I've barely made a dent. Have you seen how much is up there? That's why I said systematically. We stick with the stance he's after the dowry. We expand that by the reasonable assumption he has information, right or wrong, that caused him to dig in that area of the basement. And we can further expand that by logical speculation. He was looking for more information, another lead, something that confirms to his mind the location. Eli imagined there were a lot of invisible or missing dots, but all in all it wasn't a bad way to connect what they had. For all we know, he found what he was after. Maybe, but he's come back to the house since then. He still thinks the house is the key. Things weren't jumbled up. Eli thought it through. I don't know what kind of order things had in the trunks, the chests and storage boxes, the drawers and all that furniture up there. So they could have been searched through prior to the police. But if he did, he was careful about it. Then the cops went through it and now it's pretty jumbled up. How could he know someone wouldn't go up there and before he found what he wanted? He didn't want anyone to know he had access to the house. We wouldn't have known if we hadn't been wandering around the basement in the dark. We were wandering around the basement because he cut the power. That's a big clue to a B&E. Okay, that's a good point. But would you have searched down there? If you'd come home, called the police, it's really unlikely you'd have gone down to the basement looking for signs the intruder had been down there. Or if you did, it's not likely you'd have gone beyond the wine cellar. Okay, he took a calculated risk. Because he wants and needs the access. And maybe, if we do that systematic search, we'll find out more about why. We have to wait for him to come back before we can try the ambush agenda, she reminded him. We might as well do something active until. Uh, more active, she amended. I know you've been researching and cross-referencing and plotting out theories and connections, and the trip today gave us new information to process. But I like the idea of actually getting my hands into things. We can take a deeper look. And spending some time up there might give you more ideas about how to use that space. I'm going to pick you up a paint fan. You are. Colors inspire. No, he said after a moment. I can't keep up. With what? You. Relief when he finally cruised through the village tempered with frustration. Love to radio stations. Systematic searches to ambushes to paint fans. How many directions can you go in at one time? 
I can think in a lot of directions, especially if I consider them important, relevant, or interesting. Love is important, and certainly on a different level, I think music on a drive is important. Searching on the third floor and refining any plan to hopefully catch Suskind inside the house are absolutely relevant, and paint colors are interesting, and eventually both important and relevant. I surrender, he said as he pulled up and parked at Bluff House. Good choice. Abra got out of the car, spread her arms, turned a circle. I love the way it smells here, the way the air feels. I want to take a run on the beach and just fill myself with it. He couldn't take his eyes off her, couldn't block the lure of her. You matter to me, Abra. I know it. You matter more than anyone has. She lowered her arms. I hope so. But stop. She hauled her bag out of the car, shook back her hair. You don't have to qualify it. I'm not looking for you to balance the scales. Take the gift, Eli. If I gave it too soon or wrapped it the wrong way, it can't be helped. It's still a gift. She started for the door, and from inside, Barbie sent out a fury of barks. Your alarm is going off. I'll change and take her with me for that run. He got out his keys. I could use a run, too. Perfect. She said no more about it, and instead plowed straight on with the new agenda. They unpacked trunks, with Abra diligently inventorying the contents on a laptop. They weren't experts, she'd stated, but an organized itemization might help with Hester's hope for a museum. So they separated, studied, cataloged, and replaced, with Eli culling out the household ledgers, account books, and journals. He paged through them, making his own notes, outlining his own theory. She had to work, and so did he, but he adjusted his own schedule to include what he thought of as mining the past time. He added to his stack of household ledgers with meticulous recordings of purchases of fowl, beef, eggs, butter, and various vegetables from a local farmer named Henry Tribbett. Eli decided Farmer Tribbett was an ancestor of his drinking pal Stoney. He amused himself imagining Stoney wearing a farmer's straw hat and overalls when Barbie let out a warning woof and dashed out barking. He rose from the temporary workspace of card table and folding chair, started out. A moment after the barking stopped, Abra called up. It's just me. Don't come down if you're busy. I'm on three, he called back. Oh, I've got a few things to put away, then I'll be up. That sounded good, he admitted. To hear her voice break through the silence of the house, to know she'd come upstairs to join him, work with him, bring up bits and pieces of her day and the people in it. Whenever he tried to imagine his days without her in them, he remembered the dark cloud of time, his self-imposed house arrest where everything had been dull, colorless, heavy. He'd never go back there. He'd push too far into the light to ever go back. But he often thought the brightest light was now Abra. A short time later, he heard her coming up at a jog. He watched for her. She wore knee-length jeans and a red T-shirt that claimed, Yoga girls are twisted. Hi, I had a massage cancel, so... She stopped on her way to the table where he sat, anticipating her hello kiss. Oh, my God! What? He sprang up, ready to defend against anything, from a spider to a homicidal phantom. That dress! She all but leaped on the dress he'd left draped over the trunk he was cataloging. She snatched it up as his heart gratefully descended from his throat and rushed to the mirror she'd already undraped. As he'd seen her do with ball gowns, cocktail dresses, suits, and whatever else caught her fancy— she held up the boldly coral twenties-style dress with its low waist and knee-length fringed skirt. She turned right and left so the fringes lifted and twirled. Long, long pearls, masses of them, a matching cloche hat and a mile-long silver cigarette holder. Still holding it, she spun around. Imagine where this dress has been, dancing the Charleston at some fabulous party or some wild speakeasy. Riding in a Model T, 
drinking bathtub gin and bootleg whiskey. She spun again. The woman who wore this, she was daring, even a little reckless, and absolutely sure of herself. It suits you. Thanks, because it's fabulous. You know with what we've found and cataloged already, you could have a fashion museum right up here? I'll take the option of a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Men would be men, she supposed, and she had no desire to change that status. Okay, not here, but you definitely have enough for a fantastic display in Hester's museum. One day. Unlike Eli, she carefully folded the dress with tissue. I checked the telescope before I came up. He's still a no-show. He'll be back. I know it, but I hate waiting. Belatedly, she walked over to kiss him. Why aren't you writing? It's early for you to stop for the day. I finished the first draft, so I'm taking a break, letting it cook a little. You finished it? She threw her arms around his neck, shook her hips. That's fantastic. Why aren't we celebrating? A first draft isn't a book. Of course it is. It's just a book waiting for refinement. How do you feel about it? Like it needs refinement, but pretty good. The end went quicker than I'd expected. Once I really saw it, it moved. We're absolutely celebrating. I'm going to make something amazing for dinner and put a bottle of champagne from the butler's pantry on ice. Thrilled for him, she dropped onto his lap. I'm so proud of you. You haven't read it yet. Just one scene. It doesn't matter. You finished it. How many pages? Right now, 543. You wrote 543 pages, and you did that through a personal nightmare. You did that during a major transition in your life, through continuing conflict and stress and upheaval. If you're not proud of yourself, you're either annoyingly modest or stupid. Which is it? She lifted him, he realized. She just lifted him. I guess I'd better say I'm proud of myself. Much better. She kissed him noisily, then wrapped her arms around his neck again. By this time next year, your book will be published, or on its way to publication. Your name's going to be cleared, and you'll have all the answers to all the questions hanging over you and Bluff House. I like your optimism. Not optimism alone. I did a tarot reading. Oh, well then, let's spend my staggering advance on a trip to Belize. I'll take it. She leaned back. Optimism and a tarot reading equal a very powerful force, Mr. Mired in reality, especially when you add effort and sweat. Why Belize? No clue. It was the first thing to pop into my mind. Often the first things are the best things. Anything interesting today? Nothing that pertains to the dowry. Well, we still have plenty to go through. I'll start on another trunk. She worked alongside him, then decided to change gears, abandon the trunk and work her way through an old chest of drawers. It was amazing what people kept, she thought. Old table runners, faded pieces of embroidery or needlepoint, children's drawings on paper so dry she feared it would break and crumble in her hands. She found a collection of records she thought might be from the same era as the gorgeous coral dress. Amused, she uncovered a gramophone, wound it up, and set the record to play. She grinned over at Eli as the scratchy, tinny music filled the room. She did some jazz hands, a quick shimmy, and had him grinning back. You ought to put the dress on. She winked at him. Maybe later. She danced back to the chest of drawers, opened the next drawer. She made piles. So much unused or partially used fabric, she noted, arranging them in neat piles. Someone had used the chest of drawers for sewing at one time, she thought, storing silks and brocades, fine wools and satins. Surely some lovely dresses had come from this, and others simply planned and never realized. When she reached the bottom drawer, it stuck halfway open. After a couple of tugs, she lifted out scraps of fabric and an envelope of pins, an old pincushion fashioned to resemble a ripe red tomato, a tin box of various threads. Oh, patterns, from the thirties and forties. Carefully, she lifted them out. Shirtwaists and evening gowns. 
Oh, God, just look at this sundress. You go ahead. She barely spared him a glance. They're wonderful. This whole project has made me wonder why I never tried vintage clothing before. I wonder if I can make this sundress. Make a dress? He flicked her a glance. I thought that's what stores were for. In that yellow silk with the little violets, maybe. I've never sewn a dress, but I'd love to try it. Be my guest. I could even try on that old sewing machine we found up here, just to keep it all vintage. Imagining it, she stacked the patterns, turned back to the empty drawer. It's stuck, she muttered. Maybe something's caught. Angling herself, she reached in, searched the bottom of the drawer above for a blockage, then the sides, then the back. I guess it's just jammed or warped or... Then her fingers trailed over what felt like a curve of metal. Something's back here in the corner, she told Eli. In both corners, she discovered. I'll look in a minute. I can't see why it's hanging up the drawer, it's just... Impatient, she pushed at the corners, and the drawer slid out, nearly into her lap. Eli glanced up again at her surprised, Oh! Are you okay? Yes, just bumped my knees a little. It's like a compartment, Eli. A secret compartment in the back of this drawer. Yeah, I've found a few of those in desks, and one in an old buffet. But did you find anything in them like this? She held up a wooden box, deeply carved with a stylized looping L. Not so far. Intrigued now, he stopped his inventory when she brought the box to the table. It's locked. Maybe the key's in the collection we've been compiling, more of which I found in the hidden drawer in the old buffet. She glanced over at the jar they were using to store keys found during the third floor rummage, then just pulled a pin out of her hair. Let's try this first. He had to laugh. Seriously? You're going to pick the lock with a hairpin? It's the classic way, isn't it? And how complicated can it be? She bent the pin, slid it in, turned, wiggled, turned. Since she seemed determined to open the box, Eli started to get up for the jar, then heard the quiet click. You've done this before? Not since I was 13 and lost the key to my diary but some skills stay with you. She lifted the lid, found a cache of letters. They'd come across letters before, most of them as long and winding as the distance between Whiskey Beach and Boston or New York. Some from soldiers gone to war, she thought, or daughters married and settled far away. She hoped for love letters, as she'd yet to find any. The paper looks old, she said as she carefully took them out, Written with a quill, I think. And, yes, here's a date. June 5th, 1821. Written to Edwin Landon. That would have been Violetta's brother. Eli pushed his own work aside, shifted to look. He'd have been in his sixties. He died in... He scoured his mind for the family history he'd poured over. I think 1830-something. Early in that decade, anyway. Who's it from? James J. Fitzgerald of Cambridge. Eli noted it down. Can you read it? I think so. Sir, I regret the unfortunate circumstances and tenor of our meeting last winter. It was not my intention to intrude upon your privacy or your goodwill. While you made your opinions and decision most, most abundantly clear at that time, I feel it imperative I write to you now on behalf, no, behest of my mother and your sister, Violetta Landon Fitzgerald. Abra stopped, eyes huge as they met Eli's. Eli? Keep reading. He rose to go study the letter over her shoulder. There's no record in the family history of her marrying or having children. Keep reading, he repeated. As I communicated to you in January, your sister is most grievously ill. Our situation continues to be difficult 
with the debts incurred at my father's death two years past. My employment as a clerk for Andrew Grandin Esquire brings me an honest wage, and with it I have well supported my wife and family. I am now, of course, seeing to my mother's needs in addition to attempting to reconcile the debts. I do not and would not presume to approach you for financial aid on my own behalf, but must again do so in your sister's name. As her health continues grave, the doctors urge us to remove her from the city and to the shore, where they believe the sea air would be most beneficial. I fear she will not live to see another winter should the current situation continue. It is your sister's most heartfelt wish to return to Whiskey Beach, to return to the home where she was born and which holds so many memories for her. I appeal to you, sir, not as an uncle. You have my word I will never ask for consideration for myself due to that familial connection. I appeal to you as a brother whose only sister's wish is to come home. Mindful of its fragility, Abra set the letter aside. Oh, Eli. She laughed. Wait, let me think. He straightened, began to wander the room. There's no record of her marriage, any children, of her death. Not in family records, anyway. And I've never heard of this Fitzgerald connection. Her father had records destroyed, didn't he? That's what's been passed down, yeah. She ran off, and he not only cut her off, he basically eliminated all records. He must have been a small, ugly man. Tall, dark, and handsome in his portraits, Eli corrected. But you mean inside, and you're probably right. So Violetta left here, estranged from the family, and went to Boston or Cambridge, and they disowned her. At some point she married, had children, at least this son, was Fitzgerald the survivor of the Calypso? An Irish name, not a Spanish one. He could have been impressed. Is that the term? Or just as likely she met and married him after she left home. Was there really never any attempt to reconcile until this? Until she was dying? I don't know. Some of the stories speculate she ran away with a lover. Most just speculate she ran off after her lover was killed by her brother. During this research, I've come across a couple of speculations. She was shipped off because she was pregnant, and then disowned because she wouldn't fall in line. Basically, they erased her, so there are no family records or mentions of her after the late 1770s. Now that we have this, we can do a search for James J. Fitzgerald, Cambridge, and work back from there. Eli, the next letter, it's written in September of the same year. Another plea... She's worse and the debts are mounting up. He says his mother's too weak to hold a pen and write herself. He writes her words for her. Oh, it breaks my heart. Brother, let there be forgiveness. I do not wish to meet God with this enmity between us. I beseech you, with the love we once shared so joyfully, to allow me to come home to die, to allow my son to know my brother, the brother I cherished, and who cherished me before that horrible day. I have asked God to forgive me for my sins and for yours. Can you not forgive me, Edwin, as I forgive you? Forgive me and bring me home. She wiped tears from her cheeks. But he didn't, did he? The third letter, the last. It stated January 6th. Violetta Landon Fitzgerald departed this world on this day at the hour of six. She suffered greatly in the last months of her time on this earth. This suffering, sir, is on your hands. May God forgive you, for I shall not. On her deathbed, she related to me all that occurred in those last days of August in the year 1774. She confessed her sins to me, the sins of a young girl, and yours, sir. She suffered and died wishing for the home of her birth and her blood, and for the embrace of family refused her. 
I will not forget, nor will any of my blood. You have your riches and hold them dearer than her life. You will not see her again, nor meet with her in heaven. For your actions you are damned, as are all the Landons who spring from you. She set the last letter with the others. I agree with him. By all accounts, Edwin Landon and his father were hard men, uncompromising. I'd say these letters bear that out, and more. We don't know if Edwin responded, or what he wrote if he did. But it's clear both he and Violetta sinned in August of 1774, five months after the Calypso wrecked on Whiskey Beach. We need to search for information on James Fitzgerald. We need a date of birth. You think she was pregnant when she left, or was disowned? I think that's the kind of sin men like Roger and Edwin Landon would condemn. And I think, given the times, their rise in society, in status, in business, a daughter pregnant with the child of someone less, someone outside the law, untenable. He walked back to her, studied the letter again, the signature. James would have been a common name, a popular one. Sons are often named for fathers. You think her lover, the seaman from the Calypso, was James Fitzgerald? No. I think her lover was Nathaniel James Broom, and he survived the wreck of his ship, along with Esmeralda's dowry. Broom's middle name was James? Yeah. Whoever Fitzgerald was, I'm betting she was pregnant when she married him. Broom might have run off with her, changed his name. Eli ran a hand down her hair absently, remembering how she'd given the doomed schoolteacher and long ago Landon a happy ending. I don't think so. The man was a pirate, fairly notorious. I don't see him settling down quietly in Cambridge, raising a son who becomes a clerk. And he'd never have let the Landons have the dowry. Edwin killed him, that's how I see it. Killed him, took the dowry, tossed his sister out. For money? At the bottom of it, they cast her out? Erased her for money? She took for a lover a known brigand, a killer, a thief, a man who would certainly have been hanged if caught. The Landons are accumulating wealth, social prestige, and some political power. Now their daughter, whom they'd have married to the son of another wealthy family, is ruined. They may be ruined as well if it becomes known that they harbored or had knowledge of a wanted man being harbored. She, the situation, her condition needed to be dealt with. Dealt with? Dealt with! I'm not agreeing with what was done. I'm outlining their position and probable actions. Lawyer Landon. No, he wouldn't be one of my favorite people. Lawyer Landon's just stating their case, the case of men of that era, that mindset. Daughters were property, Abra. It wasn't right, but it's history. Now, instead of being an asset, she was a liability. I don't think I can listen to this. Get a grip on yourself, he suggested when she pushed to her feet. I'm talking about the late 18th century. You sound like you're okay with it. It's history, and the only way I can try to get a clear picture is to think logically and not emotionally. I like emotion better. You're good at it. So they'd use that too, he decided, both emotion and logic. Okay. What does your emotion tell you happened? That Roger Landon was a selfish, unfeeling bastard, and his son Edwin a heartless son of a bitch. They had no right to throw away a life the way they threw away Violetta's. And it's not just history. It's people. Abra, you realize we're arguing about someone who died nearly 200 years ago? And your point? He rubbed his hands over his face. Why don't we say this? We reached the same basic conclusion. Part of that conclusion is Roger and Edwin Landon were cold-hearted, hard-minded, opportunistic bastards. That's a little better. Her eyes narrowed. Opportunistic? You really believe not only the dowry existed, not only that it came ashore with Broom, but that Edwin killed Broom and stole the dowry? 
Well, it was already stolen property, but yeah, I think he found it, took it. Then where the hell is it? Working on that. But all this is moot if the basic premise is wrong. I need to start tracing Violetta's son. How? I can do it myself, which would take time because it's not my field. But there are plenty of tools, some good genealogy sites. Or I can save time and contact someone whose field it is. I know a guy. We were friendly once. She understood. Someone who'd turned his back on Eli. And she realized, however logical his argument, he understood what Violetta had gone through. He knew what it was to be cast aside, condemned, ignored. Are you sure you want to do that? I thought about doing it weeks ago, but I put it off. Because, no, I don't really want to do it. But I'll try to take a page out of Violetta's book. When the chips are down, it's better to forgive. She moved to him, took his face in her hands. You're going to get that celebration after all. In fact, I'm going to go down and start on that. We should put those letters somewhere safe. I'll take care of it. Eli, why do you think Edwin kept the letters? I don't know, except Landons tend to keep things. The chest of drawers may have been his, and putting them in that hidden niche might have been his way of keeping them but not seeing them. Out of sight, out of mind, like Violetta. Abra nodded. What a sad man he must have been. Sad? Eli thought when she left. He doubted it. He thought Edwin Landon would have been a self-satisfied son of a bitch. No family tree grew without a few bent branches, he supposed. He used his laptop to search for the contact number for an old friend, then took out his phone. Forgiveness, he discovered, didn't come easy. But expediency did. Maybe forgiveness would follow. And if not, he'd still have answers. Chapter 28 With her hair bundled up, her sleeves hiked to her elbows, Abra looked up from layering slices of potato in a casserole dish when Eli came into the kitchen. How'd that go? Awkward. I'm sorry, Eli. He only shrugged. More awkward for him than for me, I think. Actually, I knew his wife better. She's a paralegal at my old firm. He teaches history at Harvard and sidelines and genealogy. We play basketball a couple of times a month, downed a few beers here and there, that's all. That was enough, to Abra's mind, to deserve a little loyalty and compassion. Anyway, after the initial stumbling around and that strained and over-enthusiastic, good to hear from you, Eli, he agreed to do it. In fact, I think he feels guilty enough to make it a priority. Good, it helps balance the scales. Then why do I want to punch something? She considered the potato she just sliced in several vicious whacks. She knew exactly how he felt. Why don't you go pump some iron instead? Work up an appetite for stuffed pork chops, scalloped potatoes, and green beans almondine. A manly celebration meal. Maybe I will. I should feed the dog. Already done. She's now stretched out on the terrace watching people play in what she considers her yard. I should give you a hand. Do I look like I need one? He had to smile. No, you don't. Go pump it up. I like my men ripped. In that case, I might be a while. He sweated out the frustration and the depression that wanted to walk hand in hand. And once he'd showered off the dregs, he found he could let it go. He had what he needed, an expert to solve a problem. If guilt helped solve the problem, it didn't and shouldn't matter. On impulse, he took Barbie for a walk into the village. It struck him that people spoke to him called him by name, asked how he was doing without any of the wariness, the awkwardness he'd become so accustomed to. He bought a bouquet of tulips the color of eggplant. On the way back, he waved to Stony Tribbett as the old man strolled toward the village pub. Buy you a beer, boy? Not tonight, Eli called back. I've got dinner waiting, but keep a stool open for me Friday night. You got it. And that, Eli realized, made Whiskey Beach home. A stool at the bar on Friday night, a casual wave, dinner on the stove, 
and knowing the woman you cared for would smile when you gave her purple tulips. And she did. The tulips stood along with candles on the terrace table with the surf crashing, the stars winking on. Champagne bubbled, and right there, right then, Eli felt all was right with his world. He'd come back, he thought, shed the too tight skin, turned the corner, rounded the circle, whatever analogy worked. He was where he wanted to be, with the woman he wanted to be with, and doing what made him feel whole and real. He had colored lights and wind chimes on the terrace, pots of flowers and a dog napping at the top of the beach steps. This is... Abra lifted her eyebrows. What? Just right. Just exactly right. And when she smiled at him again, it was just exactly right. Later, when the house lay quiet and his body still thrummed from hers, he couldn't say why sleep eluded him. He listened to the rhythm of Abra's breathing and the muffled yips from Barbie as she dreamed, he imagined, of chasing a bright red ball into the water. He listened to Bluff House settle and imagined his grandmother wakened late at night by noises that didn't fit the pattern. Restless, he rose, thought to go down for a book. Instead, he climbed up to the third floor to the stack of ledgers. He sat at the card table with his legal pad, his laptop. For the next two hours, he read, calculated, checked dates, cross-referenced from household accounting to business accounting. When his head throbbed, he rubbed his eyes and kept going. He'd studied law, he reminded himself. Criminal law, not business law, not accounting or management. He should pass this to his father, to his sister. But he couldn't let go of it. At three in the morning, he pushed away. His eyes felt as though he'd scrubbed his corneas with sandpaper, and a toothy vice clamped over his temples and the back of his neck. But he thought he knew. He thought he understood. Wanting time to process, he went downstairs, dug aspirin out of the kitchen cabinet. He downed them with water he drank like a man dying of thirst before walking out onto the terrace. The air glided over him like a bomb and smelled of sea and flowers. Starlight showered, and the moon, waxing toward full, pulsed against the night sky. And on the cliff, above the rocks where men had died, Whiskey Beach Light circled its hopeful beam. Eli? In a robe as white as the moon, Abra stepped out. Can't sleep? No. The air rippled her robe, danced through her hair, and the moonlight glowed in her eyes. When, he wondered, had she become so beautiful? I have some tea that might help. She came to him, automatically reached up to rub at his shoulders, seek out tension. When her eyes met his, her look of concern turned to one of curiosity. What is it? A lot of things. A lot of big unexpected things in one even more unexpected bunch. Why don't you sit down? I'll work on these shoulders and you can tell me. No. He took her hands, held them between his. I'll just tell you. I love you, too. Oh, Eli. She gripped his fingers with hers. I know. Not the reaction he'd expected. In fact, he thought it was a little irritating. Really? Yes, <laughs> but God. Her breath caught as she wrapped her arms around him, held tight with her face pressed to his shoulder. God, it's so wonderful to hear you say it. I told myself it would be okay if you didn't say it, but I didn't know it would feel like this to hear it. How could I know? If I had, I'd have hounded you like a wolf to drag those words out of you. If I didn't say it, how do you know? When you touch me, when you look at me, when you hold me, I feel it. She looked up at him, eyes drenched. And I couldn't love you this much without you loving me back. I couldn't know how right it is to be with you if I didn't know you loved me. He brushed at her hair, all those tumbled curls, 
and wondered how he'd ever gotten through a single day without her. So you were just waiting for me to catch up? I was just waiting for you, Eli. I think I've been waiting for you ever since I came to Whiskey Beach, because you're all that was missing. You're what's right. He laid his lips on hers. What's just right? It scared the hell out of me at first. I know me too. But now... Tears spilled out of mermaid eyes and sparkled in the moonlight. I feel absolutely courageous. What about you? I feel happy. Struck with tenderness, he kissed the tears away. I want to make you as happy as I am. You do. It's a good night, or day, I guess. Another really good day. She pressed her lips to his again. Let's give each other lots more good days. That's a promise. And Landons keep their promises, she thought. Overwhelmed, she wrapped around him again. We found each other, Eli. Just when, just where, we were supposed to. Is that a karma thing? She drew back to laugh up at him. You're damn right it is. Is this why you couldn't sleep? Because you suddenly accepted your karmic path and wanted to tell me? No. Actually, I didn't know I was going to say it until you walked out here. One look at you and it blew through me, all of it. We should go back to bed. Her smile was full of promise. I bet I can help you sleep. There's another reason I love you. You always have really good ideas. But as he took her hand, he remembered... Jesus, I got caught up. A habit of yours. No, I mean I forgot why I came out here in the first place. Why I couldn't sleep. I went up and started working on the books, the ledgers, the accounts. All those numbers and columns. Instinctively, she reached up to rub at temples she imagined ached. You should have nodded off inside five minutes. I found it, Abra. I found Esmeralda's dowry. What? How? Oh, my God, Eli, you're a genius. She grabbed him, circled and swayed. Where? It's here. But here where? And do I need a shovel? Oh, oh, we have to take it to Hester. To your family, it needs to be protected and... There must be a way to trace Esmeralda's descendants. Make them a part of the discovery. Hester's museum. Can you imagine what this means to Whiskey Beach? Talk about running with it, he commented. Well, Eli, think of it. Treasure, unearthed after more than two centuries. You could write another book about it. And just think of all the people who'll be able to see it now. Your family could lend pieces to the Smithsonian, the Met, the Louvre. That's what you do? Donate, lend, display? Well, yes. It belongs to the ages, doesn't it? One way or the other... Fascinated by her, he studied her glowing face. Don't you want it? Even a piece of it? Oh, well, now that you mention it, I wouldn't say no to one tasteful piece. She laughed, spun in a circle. Oh, just think of the history, the mystery solved, the magic uncorked. She stopped, laughed again. Where the hell is it? And how fast can we get it and secure it? He turned her, gestured. We've already got it. It's already secured. Abra, it's Bluff House. What? I don't understand. My ancestors weren't as altruistic or philanthropic as you. They not only kept it, they spent it. He gestured toward the house. Built not just on whiskey, but pirate booty. The expansion of the distillery, the timing of it, the expansion of the house, those first innovations, the lumber, the stone, the labor. You're saying they sold the dowry to expand the business? To build the house? In pieces, I think, if I'm reading all the accounting right. Over a generation or two, starting with the cold-hearted Roger and Edwin. Oh, I have to adjust. She pushed at her hair, and he imagined pushed back her excited thoughts of museums and sharing. Bluff House, 
is Esmeralda's dowry. Essentially. It doesn't add up otherwise. Not if you really dig into the expenditures, the revenue. Family lore says gambling. They liked to gamble and they were lucky. And they were smart businessmen. Then the war, the buildup of the country, all of that, yeah. But gamblers need a stake. You sure it was the dowry? It's logical. I want Trisha to take a look, to analyze. And I want to hear back on James Fitzgerald. It adds up, Abra. It's in the walls, the stone, the glass, the gables. They accounted for it in their own way, Roger and Edwin, because they considered it theirs. Yes. She nodded at that. Men who could cut a daughter, a sister, so completely out of their lives would consider it theirs. I see that. Broom came with it to Whiskey Beach, and Whiskey Beach was theirs. They gave him shelter, and he disgraced their daughter, their sister. So they took what he stole and built what they wanted. Ruthless, she murmured. Ruthless and wrong, but it's poetic too, isn't it? She leaned a head on his shoulder. And in a way, a happy ending. How do you feel about it? Maybe a lot of it was built on blood and betrayal. You can't change history, so you live with it. The house weathered it, so did the family. It's a good house. It's a good family. I think both more than weathered history. Ruthless and wrong, he repeated. And I can be sorry for that. Lindsay's murder was ruthless and wrong. All I can do about any of it is try to find out the truth. Maybe that's justice. That's why I love you, she said quietly. Just that. It's too early to call Trisha, and I don't think either of us is going to get any more sleep. I'm going to make us some eggs. That's why I love you. On a laugh, he turned to her, pulled her in, and as his gaze drifted over her head, he went still. He saw, down at the point, a shimmer of light. Wait. He moved quickly to the telescope, peered through. Straightening, he looked back at Abra. He's back. With a hand gripped on his arm, she looked for herself. I kept wishing for this so it could be done and over, but now that it is... She took a moment to evaluate. I feel the same way. Now we do something. She sent him a cool, fierce smile. Let's break some eggs. While she did so literally, and Eli made coffee, it struck him it might have been any morning, even if it started at barely 5 a.m. Two people in love, and that was new and fresh and energizing, fixing breakfast. All you had to do was leave out the murderer. We could call Corbett. Abra said, rinsing berries in the sink. He could have that conversation. Yeah, we could. And that wouldn't accomplish much. A conversation over a man I saw in a bar. A man Lindsay cheated with, who bought property in Whiskey Beach. Which lawyer Landon tells me won't hold up in court. Eli studied her, set her coffee on the counter. It's a step. A small one, on a very slow walk and one that lets Suskai know you know. Doesn't that forearm him? A step that may spook him, even might influence him to leave Whiskey Beach. The threat here is eliminated while the investigation into Duncan's death continues, and we take the next steps to verifying the facts regarding the dowry. Edwin Landon, James Fitzgerald, and so on. Verifying the facts regarding is edging toward more lawyer talk. Even when I practiced law, Lawyer snark didn't bother me. She sliced some butter into a heated skillet, smiled at him while it sizzled. Such a fine line between truth and snark. In any case, action's more satisfying than snark. We've got a shot, Eli, at proving he's the one breaking into Bluff House. Prove that, and it not only leads to hanging him for Hester's fall, and that's huge, I think for both of us, but it adds weight to his association with Duncan. Link them together, and it's a short slide to incriminating him for murder. A lot of soft spots on that path. She poured beaten eggs into the skillet. 
They hounded you for over a year over Lindsay's death, with less cause, with no evidence. I say we give karma a hand, and let the man who, at the least, played a part in that experience the same. Is karma another word for payback in this case? You say potato. She plated eggs, fruit, slices of whole wheat bread she toasted. Why don't we eat in the morning room? We can watch the sun come up. Before that, is it sexist for me to say I love watching you cook breakfast, especially in that robe? It would be sexist if you expected or demanded it. Slowly, she trailed her fingers down the side of the robe. Enjoying it just shows you have good taste. That's what I thought. They carried the plates, the coffee, into the morning room, sat in front of the wide bow of glass. Abra scooped up a bite of eggs. To continue that thought, she added, it would be sexist for you to think you need to get me safely out of the way before you follow through on the plan to lure Suskind into the house. I didn't say anything about that. A woman in love is a mind reader. God, he hoped not, though she'd already showed that aptitude too often for comfort. If we tried the lure, and if it worked, there's no need for both of us to be here. Fine. Where will you be while I video him from the passage? Expression placid, she popped a berry into her mouth. I need to be able to contact you as soon as it's done. Being a smartass before dawn's annoying. So is any attempt to protect a little woman. I'm not little and I think I've already demonstrated I can handle myself. I didn't know I loved you when I first started talking about doing this. I hadn't, wasn't able to open up to everything I feel for you, and it changes everything. He laid a hand over hers. Everything. I want the answers. I want the truth about what happened to Lindsay, to Gran, about everything that's happened since I came back to Whiskey Beach. I want them on what happened 200 years ago. But I could let it go, every bit of it, if I thought finding those answers could hurt you. I know you mean that, and it just... She turned her hand under his so their fingers linked. It just fills me. But I need the answers too, Eli. For us. So let's trust each other to take care of each other and find them together. If you stayed at Maureen's, I could signal you when and if he comes in. Then you could call the cops. They'd move in while he was here, caught in the act. And if I'm with you, I can contact the police from right here while you run your famous video camera. You just want to play in the secret passage. Well, who wouldn't? He hurt you, Eli. He hurt my friend. He would have hurt me. I'm not going to sit at Maureen's. Together or not at all. That sounds like an ultimatum. Because it is. She lifted her shoulders, let them fall in the most casual gesture. We can fight about it. You can get mad. I can be insulted. I just don't see the point, especially on such a gorgeous morning when we're in love. The point I see, Eli, is I've got your back, and I know you've got mine. What the hell was he supposed to do with that? It might not work. Negative thinking's unproductive. Plus, past history and patterns say it will work. This could be over, Eli. Or at the very least, he could be in police custody, charged with breaking and entering, maybe destruction of property by tonight. And he'd be questioned on all the rest. She leaned forward. When that happens, Wolf's going to have his first taste of crow. You had that ace up your sleeve, Eli replied. It's karma time, Eli. All right. But we're going to work this out. Account for every contingency. She poured them both a second cup of coffee. Let's strategize. While they talked, the sun broke over the horizon, splashing gold over the night-dark sea. Just another day, Eli thought when Abra dashed out for her morning class or it would seem so to anyone watching the movements, the comings, the goings of Bluff House. He walked the dog, crossing the beach at a light jog and in full view of Sandcastle. To please Barbie as much as to form a picture, he spent a little time throwing the ball for her, letting her splash into the water, swim out again. Back home, she sprawled on the sunny terrace, 
and Eli went in to call his sister. Boyden Madhouse, and how are you, Eli? Pretty good. He held the phone an inch from his ear as shrill shrieks threatened to break his eardrum. What the hell is that? Selena strongly objects to being in timeout. Trisha raised her own voice, and Eli made it two inches. And the longer Sally screams and misbehaves, the longer she'll be in timeout. What did she do? Decided she didn't want her strawberries at breakfast. Oh, well, that doesn't seem... So she threw them at me, which is why she's in timeout. I have to change my shirt, which further means she'll be late for daycare and I'll be late for the office. Okay, this is a bad time. I'll call you later. We're going to be late anyway. And I have to cool off so I don't give my beloved child a strawberry facial. What's up? I dug up some old household and business ledgers, really old, going back to the late 1700s, into the early 1800s. I've been going through them pretty carefully, and I've come to some interesting conclusions. Such as? I'm hoping you have time to look them over yourself, and we'll see if your conclusions jibe with mine. You don't want to give me a clue? Boy, he really wanted to, but... I don't want to influence you. Maybe I went off some shaky ledge. You've got my attention. I'd love to play with them. How about I scan you a few pages just to give you a start? I should be able to come in maybe the end of the week, bring the ledgers to you. You could, or Max, the currently time-outed Sally and I, could come up Friday evening, have a weekend at the beach, and I can play with them. Even better. But there'll be no strawberries if they cause this reaction. Usually she loves them, but girls do have their moods. I've got to go unshackle her, get us out of here. Send me what you can, and I'll take a look. Thanks, and good luck. Following his morning agenda, he went up for his laptop. He sat out on the terrace in view of Sandcastle, his trusty Mountain Dew on the table, as he scanned through his emails. He opened one from Sherilyn Burke first, began to read her updated report on Justin Suskind. The man hadn't spent much time at work since the last report, Eli noted. A day here and there, a handful of out-of-office meetings. The most interesting, Eli found, had been to a law firm where he met with an estate specialist and stormed out, obviously angry. Didn't get the answers you wanted? Eli sympathized. I know just how you feel. Through the report, he followed Suskind as he picked up his kids from school, took them to the park, to dinner, then home. His brief visit with his wife hadn't gone any better than his meeting with the lawyer, as he'd left in visible temper to speed away. At 10.15 the night before, he'd left his apartment with a suitcase, a briefcase, and a storage box. He'd driven north out of Boston, stopping at an all-night supermarket for a pound of ground beef. He'd made a second stop an hour later, veering off the highway to a 24-hour box store where he'd purchased a box of rat poison. Ground beef. Poison. Without reading further, Eli surged to his feet. Barbie! He had a moment of sheer panic when he didn't see her on the terrace. Even as he raced forward, she scrambled to her feet from where she sat at the top of the beach steps. Tail happily wagging, she trotted to him. Eli simply went down to his knees, wrapped his arms around her. Love, he realized, could sometimes come fast, but it didn't make it any less real. Fucker. The fucker. Leaning back, Eli accepted the adoring licks. He's not going to hurt you. I'm not going to let him hurt you. You stick with me, girl. He led her back to the table. You stay right here with me. In response, she laid her head in his lap, sighed in contentment. He read the rest of the report, then emailed back his own, which started with, The bastard plans to poison my dog. If you're in Whiskey Beach, don't come here. I don't want him wondering who you are. I'm done waiting around for him to make the next move. He gave her an overview of what his research had unearthed, and the basics of what he'd done and planned to do planned to do rather than what he wanted to do right that minute. Go straight to Suskind and kick the living shit out of him. Temper still raw and ripe, Eli took his work and his dog back inside. No more going out by yourself until this bastard's behind bars. 
He pulled out his phone when it rang, unsurprised to see Sherilyn's name on the display. This is Eli. Eli, Sherilyn, let's talk about this idea of yours. He heard the unsaid stupid, shrugged. Sure, let's talk. He wandered the house as they spoke because it served to remind him what he was fighting for. And it had come down to a fight for him, even if he was denied the satisfaction of physical blows. He walked to the third floor and the curved glass of the gable where he imagined writing one day. Once the fight was done and won, once he'd secured safety for all he loved and his own self-respect, You've got some valid points, he said at length. And you're not going to listen to them. I did listen to them, and you're not wrong. The thing is, if I step back from this, let the police handle it all, or even let you, I'm back where I was a year ago. Just letting it all happen. Letting the situation carry me instead of me carrying it. I can't go back to that. I need to do this for myself, for my family. And in the end, I want him to know that. I need that when I think of Lindsay, my grandmother, this house. You didn't believe his wife? No. What did I miss? He lowered his hand to Barbie's head when she leaned against him. You said you had kids. You're married. That's right. How many times? She let out a laugh. Just the one. It's worked out pretty well. That might be it. You haven't gone through the dark side. Maybe I'm wrong and that's what's coloring it. But I don't think so. The only way to be sure is to box him in. That's what I'm going to do. Here, on my turf. In my place. She let out a sigh. I can help. Yeah, I think you can. When he'd finished talking to her, he felt lighter somehow. You know what? He said to the dog. I'm going to work for a couple hours. Remind myself what my life's supposed to be about. You can hang with me. He left the past and what would come behind it and went down to surround himself with the now. Chapter 29 Abra swung into the market, list in hand. She'd finished back-to-back classes and a sports massage on a client prepping for a 5K, and polished it off with a last-minute cleaning in a rental cottage. Now she just wanted to grab what she needed and get back to Eli. Honestly, she thought, that's what she'd like to do for the rest of her life. Get back to Eli. But tonight could prove to be the turning point for him. For them. The point where they could begin to leave the questions and the pain of the past in the past and start working toward tomorrow. Whatever tomorrow brought, she'd be happy because he'd brought love back into her life. The kind of love that accepted, understood, and even better, enjoyed who and what she was. Could there be anything more magical and marvelous than that? She visualized lifting the little hand tote of baggage she still carried, then flinging it into the sea. Done and gone. But now wasn't the time for dreaming, she reminded herself. Now was the time for doing for writing wrong. And if there was some adventure mixed in, so much the better. She reached up for her preferred counter spray, biodegradable, no animal testing, dropped it in her basket and turned. She all but bumped into Justin Suskind. She couldn't stop the quick gasp, but tried to turn it quickly into a flustered apology, even as her heart kicked like a startled mule. I'm so sorry I wasn't paying attention. Praying she didn't tremble. She tried an easy smile. She felt quiver at the edges. He'd cut his hair short, lightened it to a sun-streaked blonde. Unless he'd spent the last two weeks catching rays, he'd made use of a self-tanner. And she was reasonably sure he'd had his eyebrows waxed. He gave her one hard stare, started to move on. On impulse, she shifted, used her elbow and knocked a few items from the shelf to the floor. God, I'm such a klutz today. Crouching to retrieve them, she blocked his path. Isn't it always the way when you're running behind schedule? I need to get home. My boyfriend's taking me into Boston for dinner and a suite at the Charles, and I haven't even decided what to wear. She rose with an armload of cleaning products, sent him an apologetic smile. And I'm still in your way. Sorry. 
She stepped aside, began to shelve what she'd dropped, and resisted looking after him as she heard him walk away. Now you know, she thought, or you think you know. You won't miss your opportunity any more than I could miss mine. She ordered herself to complete her list in case he was watching her. Even stopped to chat with one of her yoga students for a moment. Everything's normal, she told herself. Just a quick stop at the market before your big night in Boston. And because she was watching, she caught a glimpse of him sitting in a dark SUV in the lot as she put her market bags in the car. Deliberately, she turned the radio up, checked her hair, dabbed on some lip gloss, then pulled out to drive home just a few miles over the speed limit. As she turned into Bluff House, she watched in her rear view as Suskind continued on. Grabbing her bag, she dashed into the house. Eli! After dumping the bags, she made the next dash up the stairs and veered toward his office. As her shout had him up and out, they nearly ran into each other. What? Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm good. I also just earned the think fast and act your ass off reward. I literally bumped into Suskind at the market. Did he touch you? Instinctively, Eli grabbed her arms, searched for injuries. No, no. He knew who I was, but I played dumb. Or rather, really smart. I knocked some things off the shelf so he couldn't get by me then babbled about being clumsy and being in a hurry because my guy was taking me to Boston for dinner and a night of whoopee at the Charles. You talk to him? Jesus, Abra! At him! He didn't say a word, but he did wait for me to check out. He sat in his car in the lot, then followed me back. Eli, he thinks we're going to be out of the house tonight. It's his big chance. We don't have to count on him watching and seeing us leave. He's planning it all right now! It fell in our lap, Eli. It's on tonight. This is it. Was he following you? I mean, before you left the store? I, no, no, I don't think so. He had a basket. He had things in a basket. And I don't think he'd have gotten so close if he'd been watching me. It was fate, Eli. And fate's on our side. He'd have called it chance or maybe luck, but he wouldn't argue. I got a report from Sherilyn. He stopped at two different markets, miles apart, on the way to Whiskey Beach. Maybe he has a grocery store fetish. No, he's being careful. Not buying his personal items from the same place as he bought a pound of ground beef and a box of rat poison. Rat poison? I've never heard of anyone seeing rats. Oh, God. Shock hit first, then fury. That... that... son of a bitch! He plans to poison Barbie? That miserable excuse for a human being. It's a good thing I didn't know. I'd have given him another shot to the balls. Easy, Tiger. What time's our reservation? A what? For dinner. Oh, I didn't get that detailed. Eli checked his watch. Okay, we should leave about six. You worked it out with Maureen? Yes, they'll keep Barbie. So we'll just go as we planned. Leave here with the dog... Drop her off at Maureen's, then circle back on foot to the south side. Then, crap. She put her hands to her head, did a little dance in place. Dinner date. I have to wear heels to make it look real. Okay, okay, I'll stuff some sneakers in my bag. Change shoes for the jog back. And don't give me that look. Footwear's important. We need to talk it all through again. And I need to fill you in on how Sherilyn's playing into it. Then let's do it downstairs. I need to put away what I got at the market before my encounter. Then I need to figure out what to wear for our fake romantic evening slash ambush. He went over every angle, then went over them again from a different direction. He spent time in the passage, then behind the shelves, checking the scope of the video camera, testing it. Just a backup now, he thought. If things went wrong, he had a secondary backup. You're questioning yourself. Abra said as she checked the lines and fit of the dress she'd put on, over a black tank and yoga shorts. I used to believe in the system, absolutely. I was part of the system. Now I'm going around it. No, you're working through it, just in a different way. And even that's a testament, Eli, when the system failed you. You have a right to defend your home, and a right to do whatever you can to clear your name. She added earrings, not only to complete the look, but because they boosted her confidence. 
You even have a right to enjoy it. You think so? Yes, I do. Good, because I am. And I'm going to. You look great. I'm definitely taking you to dinner in Boston and a night of whoopee when this is over. I'd like that, but I have an even better idea. When this is over, you need to have the first of those parties you talked about. You need to have a blowout. That is a better idea, but I'll need help with it. Fortunately, I find myself not only free, but willing and able to help with it. He took her hand. I think there's a lot we need to talk about. After. We have a long, and I predict, happy summer to talk about everything. Anything. She turned his wrist to check his watch. It's six on the dot. Then we better get started. He carried down the overnights while Abra gathered what they'd packed for the dog. Downstairs, Eli contacted Sherilyn. We're leaving the house now. You sure about this, Eli? This is how I want to handle it. I'll call again when we're back in. All right, I'll move into position. Good luck. He switched the phone to vibrate, slipped it back into his pocket. Here we go. Abra used two fingers to push up the corners of Eli's mouth. Happy face. Remember, you're going out to dinner in a fancy hotel with a very hot woman, and odds are you're going to get lucky several times? Since we're spending at least part of the evening in a dark passageway in a dark basement, and potentially the rest of it dealing with cops, will I still get lucky? Guaranteed. See my happy face? They walked outside. Do you know what I just love? She asked him as she opened the back of the car for the dog, for the overnights. I love that he's watching us right now, thinking he's the one who's getting lucky. Eli closed the door, pulled her into his arms. Let's give him a little show. Happy to. With enthusiasm, Abra wrapped around Eli, lifted her face for the kiss. Teamwork, she muttered against his mouth. That's how we do things in Whiskey Beach. He opened the passenger door. Remember, once we get to Maureen's, we need to move fast. We don't know how long he might wait. Fast is my best speed. When they pulled up at Maureen's, Eli grabbed the bag holding his change of clothes, Abra's shoes. Maureen had the door of the cottage open before they got to it. Look, both of you, Mike and I have been talking and... Too late. The instant she was inside, Abra yanked down the zipper of her dress. As she wiggled out of it, Eli pulled off his suit jacket, loosened his tie. If we just waited, watched, then called the police... Something could spook him, Eli said, on his way to their powder room with jeans and a black T-shirt. He could leave before they got there. It's more that... Abra stepped out of her heels as Eli closed the door. He needs to have a part in this. I need to help him. We've been over this. I know that. But if he really killed someone, he did. To keep it simple, Abra sat on the floor to pull on sneakers. It's likely he killed two people. And tonight we're starting the chain holding the anchor that's going to take him down for it. You're not crime fighters, Mike began. We are tonight. Abra hopped up as Eli stepped out. We even look the part. Where are the kids? Upstairs playing. They don't know anything about this, and we didn't want them to hear us talking you out of what they don't know anything about. They'll have fun with Barbie. She kissed Maureen, then Mike. I'll call you as soon as we're done. Fast? She said to Eli. Out the back. I'm right behind you. He took one extra moment. I won't let anything happen to her. If there's any chance of it, I'll call it off. Don't let anything happen to either of you. Hurrying after them, Maureen watched them cross the back of her cottage to the back of Abra's. Mike? She reached back for his hand. What should we do? Get the kids. Take the dog for a walk. A walk? On the beach, honey. We can see Bluff House. Maybe keep an eye on things. Her hand squeezed his. Good thinking. Eli unlocked the side door of Bluff House, quickly reset the alarm before turning to Abra. Be sure. Stop it. With that, she led the way to the basement. 
It's barely ten after six. We were fast. Once the door shut behind them, Eli switched on his flashlight to lead the way down and through the passage. It could take minutes, he thought, or hours. But he went with the odds. He'll probably wait until dusk, maybe even dark, figuring he has all night. Whatever it takes. She edged behind the shelves with him and into the passage. For now they used the overhead light. Abra took her position on the steps to check the laptop monitor and the nanny cam they'd set up on the third floor. Eli checked the video camera once again as he contacted Sherilyn. We're inside the passage. No movement from Suskind yet. I'll let you know when and if. It'll be when. Positive thinking. Abra approved when Eli put the phone away. He sure as hell didn't come back here to surf or sunbathe. This is his goal. This is his chance to try for it again. Once he leaves Sandcastle, we go to dark. And all quiet like a submarine. I've got it, Eli. If he goes to the third floor, the nanny cam will record him. If he comes down here, and that's most likely, we do. The sun sets in less than two hours if he waits that long. We've probably got some time to pass. And now they were closed in, without even enough room to pace off the tension. Should have brought a deck of cards, he commented. Since we didn't, why don't you tell me how you'd do a yoga studio if you had one? Oh, hopes and dreams? I can pass a lot of time that way. She passed less than an hour before she stopped, angled her head. Is that the phone? The house phone? Yeah, it could be anyone. Or it could be him, just making sure nobody's here. She shook her head when the faint ringing stopped. We can't hear from down here if the caller's leaving a message. Moments later, the phone vibrated in Eli's pocket. He's on the move, Sherilyn told him, carrying a large duffel. He's going to use his car. Just stay on the line a minute. Let me know how he plays it. Eli repeated the statement in a whisper to Abra, and watching her eyes, saw them light with anticipation. No fear, he thought, just none. He's using the drive of a rental cottage about an eighth of a mile from Bluff House. He's out and heading toward you on foot. We're ready for him. Give him that fifteen after he's in before you make the call. You got it. You were right about this part of it, Eli. I hope you're right about the rest. I'll be seeing you. He turned his phone off, tucked it away. You stay in here as agreed. All right, but no buts. We don't have time to change the plan. Stay here, stay quiet, and turn the light off. He took a moment to lean down and kiss her. You just remember I have your back. I'm counting on it. And on her staying closed in and safe. He slipped out, easing the panel closed behind him. He took his position behind the shelves, letting his eyes adjust to the dark. He could just switch the camera to record, stay inside with Abra. But he needed to see, to hear, needed to have his hand all the way in and be right there to make any change if necessary. He didn't hear the back door open. He wasn't sure if he heard footsteps or imagined them. But he heard the creak of the basement door and the heavy footfalls on the narrow stairs. Showtime, he thought, and switched the camera on. He came in slowly, leading with the flashlight. Eli watched the wide beam sweep, sending its backwash from the generator room into the area beyond. Then the leading edge of it, into the old section, the man holding it no more than a shadow, as the light painted over the walls, the floor, then lit over the shelves. In the beats, the beam crept over the shelves, the wall. Eli's heart kicked. He braced, ready, maybe eager to pursue, to fight. But the beam passed on. Secure now, Eli thought, as the work light flashed on. He saw Suskind clearly for the first time. Dressed in black as he himself was, his hair clipped short now and streaked with blonde. A new look, Eli decided, another way to blend into the vacation crowd. He checked the viewfinder on the camera, 
adjusted it minutely as Suskind picked up the pickaxe. Those first hard thuds of blades striking ground rang satisfying to Eli. Now you're done, he thought. Now we've got you. He had to strap down the part of him that wanted to step out, to confront. Not yet, he ordered himself. Not quite yet. Because his ears were tuned for it, he heard the sirens, dim against the thick walls, and watched Suskind continue to hack and dig at the ground, watched the sweat of the effort bead and roll on his face, despite the cool air. When the sirens silenced, Eli counted it off, and watched Suskind freeze when footsteps sounded overhead. Suskind gripped the pick like a weapon now, eased over, very slowly, eyes wheeling left, right, to switch off the work light. Eli gave him ten seconds in the dark, gauged his location by the labored breathing. As he slipped out from behind the shelves, he aimed his own flashlight, switched it on. Suskind flung up an arm to shield his eyes from the glare. You're going to want to drop the pick and switch the light back on. Suskind squinted, took a two-handed grip on the pick. Eli waited as Suskind rolled to the balls of his feet. Try it and I'll shoot you. I've got the Colt 45, the Peacemaker, from the third floor gun collection aimed at you center mass. You may not be familiar with it, but it's loaded and it still works. You're bluffing. Try me, please, and do it before the cops make it down here. You owe me blood for my grandmother and I'm happy to take it. Feet pounded down the stairs. Suskind's fingers whitened on the handle of the pick. I'm entitled. This house is as much mine as yours. Everything in it's as much mine. The dowry's more mine. You think? Eli said easily, then called out. Back here, hit some lights. Suskind's holding a pickaxe in a threatening manner. I should have killed you, Suskind said between his teeth. I should have killed you after you murdered Lindsay. You're a fool, and that's really the least of it. He stepped back just a little when the first light spilled into the far edge of the area and shifted his gaze again just a little to meet Abra's eyes. He'd heard her slip out behind him, out of safety. Corbett, Vinny, and another uniformed deputy stepped in, fanned out, weapons drawn. Drop it, Corbett ordered. Drop it now. There's no way out, Suskind. I have every right to be here. Drop it. Put your hands up and do it now. Every right. Suskind tossed the pick aside. He's the thief. He's the murderer. Just one thing, Eli said easily as he stepped forward and between the police and Suskind. I want you to step back, Mr. Landon, Corbett ordered. Yeah, I got it. But first, he waited until Suskind met his eyes, until he was certain they saw each other. Then he punched his fist into Suskind's face with all the rage, all the pain, all the misery of the last year behind it. When Suskind fell against the wall, Eli stepped back, lifted his hands to show he was done. You owed me blood, he said, lowering one hand to show the smear of it over his knuckles. You'll pay for that. You'll pay for it all. He didn't think as Suskind reached behind his back, just acted. The second blow knocked Suskind to the ground, had the gun he'd pulled clattering to the floor. I'm done paying. Hands where I can see them, Corbett snapped when Suskind moved. You put your hands in the air, now! Stay back, Mr. Landon, Corbett warned him, using his foot to kick the gun out of reach. He nodded at Vinny. Deputy! Yes, sir. Vinny pulled Suskind to his feet, pushed him to face the wall to check for other weapons. He removed the holster secured at the small of Suskind's back, passed it to the other deputy. You're under arrest for breaking and entering, trespassing, destruction of private property. He began as he cuffed Suskind's wrists. Additional charges include two counts of assault. Looks like we get to add concealing a dangerous weapon and intent to injure onto that. Read him his rights, Corbett ordered. Take him in. You got that. Vinny gave Eli a subtle thumbs up, 
before he and the other deputy gripped Suskind's arms and pulled him out of the room. Corbett holstered his weapon. That was a stupid move. You could have gotten yourself shot. I didn't. Once again, Eli looked at his blood-smeared hand. He owed me. Yeah, I guess he did. You set this up. You set him up. Did I? I get a call from your investigator saying she just observed Justin Suskind breaking into Bluff House and believes he might be armed. She's concerned for your safety. That sounds reasonable and responsible, especially since he did break in and he was armed. And the two of you just happened to be down here on the spot. We were exploring the passages. Abra tucked her arm through Eli's, added a wicked smile. You know, a little pirate and wench. We heard the noises in here. I didn't want Eli to come out, but he felt he had to. I was going to go up, call the police, but we heard you coming. Handy. Where's the dog? Having a sleepover at a friend's, Eli said equably. Set up. Corbett shook his head. You could have trusted me. I did. I do. My house my grandmother, my life, my woman. But I trust you, and that's why I'd like to tell you a story before you interview Suskind. Some of the story plays into more recent events. I know who killed Lindsay, or I'm damn near close to knowing. You've got my attention. I'll tell you, but I want to observe the interview. I want to be there. If you have information or evidence regarding a homicide... You don't bargain. I have a story, and I have a theory. I think you'll like both. I think even Detective Wolf will be interested. I want to observe, Detective. It's a good bargain for both of us. You can ride in with me. We'll talk about it. We'll get ourselves there. Corbett hissed out a breath. Get your investigator there, too. No problem. Set up. Corbett repeated under his breath and headed back through the passage to the stairs. You didn't stay inside, Eli said to Abra. Please, if you thought I would, you may love me, but you don't know me. He took a handful of her hair, tugged it. Actually, it played out pretty much the way I figured. Let me see that hand. She lifted it, gently kissed his bruised knuckles. This must hurt. Yeah, it does. He laughed a little, winced a little as he flexed his fingers, but in a good, satisfying way. I'm strongly nonviolent, except in the case of defending self or others. But you were right, he owed you that. She kissed his hand again. And I confess, I liked watching you punch the bastard. That doesn't sound nonviolent. I know, shame on me. What I'd like to mention now that we're alone, you had a gun that wasn't part of the plan we discussed. It was a kind of amendment. Where is it? I turned off the camera, she added, as soon as the cops came in. Saying nothing, Eli walked over, took the gun he'd put back on the shelf. Because I think I do know you, and I figured you wouldn't stay back. I wasn't going to take any chances. Not with you. Big cowboy gun, she added. Would you have used it? He'd asked himself the same question when he took it from the locked case, when he loaded it. He looked at her now, into what she was, what she meant to him. Yeah, if I had to, if I thought he'd get past me to you. But as I said, it played out the way I thought it would. You think you're smart, Except for a relatively short span of time when I shut down, I've always been smart. He hooked an arm around her, drew her in to press his lips to the top of her head. I've got you, don't I? He thought. That makes me pretty damn smart. I need to contact Cheryl and have her meet us at the station. And I need to put this back where it belongs. Then I'll get the camera and call Maureen. Let them know it's all clear. Teamwork. I like the sound of it. Corbett sat across from Suskind, took a good long study. He hadn't asked for a lawyer, 
yet, which Corbett deemed stupid. But stupid often made his job easier so he wouldn't argue about it. He had Vinny standing inside the door. He liked the deputy's rhythm and felt he'd be an asset in the room. But he concentrated on Suskind, on the nervous tics, the way the man's fingers flexed and unflexed on the table, the jerk of a muscle in his jaw, his bruised and swollen jaw, and on the hard, stubborn line of his mouth which sported a split lip. Nervous, yes, Corbett decided, but absolutely dug in on his own sense of right. So, that's a pretty big hole in the basement at Bluff House, Corbett began. A lot of work, a lot of time involved. Did you have some help? Suskind stared back, said nothing. I figure not. It strikes me like this was your job, your mission, not something to share. You're... You said right, didn't you? It is my right. Shaking his head, Corbett tipped back in his chair. You're going to have to explain that one. All I see is the guy who got caught sleeping with Landon's wife, breaking into Landon's house to dig a big hole in his basement. It's as much my house as his. How do you figure? I'm a direct descendant of Violetta Landon. Sorry. I'm not real familiar with the Landon family tree. He glanced at Vinny now. Are you more up on that, deputy? Sure. She's the one who supposedly rescued the seaman who survived the wreck of the Calypso way back when. Nursed him back to health. Some versions have them bumping hips and getting caught at it. It wasn't a seaman, but the captain. Captain Nathaniel Broom. Suskind tapped his fists on the table now. He didn't just survive. He survived with Esmeralda's dowry. Well, there's a lot of theories and stories about that. Then he began. Suskind smashed his fist on the table. I know the truth. Edwin Landon killed Nathaniel Broom because he wanted the dowry. Then he put his own sister out of the house, convinced his father to disown her. She was carrying Broom's child, his son. That sounds like bad luck for her. Corbett commented, but it was a long time ago. She was pregnant with Broom's child, Suskind repeated. And when she was dying, suffering in poverty, and that child, then a grown man, pleaded with Landon to help his sister, to let her come home, he did nothing. That's who the Landons are, and I have every right to take what's mine, what was hers, what was Broom's. How'd you come by all this? Vinny asked casually. A lot of stories go around about that treasure. They're stories. This is fact. It's taken me nearly two years to put it all together, a piece at a time. I've got letters, and they cost me. Written by James Fitzgerald, Violetta Landon's son by Nathaniel Broom. They detail what she told him happened that night on Whiskey Beach. He walked away from it, from his rights. Fitzgerald, her son. I won't. Sounds to me like you should have been talking to a lawyer, Corbett put in, not hacking holes in basements with a pickaxe. You think I didn't try? Suskind jerked forward, face washed angry red. Nothing but a run around, nothing but excuses. It was too long ago. She wouldn't have legally inherited in any case. No legal claim. What about my blood claim? My moral claim? The dowry was booty belonging to my ancestor, not Landon's. It's mine. So, with this moral blood claim behind you, you broke into Bluff House on numerous occasions, and why the basement specifically? Violetta told her son Broom instructed her to hide it there to keep it safe. Okay. And you don't think in a couple hundred years somebody found it, maybe spent it? She hid it. It's there, and it's mine by right. And you figure that right equals breaking in, damaging property, and pushing an old woman down the stairs? I didn't push her. I never laid a hand on her. It was an accident. Corbett hiked up his eyebrows. Accidents happen. How did this one? I needed to look around on the third floor. 
The Landons have a lot of things stored up there. I needed to see if I could find something to give me more specifics on the dowry. The old woman got up. She saw me. She ran and she fell. That's it. I never touched her. You saw her fall. Of course I saw her fall. I was there, wasn't I? It wasn't my fault. Okay. Let's be clear. You broke into Bluff House on the night of January 20th of this year. Ms. Hester Landon was in the house, and she saw you, tried to run from you, and fell down the stairs. Is that accurate? That's right. I never touched her. But you did touch Abra Walsh on the night she entered Bluff House, after you'd cut the power, broken in. I didn't hurt her. I just needed to restrain her until I could get out. She attacked me, just like Landon attacked me tonight. You saw that. I saw you reach for a weapon you had concealed. Corbett glanced at Vinny. Uh, yes, sir, I witnessed same, and we have the weapon in evidence. You're lucky you only took a couple punches. Now let's go back to the night you and Abra Walsh tangled in Bluff House. I just told you she attacked me. That's an interesting take on it. And did Kirby Duncan attack you too, before you shot him and pushed his body off the lighthouse cliff? The muscle in Suskind's jaw twitched again. His gaze shifted. I don't know what you're talking about, or who Kirby Duncan is. Was. I'll refresh you. He's the private investigator out of Boston you hired to watch Eli Landon. Corbett held up a hand before Suskind could speak. Let me save us some time here. People always think they're covering their tracks. Like breaking into Duncan's office, his apartment, getting rid of his records. But when people are in that push of the moment, they forget little things, like backup files, and what they keep themselves, which will turn up as we've got a team searching your house here, and another in Boston going through your apartment. He let that sink in. Then the weapon you pulled, which we've confirmed was registered to Kirby Duncan. How did you gain possession of Duncan's weapon? I found it. Just a lucky break? Now Corbett smiled at him. Where did you find it? When? How? Corbett shoved into Suskind's space. No answer for that. Take some time to think about it. And while you are, add this in. A lot of people figure wearing gloves or wiping a gun covers their ass but they just don't think of wearing gloves when they load one. You planted the gun in Abra Walsh's house, Suskind, but it wasn't her prints on the bullets the Emmy dug out of Duncan. Guess whose? It was self-defense. Reasonable. Tell me about that. He came at me. I defended myself. He attacked me. Like Abra Walsh attacked you. I didn't have any choice. He came at me. You shot Kirby Duncan, pushed his body off the lighthouse cliffs. Yes, in self-defense. And I took his gun. He rushed me. He was armed. We struggled. It was an accident. Corbett scratched the side of his neck. You're pretty accident prone. But the thing is, we're good at our jobs around here. Kirby Duncan wasn't shot at close range during a struggle. Forensics doesn't back that story up. That's what happened. Suskind folded his arms now. It was self-defense. I have a right to defend myself. You have a right to break into private property, to dig around in it, to walk away from an injured woman who fell because you'd broken into her home while she was sleeping, to assault another, and to kill a man. You're going to find out the law doesn't give you a single one of those rights, Suskind. And you'll have a long time to think about that in prison when you're serving a life sentence for first-degree murder. It was self-defense. Is that going to be your story for why you killed Lindsay Landon? Did she attack you, threaten you, so you had to bash her in the back of her skull to defend yourself? I didn't kill Lindsay. Landon killed her, and you cops let him get away with it. Money, family name, that's why she's dead and he's free. And he's lording it in a house that's rightfully mine. Corbett glanced toward the two-way mirror, gave the faintest nod, nearly sighed. He hoped he wasn't making a mistake. 
but a deal was a deal. How do you know Landon killed her? Because he did. She was afraid of him. She told you she was afraid of her husband. She was a wreck after he went at her in public that day. She said she didn't know what he might do. He threatened her, told her he'd make her sorry, make her pay. It's on record. I promised her I'd take care of her, take care of everything. She loved me. I loved her. Landon was already done with her. But when he found out about us, he couldn't stand that she was happy. He went over there, and he killed her. Then he bought off the cops and walked. So Wolf was paid off? Damn right he was. Corbett glanced around, nodded again when Eli walked in. Eli Landon entering interview. Mr. Suskind, I think again we can save some time, get this all straightened out. If Mr. Landon's a part of this process... If you object to having him here, just say so when he's out. I've got plenty to say to him here and now. You murdering bastard. That was going to be my line. But let's talk. Eli took a seat at the table. Chapter 30 You didn't want her. No, Eli agreed. I didn't. And I wanted her less when I found out she'd lied to me, cheated on me, used me. Did she know why you started the affair? Did she know you were using her to get information on me, on Bluff House, the family, the dowry? I loved her. Maybe you did, but you didn't start sleeping with her out of love. You did it to screw with me and to pump her for anything I might have told her about the dowry. I knew her. I understood her. You didn't even know who she was. God. You're right about that. No argument. I didn't know her. I didn't want her. I didn't love her. I didn't kill her. You went in that house, and when she told you to go to hell, to get out, that she and I were going to be together, to get married, start our lives, you killed her. Tough marrying her when you already have a wife. I'd already told Eden I wanted a divorce, and when Lindsay told you we were both getting free, you couldn't stand it. You didn't want her, but you didn't want anyone else to have her. I thought your wife didn't know about you and Lindsay until after Lindsay's murder. Suskind's hands balled on the table. She didn't know about Lindsay. You just told your wife, the mother of your two kids, you wanted a divorce, and she didn't ask any questions? It's none of your business what's between me and Eden. It's funny, though. Lindsay and I sure weren't so civilized and reasonable when we were heading toward divorce. A lot of arguing, a lot of accusations and blame. I guess your wife's a better person, one who'd just step away, let you have what you wanted. Where were you going the night Lindsay died? Come on, Justin. She was packing. We'd had an ugly public fight and she was upset. You were in love with her, and you'd already asked your wife for a divorce. Lindsay wasn't going out of town without you. It's none of your business where we were going. But when you went by to pick her up... It was too late. You killed her. The police were already there. When he lunged up, Vinny simply stepped over, put a hand on Suskind's shoulder, and shoved him down again. Keep your seat. Keep your hands off me. You're as guilty as he is. Every one of you. I couldn't even stop that night. Couldn't even see her. I could only ask one of the neighbors standing out in the rain what was going on. And he told me there must have been some sort of a break-in and the woman who lived in the house was dead. She was dead and you'd already started sliding out of it. Saying nothing, Eli glanced at Corbett and tacitly passed the ball. What you're saying now doesn't jibe with your previous statements to the police in the matter of Lindsay Landon's murder. I know how it works. Do you think I'm stupid? If I admitted to being anywhere near the house, the cops would have pinned it on me. He killed her. Suskind jabbed a finger toward Eli. You know it, and you've got me in here doing what I had a right to do. Do your job, arrest him. If I'm going to do my job, I have to have it all straight. I need the facts. What time did you drive by the Landon house in the back bay? About 7.15. And after that? I went straight home. I was half crazy. I couldn't think. 
Eden was making dinner, and she told me she'd just heard a bullet and Lindsay had been killed. I broke down. What do you expect? I loved her. I was out of my mind. And Eden helped me calm down, helped me think it through. She was worried about me, about our kids. So she said she'd tell the police I'd been there with her since 5.30, that we shouldn't have to go through the scandal and the pressure because of what Landon had done. She lied. She protected me and our family. I'd let her down, but she stood up for me. She knew I didn't kill Lindsay. Yes, she did, Eli agreed. She knew you didn't kill Lindsay, and she knew I didn't kill Lindsay. She gave you an alibi, Justin, one the cops believed, and you gave her one that put her at home with you being the good wife, sharing some margaritas, cooking dinner for the two of you, when she'd gone over to confront Lindsay and Lindsay had let her in. That's a lie, a ridiculous, self-serving lie. And Lindsay probably said to her something along the lines of what she said to me the last time we spoke. That she was sorry, but that's the way it was. She loved you, and you were both entitled to be happy. So Eden grabbed the poker in a rage and killed her. She couldn't do that. You know better. She lashed out because the woman she thought was her friend had made a fool out of her. The woman she thought was her friend threatened everything she held close. The husband she lived with, trusted, believed in, had betrayed her and would destroy their marriage for someone else's wife. She didn't just say you can have a divorce, Corbett put in. You fought, she demanded, and you told her you were in love with someone else. Then you told her who. It doesn't matter. When? When did you tell her about Lindsay? The night before the murder. It doesn't matter. Eden protected me. And all she asked in return was for me to give our marriage another try, another few months. She did it for me. She did it for herself. Eli pushed to his feet. Both of you. All for yourselves. And the hell with anyone else. You could have had her, Justin. All I wanted was my grandmother's ring. But Eden wanted more than that. And she used you to get it. It's hard to blame her. He walked out and straight to Abra. She pushed off the bench where she'd waited, held tight when his arms came around her, when his forehead dropped to hers. It was hard, she said quietly. More than I thought it would be. Tell me. I will, all of it. Let's go home, okay? Let's get the hell out of this and go home. Eli! Vinny walked quickly out of the interview room. Hold up just a second. He paused, taking a scan of Eli's face. How are you doing? All in all, good. It's good to have it out, to start thinking it can be over. I'm glad to hear it. Corbett wanted me to tell you when he's finished with Suskind, he'll contact Wolf directly. They'll pick up Eden Suskind and talk to her. Corbett, if you want my opinion, is going to go into Boston to be in on that. That's for them, I'm out of it. None of it's part of my life anymore. Thanks for your help, Finney. Part of the job. But you could buy me a beer sometime. As many as you want. Abra stepped around, took Vinny's face in her hands, laid her lips softly on his. He'll buy the beer, but that's for me. Might be better than beer. Let's go home, Eli repeated. This is done. But it wasn't. Not for him. Not quite. The next morning, with Abra by his side, Eli sat across from Eden Suskind. Though pale, she kept her gaze steady, her voice absolutely calm. I appreciate both of you coming into Boston this way. I know it's an inconvenience. You had something you wanted to say to me. To us. Eli corrected. Yes. I could see when you came to my home the two of you had something strong between you. I've always believed in that, that bond, that connection, and the promises that come out of it. I built my adult life on that only to have it broken. So I wanted to talk to both of you. I've been speaking with the police for some time now since last night, 
In the presence of my lawyer, of course. That's wise. Justin hasn't been, but then he's always been impulsive, a little rash. I balance that out, as I tend to think things through, weigh options. We were a good team for a long time. You understand what I mean about balance, she said to Abra. Yes, I do. I thought you would. Now that Justin has confessed to, well, so much, now that I know what he's done, I can, and I want to, move on. I can't protect him, balance him, hope that he'll come to his senses again and put our family first. It's never going to happen. The police believe he killed a man in cold blood. Yes. And he caused your grandmother serious injury. Yes. It's his obsession. That's not an excuse, but it's simple fact. About three years ago, his great uncle died, and Justin found letters, a journal, all these things that connected his family to yours and to that dowry. Information about Violetta Landon, Nathaniel Broom? Yes. I don't know much as he started hoarding it all, keeping it from me. Everything began to change from that point. He kept pushing, digging, paying heavy fees. I won't bore you with problems Justin had in the past. His ability and need to blame others for failures or mistakes or shortcomings. But I'll tell you that the more he learned about this part of his ancestry, the more he felt you and your family were to blame for everything he didn't have that he wanted. More. When he learned I actually knew your wife and worked with her from time to time, he saw it as a sign. Who knows, maybe it was. He pursued her. Yes, I didn't know to what extent. He deceived me there, and I think, honestly, he began to want her, to convince himself he loved her because she was yours. He wanted what was yours and saw it as his right. I didn't know about the property in Whiskey Beach or the investigator or the break-ins. I only knew, in those months before Lindsay's death, my husband was slipping away from me, lying to me. I think we know, don't we? She said to Abra. Yes, we probably do. I tried everything and finally stopped arguing with him about the time, the money, and convinced myself to simply wait it out. He'd had obsessions before, pulled away a bit before, but he always settled back again. She paused a moment, tucked the swing of her hair behind her ear. This time it was different. He told me he was filing for divorce, just like that, as if it was nothing but a formality. He didn't want our life any longer, couldn't pretend to love me any longer. Again, I won't bore you, but he shattered me. We fought and said terrible things, as people do, and he told me he'd been involved with Lindsay, and that she was his soulmate, those hackneyed words, and that they intended to be together. That must have been terribly hurtful, Abra said when Eden fell silent. It was horrible, the worst moment of my life. Everything I loved and believed in was slipping through my fingers, he said we'd tell the children over the weekend so we'd have plenty of time with them to ease the blow. And in the meantime, he'd sleep in the guest room and we'd maintain a civilized front. I swear to you, I could hear Lindsay's words coming out of his mouth, her way, her tone. You understand me? She asked Eli. Yeah, I do. Her shoulders very straight, she nodded. What I say next is without my lawyer or the police present, without the record. But I feel you deserve to hear it, and for me to say it to you. I know you killed her. Aren't you interested in knowing what happened that night? In knowing why and how? Before Eli could speak, Abra laid a hand over his. I am. I'd like to know. There's that balance at work. You'd walk away because you're so angry, and she'll help you stay because knowing will help you close the door on this, as much as you ever will. You had to confront her, Abra began. Wouldn't you? He called to tell me he changed his mind and we'd have to put off telling the children together for a few days. 
Lindsay was upset because she'd fought with you, Eli, and she needed to get away for a few days. He needed to be with her. She needed. He needed. Nothing his family needed. I think they brought out the worst in each other, Eden said. They're most selfish selves. You may be right. Eli turned his hand to hold Abra's and thought how lucky he was. So, yes, I went to confront her, to try to reason with her, even to plead with her. She was angry, very angry still over your confrontation, what you'd said to her. And I think, looking back, maybe a little guilty, but not enough. She let me in, took me into the library because she wanted to finish it, clear the slate, so she and Justin could move on. Nothing I said made any difference to her. Our own friendship meant nothing. My children meant nothing. My marriage or the hurt they were causing. I begged her not to take my husband, not to take the father of my children. And she told me to grow up. This was how things were, how things worked. She said horrible things to me, cruel things, vicious things, and she turned her back on me. She dismissed me and my pain as nothing. After a pause, Eden folded her hands on the table. The rest blurs. It was like watching someone else, someone else who grabbed the poker and struck out. I lost my mind. That might work. Eli said evenly, if your lawyer's as good as you are. He's very good. But regardless, I never went into that house intending to harm her, but to plead with her. And when I regained my senses, when it was too late, I thought of my family, my children, and what this would mean. I couldn't change what I'd done in that moment of insanity, and I could only try to protect my family, so I went home. I took the clothes I'd worn there and cut them up. I bagged the pieces, weighed them down, and drove out to throw them in the river. Then I came back home and I started dinner. When Justin came home, he was hysterical. So I realized we could protect each other, as it should be, as it's meant to be. And we'd try to put it behind us and rebuild our marriage. I felt he needed me. Lindsay would have ruined him. In fact, she did. And what she left me was a man I couldn't fix, couldn't save. I let him go and did what I had to do to protect myself. But you stood by and let what you'd done ruin Eli's life. I couldn't stop it or change it, though I was sorry sincerely that someone who'd been betrayed as I had would lose so much more. But in the end, I didn't ruin his life. Lindsay did. She ruined his, mine, Justin's. Even dead, she ruined us all. Now my children will be scarred. Her voice wavered a little, then strengthened again. Even when my lawyer makes a deal with the prosecutor, I have every confidence he'll make. They'll be scarred. You'll have your balance your chance for a future. I'll have two children who'll be shattered by what their father's done out of selfishness and what their mother did out of desperation. You're free. And though I may not be punished to the extent you feel just, I'll never be free. Eli leaned across the table. Whatever she did or planned to do, she didn't deserve to die for it. You're kinder than I but we can take it back to its roots. Your ancestor committed murder out of greed, cast off his own sister for the same reasons. Without that, we wouldn't be here. I'm really just a piece of all of it. Believing that may help you get through the next few weeks. Eli got to his feet. Once more, Abra put a hand over his as she rose. For the sake of your children... I hope your lawyer is as good as you believe. Thank you. I really wish both of you all the best.
He had to walk out, get out. Jesus Christ, was all he could say when Abra gripped his hands. Some people are twisted in ways that don't show, in ways they themselves don't see or understand. It may be circumstances that twisted her, Eli, but she'll never really see it. I could get her off, he stated. I could get her off with five years and she'd only do two. Then I'm glad you're not a defense attorney anymore. So am I. His hand tightened on hers as Wolf walked down the hall. Landon? Detective? I was wrong, but you looked good for it. As Wolf kept walking, Eli turned. And that's it? That's it from you? Wolf glanced back. Yeah, that's it. He's embarrassed, Abra commented, and only smiled when Eli sent her a baffled stare. He's an asshole, but he's also embarrassed. Forget him. And remember, karma comes around. I don't know about karma, but I'll start working on forgetting him. Good. Let's buy some flowers for Hester and go tell your family this most excellent news. Then we'll go home and see what happens next. He had some ideas about that. He waited a few days, letting it all sink in for both of them. He had his life back, and didn't need the media reports about Eden Suskind's arrest for Lindsay's murder, or Justin Suskind's for Duncan's, to tell him just that. He had his life back, but not the life he'd had once, and he was glad of it. He made plans, some with Abra. They'd throw Bluff House open for a major party for the 4th of July. He showed her the very preliminary plans for installing an elevator, so his grandmother could come home and live comfortably. And some plans he didn't share with her. Yet. So he waited, walked his dog, wrote, spent time with the woman he loved, and began to look at Bluff House in a whole new light. He chose an evening with soft breezes and the promise of sunset, the anticipation of a full moon. Doing his part, he dealt with the dinner dishes while she sat at the island working on her schedule for the upcoming week. I think if I fiddle a little, I could add Zumba in the fall. It's popular for a reason, and I can get certified. I bet you could. Yoga's always going to be my core, but I like adding in some other choices, keeping it fresh. Rising, she pinned her new schedule to the board. Speaking of keeping it fresh, I want to show you something on the third floor. In the passage? Are you thinking about trying out Pirate and Wench? Maybe, but there's something else first. You know it's too bad we can't throw that floor open for our big bash in July, she said as she walked with him. It's too complicated and too full of things right now, but boy, we could rock it. Maybe someday. I always like some days. Funny. I've realized I do too. It's taken a while. He guided her into the old servants' quarters, where a bucket held a bottle of champagne. Are we celebrating? I sure as hell hope so. I'm also fond of celebrations. You have blueprints up here. She moved to the table he'd uncovered, studied them. Eli, you've started on plans for your office. Oh, this is great. It's going to be fabulous for you. You're adding an outside entrance to the terrace? It's a great idea. You can go in and out from right in there, sit out and contemplate. You didn't tell me. She spun around. They're just preliminary. I wanted some of it down and to find out what could be done before I showed you. Well, preliminary or not, it's a good reason to pop a cork. That's not why. You have more? Yeah, it's a lot more. See, the architect left this space here unnamed. This area we're standing in, the bath over there. I asked him to just draw it up, basically, and leave it blank. More plans. She turned a circle, then another. There's so much you could do with it. No, not really, but you could. I could. 
You could have your studio. My, oh, Eli, that's so good of you, so sweet, but hear me out. Your clients, or students, whatever, would have the entrance here off the terrace. It's three floors up, but hell, if they're coming to exercise, the climb's part of it. If you're doing the senior yoga deal or whatever, there's the elevator. And there's this area here. You could have your massage therapy room. I'm working here, North Wing, private, so none of this interferes with me. I asked Gran what she thought, and she thought it was great. So you've got the go-ahead there. You've been doing a lot of thinking. I have. And it's all been about you. About us. About Bluff House. About, well, some days. What do you think? Eli. Overwhelmed, she wandered the space, could see it, just see it. You're handing me one of my dreams, but you could reciprocate and give me mine. He dug in his pocket, pulled out a ring. It's not the one I gave Lindsay. I didn't want to give you that ring. So I asked Gran if I could have another. It's old and one she especially loves and wanted it to go to you, someone she especially loves. I could have bought you one, but I wanted you to have something that's been handed down. Symbolic. You're big on symbols. Oh, God. Oh, my God. She could only stare at the perfect square-cut emerald. I didn't want to give you a diamond. Too conventional. And this, anyway. This reminded me of you. Your eyes. Eli. She rubbed the heel of her hand between her breasts, as if to keep her heart beating. I just... I haven't gone here. I haven't thought of this. So think of it now. I thought we'd talk about me moving in, officially living together, taking that next step. We can do that. If that's all I can get for now, we can do that. I know it's fast. And I know we've got big mistakes behind us. But they're behind us. I want to marry you, Abra. I want to start a real life with you. A family with you. To share a home with you. He swore he could all but feel the ring burn in his hand like a flame. Like life. I look at you. And I see all the someday's, All the possibilities of them. I don't want to wait to start, but I will. I'll wait, but you have to know you not only helped me come back to really see the life I wanted and could have, but you're the life I want. Her heart didn't stop beating, but it filled. She stared at him as the windows behind him washed pink and gold with the setting sun. And she thought, there's love. There it is. Take the gift. I love you, Eli. I trust my own heart. I learned to do that. I think love is the most powerful and most important thing in the universe. And you have mine. I want yours. We can make the life we both want. I believe that. We can make that life together. But you want to wait. Hell no. She laughed, all but flew to him. Oh, God, here you are, the love of my life. With her arms tied around him, she found his mouth with hers, sank and sank and sank into the first kiss of the new promise. He swayed with her, holding on. It would have killed me to wait. Some happy you just have to grab. She held out her hand. Make it official. When he slid the ring on her finger, she put her arms around him again, held her left hand up to the sunset light. It's beautiful and warm. Like you. I love that it's old, that it's been passed down through your family. I love that I'm your family. When did you ask Hester for this? When we took her flowers, after going in to see Eden Suskind. I couldn't ask you, 
didn't want to ask you until that was over. It's new now, for both of us. Take the space, Abra. Take me. Let's just take it all. All is exactly what we'll take. She pressed her lips to his, soft, long, loving. And then we'll make more. The ring on her hand caught the last rays of the sun, flashed as it had for land and women for generations. Then it gleamed in the quieter light, as it once did in an iron chest washed up from the wrecked Calypso with its canny captain onto the shores of Whiskey Beach. <laughs>